A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis L'Amour, in the public domain. Chapter 1 Smoke lifted wistfully from the charred timbers of the house, and smoke lifted from the shed that had been Moffat's barn. The corral bars were down and the saddle stock run off, and where Dick Moffat's homestead had been in the morning, there was now only desolation, emptiness, and death. Dick Moffat himself lay sprawled on the ground. The dust was scratched deeply where his fingers had dug in the agony of death. Even from where he sat on the long-legged buckskin, the man known as Trent could see that he'd been shot six times. Three of those bullets had gone in from the front, and the other three had been fired directly into his back by a man who stood over him and Dick Moffat wore no gun. The little green valley was still in the late afternoon sun. It was warm, and there was a faint heat emanating from the charred timber of the house. The man who called himself Trent rode his horse around the house. Four or five men had come here, one of them riding a horse with a split right rear hoof. They'd shot Moffat down and then burned his layout. What about the kids? What about Sally Crane, who was 16, and young Jack Moffat, who was 14? Whatever had happened, there was no evidence of them here. He hesitated, looking down the trail. Had they been taken away by the killers? Sally, perhaps, but not Jack. If the killers had found the two, Jack would have been dead. Thoughtfully, Trent turned away. The buckskin knew his way toward home, and he quickened his pace. There were five miles to go. Five miles of mountains and heavy woods and no clear trails. This could be it. Always he'd been sure it would come. Even when happiest, the knowledge that sooner or later he must sling his gun belts on his hips had been ever present in the back of his mind. Sooner or later there would be trouble, and he'd seen it coming here among the rim rock. Slightly more than a year ago he'd built his cabin and squatted in the lush green valley up among the peaks. No cattle ranged this high. No wandering cowpunchers drifted up here. Only the other nesters had found homes. The Hatfields, O'Hara, Smithers, Moffat, and the rest. Below, in the vicinity of Cedar Bluff, there is one ranch. One and only one. On the ranch and in town, one man ruled supreme. He rode with majesty. And when he walked, he strode with the step of kings. He never went unattended. He allowed no man to address him unless he spoke first. He issued orders and bestowed favor like a king. And if there were some who disputed his authority, he put them down. He crushed them. King Bill Hale had come west as a boy. And he had money even then. In Texas, he'd driven cattle over the trails learned to fight and sling a gun, and to drive a bargain that was tight and cruel. Then he'd come farther west. He moved into the town of Cedar Bluff, built the castle, drove out the cattle rustlers who used the valley as a hideout, and one or another honest rancher in the valley he either bought out, and when the other one refused to sell, Hale had told them to sell or else, and he'd cut off the offered price into half so the man sold. Cedar Bluff and Cedar Valley lived under the eye of King Bill. A strong man and an able one, Hale had slowly become power mad. The valley was cut off, both from New Mexico and Arizona. In his own world, he could not be touched. His will was law. He owned the Mecca, the saloon, and the gambling house. He owned the stage station, the stage line itself, and the freight company that hauled supplies in and produce out. He owned the Cedar Hotel, the town's one decent rooming house. He owned 60,000 acres of good grazing land and controlled 100,000 more. His cattle were numbered in the tens of thousands, and two men rode beside him when he went out among his other men. One was rough, hard-scaled Pete Shaw, and the other was his younger son, Cub Hale. Behind him trailed the gold dust twins, Dunn and Ravitz, both gunmen. 
The man who called himself Trent rarely visited Cedar Bluff. Sooner or later, he knew, there would be someone from the outside, someone who knew him, someone who would recognize him for what and who he was, and then the word would go out. That's Kilkenny. Men would turn to look for the story of the strange drifting gunman was known to all in the West. Even though there were few men anywhere who knew him by sight, and few who could describe him, or knew the way that he lived, mysterious, solitary, and shadowy, the gunman called Kilkenny had been everywhere. He drifted in and out of towns and cow camps. Sometimes there would be a brief and bloody gun battle, and then Kilkenny would be gone again. And only the body of the man who dared to try Kilkenny remained. So Kilkenny had taken the name of Trent, and in the high peaks he'd found the lush green valley where he built his cabin and ran a few head of cows and broke wild horses. It was a lonely night life, but when he was there he hung his guns on a peg and carried only his rifle, and that was for game or for wolves. Rarely, not over a dozen times in the year, he went down to Cedar Bluff for supplies, and then he packed them back and stayed back in the hills until he was running short again. He stayed away from the Mecca, and most of all, he avoided the Crystal Palace, the new and splendid dance hall and gaming house that was owned by the woman, Nita Riordan. The cabin in the pines was touched with red, and the glow of the sun setting behind the notch, when he swung down from the buckskin and slapped the horse cheerfully on the shoulder. Home again, Buck. It's good feeling, isn't it? He stripped the saddle and bridle from the horse and carried them into the log barn, and then he turned the buckskin into the corral and forked over a lot of fresh green grass. He was a lonely life, yet he was content. Only at times did he find himself looking at the long stars and thinking about the girl in Cedar Bluff. Did she know that he was here? Remembering Nita from the live oak country, he decided that she did. Nita Riordan knew all that was going on, and she always had. He went about the business of preparing a meal, and thought of Parson Hatfield and his tall sons. What would the mountaineer now do? Yet need he ask that question? Could he suspect even for a moment that the Hatfields would do anything but fight? They were the type. They were the men who'd always built with their hands, and who were beholden to no man. They were not gunfighters, but they were lean, hard-faced men, tall and stooped a little, who carried their rifles as if they were a part of them. And big Dan O'Hara, the talkative, friendly Irish Irishman, who'd always acted as though campaigning for public office. Could he believe that Dan would do any other than fight? War was coming to the high peaks, and Trent's face grew somber as he thought of it. War meant that he would once more be shooting and killing. He could, of course, mount in the morning and ride away. He could give up this place in the highlands and go again once more. But even as the thought came to him, he did not recognize it as even a remote possibility. Like O'Hara and the Hatfields, he would fight. There were other things to consider. Last time he'd been to Cedar Bluff, there'd been a letter from Lee Hall, the ranger. We're getting along all right here, but I thought you'd like to know Kane Brockman is out. He swears he will hunt you down and kill you for killing his brother and whipping him with your fists, and he'll try, so be careful. He dropped four slices of bacon into the frying pan, humming softly to himself. Then he put on some coffee water and sat watching the bacon. When it was ready, he took it out of the pan and put it on a tin plate. He was reaching for the coffee when he heard a muffled movement. Instantly, he froze in position. His eyes fastened on the blanket that separated his bedroom from his living room of his two-room cottage. His guns were hanging from a peg near the cupboard. He'd have to cross the room to them. His rifle was nearer. Rising, he went about the business of fixing the coffee. And then, when close to the rifle, he dropped his hand to it. Then, swinging it hip-high, he crossed the room with a bound and jerked back the blanket. Two youngsters sat on the edge of his homemade bed. A slender, wide-eyed girl of sixteen, 
and a boy with a face thickly sprinkled with freckles. They sat together tightly, frightened and pale. Slowly he let the gun butt down to the floor. Well, I'll be. Say, how did you youngsters get here? The girl swallowed and stood up, trying to curtsy. Her hair, which was very lovely, hung in two thick blonde braids. Her dress was cheap and cotton, and now, after rough treatment, was torn and dirty. We're, I mean, I'm Sally Crane, and this is Jackie Moffat. They burned us out, Jackie cried out, his face twisted and pale. Them Hales done it, and they killed Pappy. I know, Trent looked at them gravely. I came by that way. Come on out here and we'll eat, and then you can tell me about it. They came in about sunup this morning, Jack said. They told Pap he had two hours to get loaded and moving. And Pap, he allowed that he wasn't moving. This was government land, and he was all settled legal, and they was standing on his rights. What happened? Trent asked. He sliced more bacon and dropped it into the pan. The young'un, he shot Pap. Shot him three times before he could move. Then after he fell, he emptied his gun into him. Something sank within Trent, for he could sense the fight that was coming. The young'un would probably be Cub Hale. He remembered that slim, erect, panther-like young man in white buckskins and riding his white horse. That young, handsome man who loved to kill. Here it was, and there was no way a man could duck it. But no, this wasn't his fight. Not yet it wasn't. How'd you kids happen to come here, he asked kindly. We had to get away. Sally was getting wood for the house. And when I met her, we started back. We heard the shooting. And when I looked through the brush, I seen the young'un finishing pap. I wanted to fight, but I ain't got no gun. Did they look for you, Trent asked? Uh-huh. We heard one of them say he wanted Sally. Jackie glanced at the girl, whose face was white, her eyes were wide. They allowed that there was no use killing her. Yet. You had horses? Trent asked. Uh-huh. We done left them in the bush. We wasn't sure what they'd come here to. But we happened to come here because Pap, he done said if anything happened to him, he was to come here first. He said you was a good man, and figured you was some shakes with a gun. All right. Trent dished them out some food. You kids can stay here tonight. I got blankets enough. Then in the morning I'll take you down to Parsons. Let me fix that, Sally pleaded, reaching for the skillet. I can cook. She sure can, Jackie declared, admiringly. She cooked for us all the time. A horse's hoof clicked on a stone, and Trent doused the light immediately. Get down, he whispered hoarsely, on the floor. Let's see who this is. He could hear the horses coming closer, two of them in the sound. Then a voice rang out sharply. Hello, the house. Step out here. From inside the door, Trent replied shortly. Who is it and what do you want? Don't make no damn who it is, Trent. We're giving you till noon tomorrow to hit the trail. You're camping on Hale Range. We're moving everybody off. Trent laughed harshly. That's right, amusing, friend, he said dryly. You go back and tell King Bill Hale that I'm staying right where I am. This is government land, filed on, all fitting and proper. He glimpsed the light on a gun barrel and spoke sharply. Don't try it, Dunn. I know you're here by your voice, but if you got a lick of sense, you know you're outlined against the sky. A blind man could get you both at this range. Dunn cursed bitterly. And then he shouted, You won't get away with this, Trent! Go back and tell Hale that I like it here and I'm planning to stay. When they'd gone, Trent turned to the youngsters. We'll have little time now, Sally. You take the bed in the other room, and Jackie and me will bunk out here. But, Sally protested, Go ahead. You'll need all the sleep you can get. I think the trouble has just started, but don't be afraid. Everything's going to be all right. I'm not afraid, Sally Crane looked at him with large, serious eyes. You'll take care of us, I know. He stood there a long minute, staring after her. It was a strange feeling to be trusted, and to be trusted so implicitly. The childish 
sincerity of the girl moved him as nothing had ever moved him before. He recognized the feeling for what it was, the need within him to protect and care for something beyond himself. It was that, in part, that during these last years had led him to fight so many fights that were not his. And yet, was not the cause of human liberty and freedom always every man's trust? Jackie was going about the business of making a bed on the floor, as though he spent his life at it. He seemed pleased with his opportunity to show some skill, some ability to do things. Trent reached up and took down his guns and checked them as he had every night of the entire year in which they'd hung from that peg. For a minute after he completed the check, he held them. He liked the feel of them, even when he hated what they meant. Slowly, he replaced them on the peg. End of chapter one. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis Lemoore, in the public domain. Chapter two. The early morning sun was just turning the dew-drenched grass into settings for diamonds when Trent was out of his pallet and roping some horses. Yet early as it was when he returned to the cabin, the fire was going and Sally was preparing breakfast. She smiled at him, but her eyes were red and he could see that she'd been crying. Jackie, beginning to realize now the full meaning of the tragedy, was showing his grief through his anger. But was very quiet. Trent was less worried about Jackie than about Sally. Only six years before, according to what Dick Moffat had told him, Sally Crane had been found hiding in the bushes. Her father's wagons had been burned and her parents murdered by renegades posing as Indians. Since then, Dick had cared for her. Dick's wife had died scarcely a year before, and the girl had tried to take over the household duties. Yet even to a western girl, hardened to a rough life, two such tragedies each driving her from a home, might be enough to upset her for life. When breakfast was over, he took them to the saddled horses, and they walked back to the cabin alone, and when he returned, he carried an old Sharp's rifle. He looked at it for a moment, and then he glanced at Jackie. The boy's eyes were widening, unbelieving, yet bright with hope. Jackie, Trent said quietly, When I was fourteen, I was a man. I had to be. Well, it looks like your pappy dying has made you a man, too. I'm going to give you this Sharps. She's an old gun, but she can shoot. But Jackie, I'm not giving this gun to a boy. I'm giving it to a man. I'm giving it to Jackie Moffat. And he's already showed himself pretty much of a man. A man, Jackie, don't ever shoot a gun unless he has to. He don't go around shooting heedless like. He shoots only when he has to, and then he don't miss. This gun's a present, Jackie, and there's no strings attached. But it carries a responsibility, and that is that it's never to be used against a man unless it's in defense of your life or the lives or the homes of those that you love. You're to keep it loaded always. A gun ain't good to no man unless it's loaded. And if it's setting around, people won't be handling it careless. They'll say that's Jackie Moffat's gun, and it's always loaded. It's always guns people think are empty that kill people by accident. Gosh, Jackie stared in admiration at the battered old sharps. That's a weapon, man. And then he looked up at Trent. His eyes were filled with tears of sincerity. Mr. Trent, I sure do promise. I'll never use no gun unless I have to. Trent swung into the saddle and watched the others mount. He carried his own Winchester, one of the new 1873 models that were replacing the old Sharps on the frontier. He was under no illusions. If King Bill Hale decided to put an end to the nesters among the high peaks, he would probably succeed. But Hale was so impressed with his own power that he was not reckoning with the Hatfields, O'Hara, or himself. You know, Jackie, Trent said thoughtfully, there's a clause in the Constitution that says it's the right of an American to keep and bear arms, and it shall not be abridged. 
They put that in there, so a man would always have a gun to defend his home or his liberty. Right now, there's a man in this valley who's trying to take the liberty and freedom of some men away from them. When a man starts that, and when there isn't any law to help, you gotta fight. I've killed men, Jackie, and it ain't a good thing, no way. But I never killed a man unless he was deserving of killing, and unless he forced me into a corner where it was me or him. This here country's big enough for all, but some men get greedy for money or power, and when they do, the little men have to fight to keep what they got. Your pappy died in a war for freedom, just as much as if he was killed on a battlefield somewheres. Whenever a brave man dies for what he believes, he wins more than he loses. Maybe not for him, but for men like him that want to live honest and true. The trail narrowed and grew rougher, and Trent felt a quick excitement within him, as he always did when he rode up to this windy plateau. They went up through the tall pines toward the knife-like ridges that crested the divide. And when they finally reached the plateau, he reined in, as he always did when he reached that spot. Over the vast distance that was Cedar Valley lay the blue haze that deepened to purple against the far distant mountains. Here the air was fresh and clear, crisp with the crispness of the high peaks and the sense of limitless distance. Skirting the rim, Trent led on and finally came to the second place that he loved. A place he not only loved, but which was a challenge to all that was in him. For here, the divide, with its skyscraper ridges, was truly a divide. It drew a ragged, mountainous line between the lush beauty of Cedar Valley and the awful waste of the scarred and tortured Smoky Desert. Always there seemed a haze of dust or smoke hanging in the sky over Smoky Desert, and what lay below it no man could say, for no known trail led down the steep canyon to the waste below. An Indian had once told him that his fathers knew of a trail to the bottom, but no living man knew it, and no man seemed to care, nobody but Trent, drawn by his own loneliness to the vaster loneliness below. Far away were ragged mountains, red, black, and broken, like the jagged stumps of broken teeth gnawing at the sky. It was, he believed, the far edge of what was actually an enormous crater, greater than any other of its kind on Earth. Some day, he told his companions, I'm going down there. It looks like the mouth of hell itself, but I'm going down. Parson Hatfield and his four tall sons were all in sight when the three rode up to the cabin. All were carrying their long Kentucky rifles. All right, Trent, Parsons drawled, widening his gash of mouth into a smile. We was expecting most anybody else. Been some ruckus down the valley. Yeah, Trent swung down. They killed Dick Moffat. These are his kids, Parson. I figured maybe you could make a place for them. You thought right, son. The good Lord takes care of his own, but we have to help. There's always room for another beneath the roof of the Hatfield. Quincy Hatfield, the oldest of the lean, raw-boned Kentucky boys, joined them. Howdy, he said. Did Pap tell you about Leathers? Leathers? Trent frowned in quick apprehension. What about him? He ain't a gonna sell to us no more. The tall young man spat and shifted his rifle to the hollow of his other arm. That makes the closest store over at Blazer, and that's three days across the mountains. Trent shrugged, frowning. He aims to freeze us out or kill us off. He glanced at Parson speculatively. What are you planning? Hatfield shook his head. Nothing so far. Sort of figured we might get together with the rest of the nesters and try to figure something out. I had Jake ride down to get O'Hara, Smithers, and young Bartram. We've got to have us a confab. Parson Hatfield rubbed his long, grizzled jaw and stared at Trent. His gray eyes were inquisitive and sly. You know, Trent, I always had me an idea that you were some shakes of a battler yourself. Maybe if you'd wear some guns, 
He'd make some of them gun slick hombres of Hales back down cold. Trent smiled. Why, person, I guess you guess wrong. Me? I'm a peace loving hombre. I like the hills, and all I ask is to be left alone. And if they don't let you alone? Person stared at him shrewdly, chewing his tobacco slowly, and watching Trent with keen gray eyes. If they don't let me alone, and if they start killing my friends, Trent looked to Hatfield. Why, Parson, I reckon I'd take my guns down from that peg. I reckon I'd fight. Hatfield nodded. That's all I wanted to know, Trent. I ain't spent my life a feudin' without knowing a fightin' man when I see one. O'Hara and young Bartram will fight. Smithers, too. But he don't stack up like no fightin' man. My young'uns, they cut their teeth on rifle stock. So I reckon when the fighting begins, I'll be bloodin' the two young'uns like I did the older two back in Kentucky. Trent kicked his toe into the dust. Don't you reckon we better get the woman folks off to Blazer? There ain't many of us, parson. And Hale must have him fifty riders. We better get them out while the getting's good. Hale's got more than fifty riders, but the woman'll stay, Trent. Ma, she ain't for going. You ain't got no woman of your own, Trent. So I don't reckon you know how impossible ornery they can be. <laughs> but Ma, she'll be fit to be tied if it was said that she was going to go to Blazer when we had us a scrap. Ma loaded rifles for me in Kentucky when she was a gal, and she loaded them for me crossing the plains, and she done her share of shooting, Trent. I'd rather face all of them hails than Ma. If we tried to send her away, she always says her place is with her men folks, and there she'll stay. I reckon Quince's wife feels the same, and so does Jessie's woman. Trent nodded. Parson, we gotta guess us an argument with the rest of them when they get here. They've gotta leave their places and come up here. Together we could make a pretty stiff fight of it. Scattered, they'd cut us down one by one. He swung into the saddle. I'm going down to Cedar Bluff. I'm going to go see Leathers. Without waiting for a reply, Trent swung the buckskin away and loped down the trail. He knew very well that he was taking a chance. The killing had started. Dick Moffat was down, they'd burned his place. Within no time at all, the Hale Riders would be carrying fire and blood through the high hills, wiping out the nesters. If he could but see King Bill, there might be a chance. Watching him go, Parson Hatfield shook his head doubtfully, and then he turned to his eldest. Quince, you rope yourself a horse, boy, and you and Jesse follow him into Cedar Bluff. He may get himself into trouble. A few minutes later, the two tall, loose-limbed mountain men started down the trail on their flea-bitten mustangs. They were solemn, dry young men, who chewed tobacco and talked slowly, but they'd grown up in the hard school of the Kentucky mountains, and they'd come west across the plains. End of chapter two. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis L'Amour in the public domain. Chapter three. Unknowing, Trent rode rapidly. He knew what he had to do, even as he rode, his thoughts were on the Hatfields. He liked them. Hard-working, honest, opinionated. They were fierce to resent any intrusion on their personal liberty, their women's honor, or their pride. They were the kind of men to ride the river with. It was such men who'd been the backbone of America. The fence corner soldier. The man who carried his rifle in the hollow of his arm but the kind of men who knew that fighting was not a complicated business, but simply a matter of killing and keeping from being killed. They were the men of the blood of Dan Boone and Kit Carson, Jim Bridger, the Green Mountain Boys, Dan Freeman, and those who whipped the cream of the British regulars at Concord, Bunker Hill and New Orleans. They knew nothing of Prussian methods of close order drill, they did nothing by the numbers. Many of them had flat feet, and many had few teeth. But they fought from cover, and they made every shot count. 
and they lived while the enemy died. The Hale Ranch was a tremendous power, and it had many riders, but they were men hired for their ability with guns, as well as with ropes and cattle. King Bill Hale, wise as he was, was grown confident, and he did not know the caliber of such men as the Hatfields. The numbers Hale had might lead to victory, but not until many men had died. O'Hara? The big Irishman was blunt and hard. He was not the shrewd fighter that the Hatfields were, but he was courageous, and he knew not the meaning of retreat. Himself? Trent's eyes narrowed. He had no illusions about himself. As much as he avoided trouble, he knew that within him there was something that held a fierce resentment for abuse of power, for tyranny. There was something in him that loved battle, too, and he could not dodge the fact. He would avoid trouble, but when it came, he would go into it with the fierce love of battle for battle's sake. Some day, he knew, he would ride to the cattle, in the high meadows, back to the cabin in the pines, and he would take down his guns and buckle them on, and then Kilkenny would ride again. The trail skirted deep canyons and led down to the flat bottom land of the valley. King Bill, he knew, was learning what he should have long ago, that the flat lands, while rich, became hot and dry in the summer weather, while the high meadows remained green and lush, and there cattle could graze and grow fat. And King Bill was moving to take back what he'd missed so long ago. Had the man been less blinded by his own power and strength, he would have hesitated over the Hatfields, for one and all, they were fighting men. Riding into Cedar Bluff would be dangerous now. Changes were coming to the west, and Trent had hoped to leave his reputation in Texas. He could see the old days of violence were nearing an end. Billy the Kid had been killed by Pat Garrett. King Fisher and Ben Thompson were heard of much less. One and all, the gunmen were beginning to taper off. Names that had once been mighty in the West were already drifting into legend. As for himself, few men could describe him. He'd come and gone like a shadow. And where he was now, no man could say, and only one woman. King Bill even owned the law in Cedar Bluff. He'd called an election to choose a sheriff and a judge. There'd been no fairness in that election. It was true that no particularly unfair practices had been tolerated, but the few nesters and small ranchers had no chance against the fifty-odd riders from the Hale Ranch and the townspeople who needed Hale business or who worked for him. Trent had voted himself. He'd voted for O'Hara. There'd been scarcely a dozen votes for O'Hara, but one of those votes had been that of Jim Hale, King Bill's eldest son. Another, he knew, had been one person in Cedar Bluff who he'd studiously avoided, the half-Spanish, half-Irish girl, Nita Riordan. Trent had avoided Nita Riordan because the beautiful girl from the Texas-Mexican border was the one person who knew him for what he was, who knew him as Kilkenny, the gunfighter. Whenever Trent thought of the trouble in Cedar Bluff, he thought less of killing King Bill, and more of Cub Hale. The older man was huge and powerful physically, but he was not a killer. It was true that he was responsible for deaths, but they were of men who he believed to be his enemies, or to be trespassing on his land. But Cub Hale was a killer. Two days after Trent had first come to Cedar Bluff, he'd seen Cub Hale kill a man. It was a drunken miner, a burly, quarrelsome fellow, who could have done with a pistol barrel alongside the head, but needed nothing more. Yet Cub Hale had shot him down ruthlessly and heedlessly. And then there'd been the case of Jack Lindsay, a known gunman, and Cub had killed him in a fair stand-up fight, with an even break all around. Lindsay's gun had barely cleared its holster when the first of three shots hit him. Trent had walked over to the man's body to see for himself. He could have put a playing card over those three holes. That was shooting. 
There had been other stories of which Trent had only heard. Cub had caught two rustlers red-handed and killed them both. He'd killed a Mexican sheep herder in Magdalia. He killed a gunfighter in Fort Sumner, and gut shot another near Sirocco, leaving him to die slowly in the desert. Besides Cub, there were Dunn and Ravitz. Both were graduates of the Lincoln Country War. Both had been in the Trail City, and had left California just ahead of a posse. Both were familiar names among the Dark Brotherhood that lived by the gun. They were strictly cash-and-carry warriors, men whose guns were for hire. Buck, Trent told his horse thoughtfully, if war starts in Cedar Hills, there'll be a powerful lot of killing. I gotta see King Bill. I gotta talk reason into him. Cedar Bluff could have been any cow town. Two things set it off from others. One was the stone stage station, which also contained the main office of the Hale Ranch. The other was the huge and sprawling crystal palace belonging to Nita Riordan. Trent loped the yellow horse down the dusty street and swung down in front of Leather's general store. He walked into the cool interior. The place smelled of leather and dry goods, and at the rear, where they dispensed food and other supplies, he halted. Bert Leathers looked up for his customer as Trent walked in, and Trent saw his face change. Leathers wet his lips and kept his eyes away from Trent. At the same time, Trent heard a slight movement, and glancing casually around, he saw a heavy-set cowhand wearing a tied-down gun lounging against the rack of saddles. The fellow took his cigarette out of his lips and stared at Trent from shrewd, calculating eyes. Need a few things, Leathers, Trent said casually. Got a list here. The man Leathers was serving stepped aside. He was a townsman, and he looked worried. Sorry, Trent, Leathers said abruptly. I can't help you. All you nesters have been ordered off of the hail range, and I can't sell you anything. Lickin' Hale's boots, are you? Trent asked quietly. I heard you were at Leathers, but I doubted it. I figured a man with nerve enough to come west and set up for himself would be his own man. I am my own man, Leathers snapped. His pride was stung. I just don't want your business. I'll remember that, Leathers, Trent said quietly. When all this is over, I'll remember that. You're forgetting something. This is America. And here the people always win. Maybe not at first, but they always win in the end. And when this is over, if the people win, you better leave. Understand? Leathers looked up. His face was white, yet angry. But he looked uncertain. You all better grab yourself some air, a cool voice suggested. Trent turned. He saw the gun hand standing with his thumbs in his belt grinning at him. Better slide, Trent. What the man says is true. King Bill's taken over. I'm here to see Leathers doesn't have no trouble with Nesters. All right, Trent said quietly. I'm a quiet man myself. I expect that rightly I should take the gun away from you and shove it down your throat. But Leathers is probably gun shy, and there might be some shooting, so I'll take a walk. My name's Dan Cooper, the gun hand suggested mildly. Any time you're ready to get on the prod about shoving this gun down my throat, look me up. Trent smiled. I'll do that, Cooper. And if you stay with King Bill, I'm afraid you're going to have a heavy diet of lead. He's cut in a wide swath. Uh-huh. Cooper was cheerful and tough. But he's got a blade that cuts him off short. Ever see the Hatfield shoot? Trent suggested. Take a tip, old son. When those long Kentucky rifles open up, you be somewhere else. Dan Cooper nodded sagely. You got something there, partner. You really have. That parson's got him a cold eye. Trent turned and started for the street, but Cooper's voice halted him. The gun hand had followed him to the door. Say, Cooper's voice was curious. Was you ever in Dodge? Trent smiled. Maybe. Maybe I was. You think that one over, Cooper. He looked at the gun hand thoughtfully. I'd like you, he said bluntly, so I'm giving you a tip. 
You get on your horse and you ride. King Bell's got the men, but he ain't gonna win. Ride, because I always hate to kill a good man. Trent turned and walked down the street. Behind him, he could feel Dan Cooper's eyes on his back. The gunman was scowling. Now who the hell, he muttered. That hombre's salty. Plum salty. Three more attempts to buy supplies proved to Trent that he was frozen out in Cedar Bluff. Worried now, he started to his horse. The nesters could not buy in Cedar Bluff. That meant their only supplies must come from a long wagon trip across the country from Bla Blazer. Trent gave grave doubts that Hale would let the wagons proceed unmolested. And their little party was so small they could not spare the men to guard the wagons on the three-day trek over the desert and around the mountains. Trent! He turned slowly and found himself facing Price Dixon, a dealer from the Crystal Palace. Nita wants to see you. Asked me to find you and ask if you'd come see her. For a long moment, Trent hesitated, and then he shrugged. All right, he said. It won't do any good to have her seen with me. We nesters aren't looked upon with much favor these days. Dixon nodded, sober-faced. Looks like a shootout. I'm afraid you boys are on the short end of it. Maybe. Dixon glanced at him at the corner of his eye. Don't you wear a gun? They'll kill you someday. Without a gun, you don't have many fights. It wouldn't stop Cub Hale. When he decides to shoot, he does. He won't care whether you're packing a gun or not. No, it wouldn't matter to him. Price Dixon studied him thoughtfully. Who are you, Trent? He asked softly. I'm Trent, a nester. Who else? That's what I'm wondering. I'm dry behind the ears. I've been dealing cards in the West ever since the war between the states. I've seen men who pack guns, and I know the breed. You're not Wes Harden. You're not Hickok. You're not one of the Earps. You never drink much, so you can't be Thompson. But whoever you are, you've packed a gun. Don't lose any sleep over it. Dixon shrugged. I won't. I'm not taking sides in this fight or any other. If I guess, I won't say. You're a friend of Nita's, and that's enough for me. Besides, Jamie Brigo likes you. He glanced at Trent. What do you think of him? Brigo? Trent said thoughtfully. Brigo is part yaki, part devil, and all loyal. But I'd sooner tackle three King Bill Hells than him. He's poison. Dixon nodded. I think you're right. He sits there by her door, night after night, apparently asleep. Yet he knows more about what goes on in this town than any five other men. Dixon, you should talk Nita into selling out. Good chance of getting her place burned out or shot up if she stays. It's going to be a long fight. Hale doesn't think so. Parson Hatfield does. I've seen Hatfield. He looks like something I'd leave alone. Dixon paused. I was in Kentucky once, a long time ago. The Hatfields have had three feuds. Somehow, there's always Hatfields left. Well, Price, Trent threw down his cigarette into the dust. I've seen a few fighting men, too, and I'm glad to say that the Hatfields are on my side, and particularly the parson. End of chapter three. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis L'Amour, in the public domain. Chapter 4 The Crystal Palace was one of those places that made the western frontier what it was. Wherever there was money to spend, gambling joints could be found, and some became ornate palaces of drinking and gambling like this one. They had them in Abilene and Dodge, but not so much farther west. Cedar Bluff had the high-paid riders of the Hale Ranch, it also drew miners from Rock Creek. The palace was all gilt and glass. There were plenty of games going, including roulette, faro, and dice. Around the room had scattered tables were at least a dozen poker games. Nita Riordan, Trent decided, was doing all right. The place was making money, and lots of it. 
Trent knew a lot about gambling houses, enough to know what rake-off these games could be turning into the house. There was no necessity for crooked games. The percentage was entirely adequate. They crossed the room, and Trent saw Jamie Brigo sitting on a chair against the wall, as he always sat. The sombrero on the floor was gray and new. He wore a dark, tailored trouser with a short velvet jacket, also black. The shirt underneath was silk and blue. He wore, as always, two guns. He looked up as Trent approached, his lips parted over even white teeth. Buenos dias, senor, he said. Price stopped and nodded his head toward the door. She's in there. Trent faced the door and drew a deep breath and stepped inside. His heart was pounding and his mouth was dry. No woman had ever stirred him so deeply or made him realize so much what he was missing in his lonely life. It was a quiet room, utterly different from the garish display of the gambling hall behind them. It was a room to live in, a room of one who loved comfort and peace. On the ledge by the window were several potted plants. On the table lay an open book. These things he absorbed rather than observed, for all of his attention was centered upon Nita Riordan. She stood across the table, taller than most women, with a slender yet voluptuous body that made the pulse pound in his throat. She was dressed for evening, an evening walking among the tables of the gambling room, and she was wearing a black and spangled gown, utterly different from the room in which she stood. Her eyes were wide now, her full lips parted a little, and he stopped across the table. He could see the lift of her bosom as she took a deep breath. Nita, he said softly, you've not changed, you're the same. I'm older, Lance, she said softly, more than a year older. Has it only been a year? It seems so much longer. He looked at her thoughtfully. And you are lovely, as always. I think you could never be anything but lovely and desirable. And yet, she reminded him, when you could have had me, you rode away. Lance, why do you live all alone in that cabin of yours, without anyone? He nodded except for memories, except for the thinking that I do. And the thinking only makes it worse, for whenever I think of you, and all that could be, I remember the Brockmans, Bert Pulte, and all the others back down the trail. And then I start wondering how long it'll be before I fall in the dust myself. That's why I sent for you, Nita told him. Her eyes were serious and worried. She came around the table and took his hands. Lance, you've got to go. Leave here now. I can hold your place for you, if that's what you want. If that doesn't matter, say so, and I'll go with you. I'll go with you anywhere, but we must leave here. Why? It was like him to be direct. She looked up into his dark, unsmiling face. Why, Nita? Why do you want me to go? Because they're going to kill you, she exclaimed. She caught his arm. Lance, they're cruel. Ruthless, vicious. It isn't King Bill. He's their leader. But what he does, he believes to be right. It's Cub. He loves to kill. I've seen him. Last week he killed a boy in the street in front of my place. He shot him down and then emptied his gun into him with slow, methodical shots. He's a fiend. Lance shook his head. I'll stay, no matter. But listen, Lance, she protested. I've heard them talking here. They're sure you'll fight. I don't know why they think so, but they do. They've decided that you must die, and soon. They won't give you a chance, I know that. I can't, Nita. These people in the high meadows, they're my friends. They depend on me, to stand by them. I won't be the first to break and run, or the last. I'm staying. I'm gonna fight it out here, Nita. And we'll see who's to win. The people... Or the man of power and greed. I was afraid you'd say that. Nita looked at him seriously. Hale is out to win, Lance. He's got men. They don't know your Lance Kilkenny. I've heard them talking. And they do suspect that you're something more than a nester named Trent. 
but Hale is sure that he's right and he'll fight to the end. Trent nodded. I know. When a man thinks he's right, he'll fight all the harder. Has anyone tried to talk to him? You can't. You can't even address him. He lives in a world of his own. In his way, I think he's a little insane, Lance. But he does have ability, and he has strength, and he's a fighter too. Trent studied her thoughtfully. You seem to know him. Has he made you any trouble? Why do you ask that? Nita asked quickly. I want to know. He wants to marry me, Lance. Trent tightened and then stared at her. I see, he said slowly. And you? I don't know, she hesitated, looking away. Lance, can't you see? I'm lonely. Dreadfully, frighteningly lonely. I have no life here, just a business. I know no women but those of the dance hall. I see no one who feels as I do, thinks as I do. King Bill is strong. He knows how to appeal to a woman. He has a lot to offer. He has a son as old as I, but he's only forty, and he's a powerful man, Lance. A man and woman could be proud of. I don't like what he's doing, but he does think he's right. No, she said finally. I won't marry him. I'll admit, I've been tempted. He's a little insane, I think, drunk with power. He's got too much and he got it too easily. He believes he's better than other men because he succeeded. But whatever you do, Lance, don't underrate him. He's a fighter. You mean he'll have his men fight? Trent asked. No. I mean he is a fighter. By any method. With his fists if he has to. He told me once in such a flat, ordinary voice that it startled me that he could whip any man he ever saw with his hands. I see. Shaw, his foreman, tells a story about King Bill beating a man to death in El Paso. He killed another one with his fists on the ranch. I've got to see him today. I've got to convince him that we must be left alone. He won't talk to you, Lance. Nita looked at him with grave, troubled eyes. I know him. He'll just turn you over to his cow hands and they'll beat you up or kill you. He'll talk to me. Don't go down there, Lance. Please don't. Has he ever made any trouble for you? No, she shook her head. So far, he's listened to me and he's talked very quietly and very well. No one has made any trouble yet, but largely because they know he's interested in me. Some men tried to hold me up one night, but Jamie took care of that. He killed them both. And that started some talk. But if King Bill decides that he wants this place, or me, he'll stop at nothing. Well, he turned, I've got to see him, Nita. I've got to make one attempt to stop him before anyone else is killed. And if you fail? He hesitated and his shoulders drooped. Then he looked up and he smiled slowly. If I fail, Nita, I'll buckle on my guns. <coughs> and they won't have to wait for war. I'll bring it to Cedar Bluff myself. He stopped in the outer room and watched Price Dixon dealing cards. But his mind wasn't on the game. He was thinking of King Bill. Hale was a man who fought to win, and in this little corner of the West, there was no law but that of the gun. Actually, there were but two trails in and out of Cedar Valley. What news left the valley would depend on Hale. The echoes of the war to come need never be heard beyond these hills. Only one trail led into Cedar Bluffs and one led out. Most of the traffic went in and out on the same route. The other trail, the little-used route to Blazer, was rough and bad. Yet in Blazer, too, Hale owned the livery stable, and he had his spies there all around. <coughs> Hale himself had lived in the castle, two miles from Cedar Bluff. He rode into town each and every day, and stopped at the Mecca for a drink, and then again at the Crystal Palace. He rode out of town. He went nowhere without his gunmen around him. Thinking of that, Trent decided on the Mecca. There would be trouble, unless everything happened just right, and he didn't want trouble close to Nita. He knew that Nita meant what she said, and she was lonely. 
There'd never been a time when he hadn't been lonely. He'd been born on the frontier in Dakota, but his father had been killed in a gun battle, and he'd gone to live with an uncle in New York, and then later in Virginia. Trent walked out on the street. It was late now, and the sun was already gone. It would soon be dark. He walked down to the buckskin and led him to the watering trough. Then he gave him a bundle of hay and left him tied at the hitching rail. There were few people around. Dan Cooper had left the store and was sitting on the steps in front now. He watched Trent thoughtfully. Finally, he got up and walked slowly down the walk. He stopped near the buckskin. If I was you, Trent, he said slowly, I'd get on that horse and hit the trail. You ain't among friends. Thanks, Trent looked up at Cooper. I think that's friendly, Cooper, but I've got business. I don't want a war in Cedar Bluff, Cooper. But I want to make one more stab at stopping it. And if you don't? Cooper studied him quizzically. If I don't? Trent stepped up on the boardwalk. Well, I'll tell you like I've told the others. If I don't, I'm going to buckle on my guns and come to town. Dan Cooper began to roll a cigarette. You sound all fired sure of yourself. Who are you? Like I said, old son, I'm a nester. Name a Trent. He turned and strolled down the walk toward the Mecca. Even as he walked, he saw a small cavalcade of horsemen come up the road from the castle. Four men, and the big man on the bay would be King Bill Hale. Hale got down and strode through the doors. Cub followed. Rabbits tied King Bill's horse, and Dunn stood for a moment staring at Trent, who he could not quite make out in the gathering gloom. And then he and Rabbits walked inside. End of chapter four. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis Lemoore in the public domain. Chapter five. Walking up, Trent pushed open the swinging doors. He stopped for an instant inside the door. The place was jammed with hail cow hands. At the bar, King Bill was standing his back to the room. He was big, no taller than Trent, perhaps an inch shorter than Trent's six one, but much heavier. He was broad and powerful, with thick shoulders and a massive chest. His head was a block set upon a thick column of a muscular neck. The man's jaw was broad, his face was brown and hard. He was a bull. Looking at him, Trent could guess that the stories of his killing men with his fists were only the truth. Beside him in white buckskin was the slender cat-like cub Hale, and on either side of those two stood two gunmen, Dunn and Rabbits. Trent walked slowly to the bar in order to drink. Dunn, hearing his voice, turned his head slowly. As his eyes met Trent's, the glass slipped from his fingers and crashed to the bar, scattering rye whiskey. You seem nervous, Dunn, Trent said quietly. Let me buy you a drink. I'll be hanged if I will, Dunn shouted. What do you want here? Trent smiled. All the room was listening, and he knew that many of the townspeople, some of whom might still be on the fence, were present. Why, I just thought I'd ride down here and have a talk with King Bill, he said quietly. It seems there's a lot of war talk and somebody killed a harmless nester the other day. It seemed a man like Big King Bill Hale wouldn't want such things going on. Get out! Dunn's hand hovered over a gun. Get out or be carried out! No use you making motions toward that gun, Trent said quietly. I'm not healed. Look for yourself. I'm making peace talk, and I'm talking to King Bill. I said get out! Dunn shouted. Trent stood with his hands on his hips, smiling. Suddenly, Dunn's hands streaked for his gun, and instantly Trent moved. One hand dropped to gun Dunn's gun wrist, while his right whipped up with a short wicked arc that exploded on Dunn's chin. The gunman sagged, and Trent released his gun hand and shoved him away so hard that he fell headlong into a table. The table crashed over, and among the scattered cards and chips, Bing Dunn lay out cold. In the silence that followed, 
Trent stepped quickly up to King Bill. Hale, he said abruptly. Some of your men killed Dick Moffat, shot him down in cold blood. And then they burned him out. Those same men warned me to move out. I thought I'd come to you, because I've heard you're a fa fair man. King Bill did not move. He held his glass in his fingers and stared thoughtfully into the mirror back of the bar, giving no indication that he heard. Cub Hale moved out from the bar, his head thrust forward, his eyes eager. Hale, Trent said sharply, this is between you and me. Call off your dogs. I'm talking to you and not anybody else. We want peace, but if we have to fight to keep our land, we'll fight. And if we fight, we'll win. You're bucking the United States government now. Cub had stepped out, but now his lips curled back into a wolfish snarl as his hand hovered over his gun. What's the matter, Hale? Trent persisted. Making a hired killer of your son because you're afraid to talk? Hale turned deliberately. Cub, get back. I'll handle this. Cub hesitated, his eyes alive with eagerness and disappointment. I said, Hale repeated, to get back. And he turned. As for you, you squatted on my land. Now you're getting off. All of you. If you don't get off, some of you may die, and that's final. No, Trent's voice rang out sharply. It's not final, Hale. We took those claims legal. You never made any claim to them until now. You've got more land now than you can handle, and we're staying. I filed on my claim with the United States, and so did the others. If we don't get justice, we'll get a United States Marshal in here to see why. Justice, Hale sneered. You blasted nesters will get all the justice you'll get from me. I'm giving you time to leave. Now get! Trent stood his ground. He could see the fury of the bolted up Hale. He could see the man was relentless. Well, maybe. Suddenly Trent smiled. Hale, he said slowly, I've heard you're a fighting man. I hope that ain't a lie. I'm calling you now. We fight man to man right here in this bar room. No hold barred. And if I win, you leave the nesters alone. If you win, we'll all leave. King Bill wheeled. His eyes were bulging. You challenge me? You dirty-necked nest and renegade. No, I bargain with no man. You nesters get moving or suffer the consequences. What's the matter, Bill? Trent said slowly. You afraid? For a long moment, there was deathly stillness in the room. While Hale's face grew darker and darker. And then slowly, he unbuckled his gun belt. You asked for it, Nestor, he sneered. Now you get it. He rushed. Trent had been watching, and as Hale rushed, he sidestepped quickly. Hale's rush missed, and Trent faced him smiling. What's the matter, King? I'm right here. Hale rushed, and Trent stepped in with a left jab that split Hale's lip and showered him with blood. In a fury, Hale closed in and caught Trent in a powerful right swing that sent him staggering on his heels. Blood staining his gray shirt. King Bill leapt at Trent, swinging with both hands. Trent crashed to the floor, rolled over, and got up. Another swing caught him and he went down again, his head roaring with sound. King Bill rushed in, aiming a vicious kick, but Trent rolled out of the way and scrambled up, groggy and hurt. Hale rushed and Trent weaved inside of a swing and smashed a right and left to that massive body. Hale grabbed Trent and hurled him into the bar with terrific power and then sprang close, swinging both fists to Trent's head. Trent slipped the first punch, but took the other one and started to sag. King Bill set himself a cold sneer on his face and measured Trent with a left, aiming a ponderous right. But Trent pushed the left aside and smashed a wicked left uppercut to Hale's wind. The bigger man gasped and missed a right. Trent stabbed another left to the bleeding mouth. Hale landed a right, knocked Trent rolling on the floor. Somebody kicked him wickedly in the ribs as he rolled against the feet of the crowd. He came up staggering as Hale closed in. Hurt, gasping with pain, Trent clinched desperately and hung on. Hale tore him loose, smashing a left to his head that split his cheekbone wide open and smashed him on the jaw with a powerful right. Again, Trent stabbed with that left to the mouth, ducked under a right and bored in, slamming away with both hands at close quarters. 
Hale grabbed him and threw him, and then rushed upon him, but even as he jumped at him, Trent caught Hale with a toe in the pit of the stomach and pitched him over on his head and shoulders. King Bill staggered up, visibly shaken. Then Trent walked in. His face was streaming blood and his head was buzzing, but he could see Hale's face weaving before him. He walked in and deliberately lanced that bleeding mouth with a left, and then crossed a right that ripped the flesh over Hale's eye. Dunn started forward, and with an oath, Hale waved him back. He put up his hands and walked in, his face twisted with hatred. Trent let him come, fainted, and then dropped a right under the big man's heart. Hale staggered, and Trent walked in, stabbed another left to the blood-covered face, and then smashed another right to the wind. Then he stood there and began to swing. Hale was swinging too, but his power was gone. Trent bored in, his head clearing as he slammed punch after punch into the face and body of the tottering rancher. He was getting a second wind now, although he was hurt, and blood dripped from his face to his shirt. He brushed Hale's hands aside and crossed a driving right to the chin. Hale's knees buckled, but before he could fall, Trent hit him twice more, left and right to the chin, and then Hale crashed to the floor. In the instant of silence that followed the fall of King, a voice rang out. All of you just hold to where you're standing now. I ain't a wanting to shoot nobody. But sure as my name is Quince Hatfield, the first one to make a move dies. The long rifle stared through the open window at them. And in the next window sill they saw another. Nobody in the room moved. In three steps, Trent was out of the room. The buckskin was standing at the edge of the walk with the other horses. Swinging into the saddle, he wrenched the rifle from the boot, and with two quick shots, sent the chandelier crashing to the floor, plunging the mecca into darkness. And then, with the Hatfields at his side, he raced the buckskin toward the edge of town. When they slowed down a mile out of town, Quince looked at him, grinning in the moonlight. I reckon you all sure busted things wide open now. Trent nodded somberly. I tried to make peace talk. When he wouldn't, I thought a good licking might show the townsfolk that the fight wasn't all on one side. We're going to need friends. You done a good job, Jesse said. Parsonal sure wish he'd been along. He always said what Hale needed was a good whooping. Well, he sure enough had it tonight. Nothing, Trent realized, had been solved by the fight. Taking to the brush, they used every stratagem to ward off pursuit. Although they knew it was exceedingly doubtful if any pursuit would be started against three armed men who were skilled woodsmen, following them in the dark would be impossible, and would be scarcely wise. Three hours later they swung down at the Hatfield cabin. A tall young man with broad shoulders stepped out into the darkness. It's us, Saul, Jesse said, and Trent Dunn whipped King Bill Hale with his fists. <laughs> Saul Hatfield strode up smiling. I reckon Paul sure be glad to hear that. They gone to bed? Uh-huh. Lijah was on guard till a few minutes back. He just turned in to catch himself some sleep before morning. O'Hara get here? Quince asked softly. Yeah. Him and Smithers and Bartram are here, having a big confab come morning. End of chapter five. A Man Called Trent? A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour in the Public Domain Chapter 6 The morning sun was lifting over the pines when the men gathered around the long table in the Hatfield home. Breakfast was over and the women were at work. Trent sat quietly at the foot of the table, thoughtfully looking at the men around him. Yet even as he looked, he could not but wonder how many would be alive to enjoy the fruits of victory, if victory it was to be. The five Hatfields were all there. Big O'Hara was there, too, a huge man with great shoulders and mighty hands, a bull for strength and a good shot. Bartram, young, good-looking, and keen, would fight. He believed in what he was fighting for, and he had the youth and energy enough to be looking forward to the struggle. Smithers was middle-aged, a quiet man who'd lived a peaceful life, avoiding trouble, yet fearless. He was a small man, 
precise, and excellent farmer, probably the best farmer of the lot. Two more horsemen rode in while they were sitting down. Jackson Height was a wild horse hunter, former cowhand and buffalo hunter, and Steve Runyon was a former miner. Parson Hatfield straightened up slowly. I reckon this here meetin' better get started. Them hails ain't a-goin' to wait for us to get organized. I reckon there's a few things that we've got to do. We've got to pick us a leader, and we've got to think about getting some food. Trent spoke up. Parson, if you'll let me have a word. We'd all better leave our places and come here to yours. We'd better bring all the food and horses we've got up here. Leave our places? Smithers objected. Why, man, they'd burn us out if we're not there to defend them. They'll ruin our crops. He's right, O'Hara said. If we ain't on hand to defend them, they sure won't last long. Which of you feel qualified to stand off Hale's riders? Trent asked dryly. What man here could hold off ten or twenty men? I don't feel like I could. I don't think the parson could alone. We've got to get together. Suppose they burn us out, we can build again. If we're alive to do it. And we can band together and help each other build back. If you ain't alive, you ain't going to build very much. That strikes me as being plumb sense, Height said, leaning forward. Looks to me like we've got to sink or swim together. Hale's got too much power, and we're too scattered. He ain't planning on getting us together. He's planning on wiping us out one at a time. Together, we got us a chance. Maybe you're right, O'Hara said slowly. Dick Moffat sure didn't do well alone. This place can be defended, Trent said. Aside from my own place, this is the easiest to defend of them all. And then, the house is the biggest and the strongest. If we have to fall back to the rocks, the house can hold out. What about a leader, Bartram asked. We better get that settled. How about you, Parson? No, Parson drew himself up. I'm right fl flattered, right pleased. But I ain't your man. I move that we choose Trent here. There was a moment's silence, and then O'Hara spoke up. I second that motion. Trent's good for me. He whipped old King Bill. Ronyan looked thoughtfully at Trent. I don't know this gent, he said slowly. I ain't got any objections to him, but how do we know that he's our man? You've done a powerful lot of feudin', Parson. You should know this kind of fightin'. I do, Parson drawled. But I ain't got the savvy that Trent has. First, let me say this here. I ain't been here all my life. I was a sharpshooter with the Confederate Army. And later I rid with Jeb Stewart. Well, we was only whipped once. And that was by a youngster of a Union officer. He whipped our socks off with half as many men. And that officer was Trent here. Trent's eyes turned slowly to Parson, who sat there staring at him, his eyes twinkling. I reckon, Hatfield went on. Trent is some surprised. I ain't said nothing to him about knowing him. Especially when his name wasn't Trent. But I knowed him from the first time I seen him. Well, that's good enough for me, Runyon said flatly. You say he's got savvy, I'll take your word for it. Trent leaned over the table. All right. All of you mount up and go home. And watch your trail carefully. When you get home, load up and get back. Those of you who can, ride together. Get back here with everything you want to save, but especially with all the grub you got. But get back and quick. He got to his feet. We're going to let Hale make the first move. But we're going to have a Hatfield watch in town. When Hale moves, we're going to move too. We've got twelve men. Twelve? Smithers looked around. I count only eleven. Jackie Moffat's the twelfth, Trent said quietly. I gave him a sharps. He's fourteen. Many of you at fourteen did a man's job, and I'll stake my saddle that jo Jackie Moffat will do his part. He can hit squirrels with that gun, and a man's not so big. He'll do. Like I say, we've got twelve men. Six of them can hold this place, and with the other six, or maybe four, we'll strike back. I don't know how you feel, 
but I feel that no man ever won a war by sitting on his royal American tail, and we're not a-going to. That's good talk, Smithers said quietly. I'm not a warlike man, but I don't want to think of my place being burned out when they go scot-free. I'm for striking back, but we've got to think of food. I've thought of that. Lige and Saul Hatfield are going today after some deer. They know where they are, and neither of them is going to miss any shots. With what food we have, we can buy a few days. And then I'm going after some myself. You? O'Hara stated. Where do you figure on getting this grub? Blazer. He looked down at his hands on the table, and then he looked up. I'm not going to spend three days either. I'm going through the smoky desert. There was dead silence. Runyon leaned forward, starting to speak, and then sat back, shaking his head. But it was Smithers who broke the silence. I'll go with you, he said quietly. But man, Height protested, there ain't no way through that desert. And if there was... The Indians used to go through, Trent said quietly, and I think I know how. If it can be done, I could reach Blazer in a little over a day and start back the same night. He looked over at Jesse Hatfield. You want to watch Cedar Bluff? I reckon you know how to end in. Don't take any chances, but keep an eye on them. You take that chestnut of mine. He's a racer. You take that horse, and when they move, you take the back trails for here. Jesse Hatfield got up and slipped from the room. Then Trent said, All right, start rolling. Get back here when you can. He walked outside and saddled the buckskin. Jackie sauntered up, the sharps in the hollow of his arm. Jackie, Trent said, you get up there in the eye and you keep a lookout on the cedar trail. Mounting, he rode out of the hollow at a lope and swung into the trail headed towards his own cabin. He knew what they were facing, but already in his mind the plan of campaign was taking shape. If they sat still, sooner or later they must be wiped out. And sooner or later his own men would lose heart. They must strike back. Hill must be made to learn that he could not win all the time, and that he must lose too. All was green and quiet around the little cabin, and he rode up swinging down. He stepped through and hurriedly put his grub into sacks and hung it on a pack horse. Then he hesitated. Slowly, he walked across to the peg on the cupboard. For a long minute, he looked at the guns hanging there. And then he reached up and took them down. He buckled them on, heavy-hearted, feeling lost and empty. It was sundown when he hazed his little band of carefully selected horses through the notch of the Hatfield Hollow. With Jackie's help, he put them in the corral. All the men were back and the women were working around, laughing and pleasant. They were true women of the West. Most of them had been through Indian fights before this. Height was the last one in. He came riding through the notch on a spent horse. His face was drawn and hard. They burned me out, he said hoarsely, sweat streaking his face. They hit me just as I was a-packin' and I didn't get off with nothing. I winged one of them, though. Even as he spoke, Smithers caught Trent's arm. Look, he urged, and pointed. The sky could see a red glow reflected from fire. O'Hara's place, he said. Maybe they got him, too. No, O'Hara walked up scowling. They didn't get me. I got here twenty minutes ago. They'll pay for this, the wolves. Jesse Hatfield on Chestnut suddenly materialized in the gloom. Two bunches riding, he said. They aim to get here about sunup. I heard him talking. Trent nodded. Get some sleep, Jesse. You too, Jackie. Parson, you and Smithers better keep watch. Quince, I want you and Bartram with me. Where are you all going? Saul demanded. Why, Saul? Trent smiled in the darkness. I reckon we're going to town after groceries. We're going to call on Leathers. And we'll just load up while we're there. If he ain't willing... We may have to take him along anyway. Count me in, Saul said. I sure want to be in on that. You better rest, Trent suggested. You got three antelope today, you and Lige. I reckon we ain't so wearied that I'd miss that ride, Captain. 
If you all say I can go, well, we can use you. Suddenly, there was a burst of flame to the south. There goes my place, Smithers exclaimed bitterly. I spent two years building that place. Had some onions coming up, too, and a good crop of potatoes in. Trent had started away, but he stopped and turned. Smithers, he said quietly, you'll dig those potatoes yourself. I promise you. If I have to wipe out Hales personally so you can do it. Smithers stared after him as he walked away. You know, he remarked thoughtfully to the big Irishman, I believe you'd do it. O'Hara, maybe we can win this fight after all. End of chapter 6 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour In the Public Domain Chapter 7 Cedar Bluff lay dark and still when the four horsemen rode slowly down the path behind the town. Trent, peering through the darkness, studied the town carefully. Taking the trail might have been an undue precaution, but there was small chance the road would be watched. There had been, of course, the possibility that some late cowpuncher might have spotted them on the trail. It was after three. The Crystal Palace and the Mecca had closed their doors over an hour earlier. Trent reined in on the edge of town and studied the situation. King Bill, secure in his power, even after the beating that he'd taken, would never expect the Nestors to approach the town. He'd be expecting them to try the overland route to Blazer for supplies. And in his monumental conceit, he would never dream that they would come right to the heart of his domain. Bartram, Trent whispered, you take Saul and the pack horses behind the store. Keep them quiet. Don't try to get in or do anything, just hold them there. He turned to the older Hatfield. Quince, we're going to go get leathers. Why not just bust in, Saul protested. Why bother with him? We can find all we need. No, Trent said flatly. He's going to wait on us, and we're going to pay him. We ain't thieves. We're going to stick to the legal way. We may hold him up and bring him down there, but we're going to pay him. Cash on the barrel head for everything we take. Leaving their horses with the others behind the store, Trent took Quince and soft-footed it toward the storekeeper's home, about a hundred yards from the store. Walking along the dark street, Trent looked around him from time to time to see Quince. That long, lean Hatfield, six foot three in his socks, could move like an Indian. Unless Trent had looked, he would never have dreamed that there was another man so close. Trent stopped by the garden gate. There was a faint scent of lilacs in the air and some other flowers. Gently, he pushed open the gate. It creaked on rusty hinges, and for an instant they froze. All remained dark and still, so Trent moved on. And Quince deftly took the gate from him and eased it slowly shut. The air was heavy with lilac now and the smell of damp grass. Trent stopped at the edge of the shadow and moved to Quince to stand by. Ever so gently, he lifted one foot and put it down on the first step, lifting himself with the muscles of his leg. He put down the other foot. Carefully, inch by inch, he worked his way across the porch to the house. Two people slept inside, Leathers and his wife. His wife was a fat, comfortable woman, one of those in the town who idolized King Bill Hale, and held him up as an example of all the West should be and all that a man should be. King Bill's swagger and grandoise manner always impressed her, and she was convinced that he was a great man. Once, shortly after he'd first come to Cedar Bluff, Trent had been in this house. He'd come to get leathers to buy supplies after the store had been closed. He remembered vaguely the layout of the rooms. The door he was now opening gently gave access to the kitchen. From it, there were two doors, one to a living room, rarely used, and one to a bedroom. In that bedroom, Leathers would be sleeping with his wife. Once inside the kitchen, he stood very still. He could hear the breathing of two people in the next room, the slow, heavy breathing of Elsa Leathers, and the more jerky, erratic breathing of the storekeeper. 
The kitchen smelled faintly of onions and homemade soap. Drawing a large handkerchief from his pocket, he tied it across his face under his eyes. He slid his six-gun into his hand and tiptoed through the door into the bedroom. For a moment, Elsa Leather's breathing caught, hesitated, and then went on. He heaved a sigh of relief. If she awakened, he was almost certain that she would start screaming. Alongside the bed, he stooped and put the cold muzzle of his gun under the storekeeper's nose. Almost instantly, the man's eyes opened. Even in the darkness of the room, Trent could see them slowly turn upward toward him. He leaned down, almost breathing the words, Get up quietly. Very carefully, Leathers eased out of bed. Trent gestured for him to put on his pants. As the man drew them on, Trent watched him like a hawk. Then Trent gestured toward the door, and Leathers tiptoed outside. What's the matter, he whispered, his voice shaken. What do you want me for? Just a little matter of some groceries, Trent replied. You open your store and give us what we want, and you won't have any trouble. Make one squawk, and I'll bend this gun over your noggin. I ain't saying anything, Leathers protested. He buckled his belt and hurried out toward the store, with Trent at his heels. Quince Hatfield sauntered along behind, stopping only to pluck blue cornflower, and stick it in the empty buttonhole of a shirt. Leathers fumbled for the lock on the door. If my wife wakes up and finds me gone, mister, he said grumpily, I ain't responsible for what happens. Don't you worry about that, Trent assured him dryly. You just fill this order and don't make us any trouble. He motioned us all who came forward. As soon as you get four horses loaded... You let Bartram take him back up the trail and hold him there. Then if anything happens, he can take off with that much grub. As fast as Leathers piled the groceries, Saul and Quince hurried them to carry them out to the horses. Trent stood by, gun in hand. You ain't going to get away with this, Leathers stated finally. When Hale finds out, he's going to make somebody sweat. Yep, Trent said quietly. Maybe he will. From all that I hear... You better wait until he gets over one beaten before he starts hunting another. And while we're talking, you better make up your mind, too. When this war is over, if Hale doesn't win, what do you suppose happens to you? Huh? Leather straightened his face a shade whiter. What do you mean? I mean, brother, Trent said harshly, that you've taken sides in this fuss. And if Hale loses, you're going to get out of town and fast. He ain't gonna lose, Leathers brought out the sack of flour and put it down on the floor. Hale's got the money and he's got the men. Look what happened to Smithers' place today, and O'Hara's, and look what happened to... To Dick Moffat? Trent's voice was cold. That was murder. Quint stepped up to the door. Somebody's coming, he hissed. Watch it. Let them come in, Trent said softly, but no shooting unless they shoot first. Trent th thrust his gun against Leathers. If they come in, he whispered, you talk right, see? Answer the questions, but answer them like I tell you. Because if there's going to be any shooting, Elsa Leathers is going to be a widow and quick. Two men walked up to the door. One tried the knob. And then, as the door opened, he thrust his head in. Who's there? he demanded. It's me, Leathers said, as Trent prodded him with the gun barrel. Fixing up an order that has to get out early. Two men pushed on inside. I never you knew you'd work this late afore. Why, man, it must be nearly four o'clock. Right. Quincy stepped up with a gun. You hombres invited yourself to this party. Now pick up them sacks and cart them outside. Huh? Two men stared stupidly. Why, get moving, Quint snapped. Get them sacks out there before I bend this over your head. The man hesitated and then obeyed, and the other followed a moment later. It was growing gray in the east when the orders were completed. Quickly, they tied up the two men while Leathers stood by. Then, at a motion from Trent, Saul grabbed Leathers, and he was bound and gagged. Carrying him very carefully, Trent took him back to his cottage and placed him in bed, drawing the blankets over him. Elsa Leathers sighed heavily and then turned in her sleep. 
Trent stood very still, waiting. Then her breathing became even once more, and he tiptoed from the house. Quince was standing in the shadow of the store, holding both horses. They've started up the trail, he said. Then he grinned. Gosh almighty, I bet old leather's some sore. There'll be a chase, most likely, Trent said. We'd better hang back a little, just in case. Bartram was ahead, keeping his horses at a stiff trot. He was a tough, wiry young farmer and a woodsman who'd spent three years conveying wagon trails over the overland trail before he came south. That's how he knew how to handle a pack train, and he showed it now. Swinging the line of the pack horses from the trail, he led them into the shallow water of Cedar Branch, and then walked them very rapidly through the water. Twice he stopped to give them a breather, but he kept moving at a good pace, Saul riding behind with his string long Kentucky rifle across his saddle. You pay leathers? Quince asked, riding close. Yep. I stuck it down between him and his wife after I put him in bed. He'll be some surprise. <laughs> Using every trick they knew to camouflage their trail, they worked steadily back up the hills. They were still five miles or more from the Hatfield place when they heard shots in the distance. Quince reined in, his features sharpened. Looks like they've done attacked the place, he said. What do you think, Trent? Should we leave this to Saul and ride up there? Trent hesitated and then shook his head. No, they can hold him for a while. We want to make sure this food is safe. Suddenly he reined in. Somebody's coming up our back trail. Go ahead, Saul, but don't run into the attacking party. Saul grinned grimly, and Trent, taking a quick look around, indicated a bunch of boulders above the trail. They rode up and swung down, and Quince gave an exclamation of satisfaction as he noted the deep arrow behind the boulders. A good place for their horses and a good place for a getaway, if need be. The horsemen were coming fast now. Lying behind the boulders, they could see the dust riding above them as they wound their way through the cedars and the huge rocks that bordered the narrow trail. Only yards away, they broke into the open. Dust em, Trent said and fired. Their two rifles went off with the same sound, and two puffs of dust went up in front of the nearest horse. The horse reared sharply and spun halfway around. Trent lowered his rifle to note the effect of their shots, and then aimed high at the second horseman and saw his sombrero lift from his head and sail off into the brush. The two men wheeled and whipped their horses back into the brush. Quince chuckled and bit off a chew. That'll make him think a mite. Say... He nodded toward a nest of boulders on the other side. What do you bet one of them rannies ain't a shinnying up into that nest of rocks about now? There was a notch in the rocks and a boulder beyond, not four feet beyond the rock, by the look of it. Quince Hatfield lifted his Kentucky rifle, took careful aim, and then fired. There was a startled yell and then curses. Quince chuckled a little bit. Dusted him with granite off that boulder, he said. They won't hurry to get up there again. Trent thought swiftly. If he took the arrow and circled back, he could then get higher up on the mountain. With careful fire, he could still cover the open spot, and so give Quince a chance to retreat while he held them. Swiftly, he told Hatfield. The big mountaineer nodded. Go ahead. They won't move none till you get there. It took Trent ten minutes to work his way out of the arrow and up the mountain. As distance went, it wasn't so far not being more than 400 yards away. He signaled his presence to Quince Hatfield by letting go with three shots into the shelter taken by their pursuers. From above, that shelter was scarcely more than concealment, and not at all cover. In a few minutes, Quince joined them. They each let go with two shots, and then mounting, rode swiftly away, out of view of the men in the brush below. They'll be slow about showing themselves, I reckon, Quint said. So we'll be nigh to home before they get nerve enough to move. When they'd ridden four miles, Quint's reined in sharply. Horses, he advised. Maybe they're ours. Approaching cautiously, they saw Bartram with eight pack horses. He was sitting with his rifle in his hands, watching the brush ahead. He glanced around at their approach, and then gave a wave of the hand, motioning them on. 
firing up ahead. Saul's gone up. He'll be back pretty soon. Low voice, Trent told him what had happened. And as they talked, they saw Saul Hatfield coming through the brush on foot. He walked up to them and caught his horse by the bridle. They got him stopped outside the cup, he said. I think only one man of theirs is down. He's lying on his face in the open not far from them boulders where O'Hara is. There must be about a dozen of them, no more. Is there any way into the cup with these horses, Trent asked. Saul nodded. Yeah, I reckon if they was busy over yonder for a few minutes, we could run them all in. We'll make them busy, eh, Quince? Trent suggested. Bart, you and Saul whip them in there as fast as you can as soon as we open up. He'd reloaded his rifle, and the two turned their horses and started skirting the rocks to outflank the attackers. Trent could see what had happened. The Hatfield place lay in a cup-like depression, surrounded on three sides by high rocky walls, and on the other by scattered boulders. Through the cliffs, there were two ways of getting into the cup. One of these, now about to be attempted, lay partly across an open space before the cut was entered. The attackers were mostly among the scattered boulders, but had been stopped and pinned down by O'Hara and someone else. Two men there could hold that ground against thirty. Obviously, some of the others were up in the cliffs above the cup, waiting for any attack. Approaching as they were, Trent and Quince were coming down from the south, toward the west end of the cup, where the scattered boulders lay. By working up close there, they could find and dislodge the attackers, or at least keep them so busy that the pack animals could get across the open to the cup. About three acres of land lay in the bottom of the cup. There was a fine cold spring, the barn, the horse corrals, and adequate protection. The cliffs were ringed with scattered cedar and rocks, so men there could protect the approach to the boulder. However, if a rifleman got into those rocks on the edge of the cup, he could render the movement in the cup impossible until they could be driven out. It was the weak spot of the stronghold. When they had ridden several hundred yards, the two men reined in and dismounted. Slipping through the cedars, Indian fashion, they soon came to the edge of the woods overlooking the valley of boulders. Not fifty yards away, two men lay behind boulders facing toward the Hatfield Cup. Trent lifted his Winchester and let go with three fast shots. One, aimed at the nearest man's feet, clipped a heel from his boot, and the others threw dust in his face. With a yell, the fellow scrambled out of there. Trent followed him with two more shots. The man tumbled into the gully and started to run. The other man started to get up, and Quince Hatfield made him leap like a wild man with a well-placed shot that burned the inside of his leg. Scattering their shots, the two had the rest of the attackers scattering for better cover. <laughs> End of chapter 7 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour in the public domain. Chapter 8 Parson Hatfield walked out to meet them as they rode in. He grinned through his yellowed handlebar mustache. I reckon we win the first round, he chuckled. Sure was a sight to see them punchers dusting out of here when you opened up on them. Who was the man we saw down? Trent asked. Gun hand they called Indian Joe, a killer. He wouldn't stop coming, so O'Hara let him have it, dead center. They walked back to the cabin. We got grub to keep us for a few days, but we got a passel of folks here, Parson said, squatting on his haunches. And I don't reckon you're going to be able to hit Cedar Bluff again. Trent nodded in agreement. We've got to get to Blazer, he said. There isn't any two ways about it. I wish I knew what they'd do now, if we had a couple of days leeway. You know anything about the celebration Hale's figuring on down to Cedar Bluff? There's been talk about it. He's been there ten years, and he figures that's a reason to celebrate. What's happening? Trent asked. Horse races, horseshoe pitching, wrestling, foot races, and a prize fight. King Bill's bringing in a prize fighter, big feller. They call him Tom Bull Turner. Trent whistled. Say, he is good, big too. 
Fought over in Abilene when I was there. A regular bruiser. That may keep him busy, Quint said. He got a big chunk of corn pone in his hand. Maybe we'll get some time to get some grub. Trent got up. Me? I'm going to sleep, he said. I'm fairly dead on my feet. You better too, he added to Quince Hatfield. It was growing dusk when Trent awakened. He rubbed his hand over his face and got to his feet. He had been dead tired, and no sooner had he laid down on the grass under the trees than he'd fallen fast asleep. Walking over to the spring, he drew a bucket of water and plunged his head into it. Then he dried himself off on a rough towel that Sandy handed him. Two more men came in, she told him. Taunt Wilson from down in the breaks of the Box Canyon, and Jody Miller, a neighbor of his. Saul looked up as he walked into the house. Wilson and Miller were both burned out. They done killed Wilson's partner. Shot him down when he went out to rope him a horse. Hi, Miller looked up at Trent. I seen you afore. Could be. Trent looked away. This was it. He could tell by the way Miller looked at him and said, I'd have known you, even if it wasn't for that hombre down to the Mecca. What hombre? Trent demanded. Big feller, bigger than you. He come in there about sundown yesterday, asking for a man fit in your description. He wants you pretty bad. Flat face, deep scar over one eye. That's him. He looks like he's been in a lot of fights, bad ones. He was in one, Trent said dryly. One was enough. Kane Brockman. Even before he'd heard from Lee Hall, he'd known that this would come sooner or later. All that, it was almost two years behind him, but Kane wasn't a man to forget. He'd been one of the hard-riding, fast-shooting duo, the Brockman twins. In a fight at Cottonwood down in the Live Oak country, Trent, then known by his real name, had killed Abel. Later, in a hand-to-hand fight, he'd beaten Kane Brockman into a staggering, punch-drunk hulk. And now Brockman was here. As if it weren't enough to have a fight with King Bill Hale on his hands. Parson Hatfield was staring at Trent. Then he glanced at Miller. You say you know this feller, he gestured at Trent. I'd like to myself. The name, Trent said slowly, is Lance Kilkenny. Kilkenny? Bartram dropped dropped his plate. You're Kilkenny? Uh Uh-huh. He turned and walked outside and stood there with his hands on his hips, staring out toward the scattered boulders at the entrance to the Hatfield Cup. He was Kilkenny. The name had come back again. He dropped his hands and almost by magic the big guns leapt into them and he stood there staring at them. Slowly, thoughtfully, he replaced them. Kane Brockman was here. The thought made him suddenly weary. It meant that sooner or later he must shoot it out with Kane. In his reluctance to fight the big man, there was something more than just his hatred of killing. He'd whipped Kane Brockman with his hands. He'd killed Abel. It should be enough. If there was to be any killing... His thoughts skipped to Dunn and Rabbits, and he found himself looking again into the blazing white eyes of a trim young man in buckskin, Cub Hale. He shook his head to clear it and walked toward the spring. What would King Bill do next? He'd whipped Hale. Knowing what he had done to the big man, he knew that he would still be under cover. Also, Hale's pride would be hurt badly by his beating. It was not only that he'd taken a licking, he'd burned out a few helpless nesters, only to have those nesters band together and fight off his raiding party. And in the meantime, they'd ridden into his own town and taken a load of supplies. Supplies that he had refused them. The power of any man is largely built on belief of others in that power. To maintain leadership, he must win victories. And King Bill had been whipped and his plans had been thwarted. The answer to that seemed plain. King Bill must do something to retrieve his losses. But what would he do? Despite the victories that the Nesters had won, King Bill was still in the driver's seat. He knew how many men they had. He knew about what supplies they'd taken from the store. 
He knew the number they had at the Hatfields could not survive for long without more food. Hale could, if he wished, withdraw all of his men and just sit tight across the trail to Blazer, and wait until the nesters had to move or starve. He might do that, or he might strike again, and in greater force. Kilkenny, it seemed strange to be thinking of himself as Kilkenny again, he'd been Trent for so long, ruled out the quick strike. By now, Hale would know that the Hatfields were strongly entrenched. The main trail to Blazer led through Cedar Bluff. There was a trail, only occasionally used from the Hatfields to the Blazer Mountain Trail, but Hale knew that, and he would be covering it. There was a chance that they might slip through, yet even as he thought of that, he found himself thinking again of that vast crater that was the Smoky Desert. That was still a possibility. O'Hara walked out where he was standing under the trees. Runyon and Wilson want to try the mountain trail to Blazer, he told him. What do you think? I don't think much of it, Kilkenny said truthfully. Yet we've got to have grub. Parson told him what you said about the smoky desert. Wilson says it can't be done. He said he done tried it. Jackson Height, Miller, and Wilson walked out. We're all for trying the mountain trail, Wilson said. I don't believe Hale will have it watched this far up. What do you say, Kilkenny? Kilkenny looked at his boot toe thoughtfully. They all wanted to go, and they might get through. After all, the smoky desert seemed like an impossible dream. Even more so to them than to him. It's up to you, he said finally. I won't send a man over that trail. But if you want to try it, go ahead. It was almost midnight when the wagon pulled out of the cup. Miller was driving, with Wilson, Jackson Height, and Lige Hatfield riding escort. Kilkenny was up to watch them go, and when the sound of the wagon died away, he returned to his pallet and turned in. Twice during the night he awakened with a start, to lie there listening in the stillness, his body tense, his mind fraught with worry. But despite his expectations... There were no sounds of shots, nothing at all. When daybreak came, he ate a hurried breakfast and swung into the saddle. He left the cup on a lope and followed the dim trail of the wagon. He followed it past the charred ruins of his own cabin, and past those of Moffat's cabin. Yet as he neared the blazer trail, he slowed down, walking the buckskin and stopping frequently to listen. He could see by the tracks that Lige and Height had been riding ahead, scouting the way. Sometimes they were as much as half a mile ahead, and he found several places where they'd sat on their horses waiting. Suddenly the hills seemed to fall away and he saw the dim trail that led to Blazer, more than forty miles away. Such a short distance, yet the trail was so bad that fifteen miles a day was considered good. There were no signs of the wagon or the men. There were no visible tracks. That in itself was a good thing. It meant that someone, probably Lige, was remembering that they must leave no trail. He turned the buckskin then and rode back over the trail. He took his time, and it was the middle of the afternoon before he reached the ledge where he could look down into the awful haze that hung over the smoky desert. Once in his first trip over this route, it had been clearer below, and he thought he saw a ruined wagon far below. Kilkenny found the place where he stood that other day, for long since he'd marked the spot with a cairn of stones. Then slowly, with great pains, he began to seek. Time and again he was turned back by sheer drops of hundreds of feet, and nowhere could he find even a suggestion of a trail. Four hours later, with long fingers of darkness reaching out from the tall pines, he mounted the buckskin and started down toward the cup. Jackson Height could be correct. Possibly he was mistaken and the Indians were wrong. There was no trail down to the valley below and across that wasteland. In his long search, he'd found nothing. Parson met him as he rode through the notch. Ma Hatfield had come to the door and was shading her eyes toward him. They got through to the trail, Kilkenny said. Maybe they'll make it. 
Sally was working over the fireplace when he walked inside. Young Bartram was sitting close by, watching her. Kilkenny glanced at them and smiled grimly. Sally caught his eye and flushed painfully. So he walked outside again and sat down against the house. Quince had gone after deer in the high meadows, and Saul was on guard. Runyon was sleeping on the grass under the trees, and Jesse Hatfield was up on the cliff somewhere. Kilkenny sat for a long time against the house. Then he took his blankets over to the grass, rolled up, and went to sleep. Shortly after daybreak, he roped a black horse from his string, saddled up, and with a couple of sandwiches, he headed back toward the smoky desert. There must be a route. There had to be one. When he reached the rim of the cliff again, he dismounted and studied the terrain thoughtfully. He stood on a wide ledge that thrust itself out into space. The desert below was partially obscured, as always, by clouds of dust or smoke, yet the rim itself was visible for some distance. Actually studying the rim, he could see that it bore less resemblance to a crater than he'd previously imagined, than to just a great sink. In fact, it looked as though some internal upheaval had caused the earth to subside at this point, breaking off the rock of the ledge and sinking the plateau several hundred feet. For the most part, the cliffs below the lip the rim were jagged and almost sheer. Yet at places, the rim had caved away into steep rock slides that led, or seemed to lead, to the bottom. This great rift in the plateau led for miles, causing the trail to Blazer to swing in a wide semicircle to get around it. Actually, as best as he could figure, Blazer was almost straight across from the ledge where he now stood. Again, he began to work with painstaking care along the rim. Indians had said it could be crossed, and that there was a way down. And Lance Kilkenny had lived in the West long enough to know that the Indians were usually right. It was almost noon before he found the path. It was scarcely three feet wide. So he left his horse standing under the cedars and started walking. The path dipped through some gigantic slabs of ragged rugged edged rock and then ran to the very edge of the cliff itself when it seemed that he was about to step right off into space the path turned sharply to the right and ran along the face of the cliff he hesitated taking off his hat and mopping his brow the path led right along the face of the cliff and at times it seemed almost broken away but then it continued on one thing he knew this was useless for his purpose, for no man could take a horse, not even such a sure-footed mountain horse as the buckskin along this path, and yet he walked on. The end was abrupt. He started to work his way around a thread of a path that clung to the precipice, but when he could see around the corner, he saw that the trail had ended. An hour of walking had brought him to a dead end. Clinging to the rock, he looked slowly around, and then his eyes riveted. For there, over 300 feet below, on what even at this distance was obviously a trail, he could see a wagon wheel. Leaning out with a precarious handhold on a root, he could distinguish the half-buried wagon from which the wheel had broken. Of the rest of the trail, he could see nothing. It vanished from sight under the bulge of a cliff. He drew back, sweating. The trail was there. The wagon was there. Obviously someone at some time had taken a wagon, or wagons, over that trail. But where was the beginning? Had the shelf upon which it ran broken off and ruined the trail for use? Taking the point of a grey rock for a landmark, he retraced his steps along the path. By the time he reached the buckskin again, his feet hurt from walking over the rough rock in his riding boots. And he was tired, dead tired. He'd walked about six miles, and that was an impossible distance to a horseman. End of chapter eight. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis Lemur, in the public domain. Chapter nine. 
When he rode into the cup that night, Parson looked up from the rifle that he was cleaning. Howdy, son. You look done up. Kilkenny nodded and stopped beside the older man. He was tired, and his shirt stuck to his back with sweat. For the first time, he wondered if they would win. For the first time, he doubted. Without food, they were helpless. They could neither escape nor resist. He doubted now if Hale would ever let them go, if he would ever give them any chance to escape. They ate short rations that night. He knew there was still a good deal of food, yet fourteen men, if he included those who were gone, and six women had to eat there. And then there were nine children. Yet there was no word of complaint. And only on the faces of those women who had men with the food wagon could he distinguish the thin gray lines of worry. Any sign from Hale? he asked O'Hara. The Irishman shook his head. Not any. He's got men out in the rocks. They ain't trying to shoot nobody. Just a-watchin', but they're there. I don't think he'll try anything now until after the celebration, Bartram said. He's planning on making a lot of friends with that celebration. It means a lot to him, anyway. Jesse Hatfield pushed back his torn felt hat. I took me a ride today, he said. Dunn slipped out through the brush. I got clean to Cedar Bluff without being seen. I edged up close to town, and I could see a lot of working around. They got him a ring set up out in front of the livery stable, near the horse corral. Ropes and everything. Lots of talk around, and big wonder who's going to fight Tom Bull Turner. Kilkenny listened absently, not caring. His thoughts were back on that ragged rim, working along each notch and crevice, wondering where that road reached the top of the plateau. This here Dan Cooper was there, and he done some talking. He looked powerful wise, and he said Turner ain't been brought here by accident. He's been brought here to whip one man. Kilkenny. Did he say Kilkenny? Kilkenny tur- turned around to ask. Do they know who I am? He said Trent, Jesse drawled. I don't reckon they know. Tom Bull Turner to beat him. Kilkenny remembered the bullet head, the knotted cauliflower ears, the flat nose and hard battered face of the big bare knuckle fighter. Tom Bull was a fighter, but he was more. He was a brute. He was an American who'd fought much in England, and against the best on both continents. He'd even met Joe Goss and Paddy Ryan, while he, Kilkenny, was no prize fighter. An idle rumor, and could be no more, for he was not in Cedar Bluff, nor was he likely to be. Studying the faces of the men around him, he could see what was on their minds. Despite their avoidance of the subject, he knew that they were all thinking of the wagon on the road to Blazer. The food was necessary, but four men were out there. Four men they all knew. Men who'd shared their work, their trials, and even the long trip west from their lands in Kentucky, Pennsylvania, and Missouri. Lige Hatfield was gone, and knowing the family, Kilkenny knew that if he were killed, no Hatfield would stop until all Hales were dead or the Hatfields were wiped out. Knowing the route, he could picture the wagon rolling slowly over the rocky road, horsemen to the front and rear, watching, hoping, fearing. They too, if still alive and free, would have their worries. They would know that back here, men and women were getting close to the end of their food supply and that those men and women were depending on them. On the morning of the third day, Kilkenny mar- mounted again and started for the rim. He saw Parson Hatfield staring after him, but the old man said nothing. This time Kilkenny had a plan. He was going back to where he'd been the day before, and by some means he was going down the face of the cliff and to that wagon. Then he would backtrack. If there was no trail back, he would have to come up the cliff. Well, that was a bridge to be crossed later. Somewhere in that jumble of broken cliffs, great slabs of jagged rock, 
In towering shoulders of stone, there must be a trail down which that wagon had gone. It was almost seven o'clock in the morning before he found himself, with two ropes in his hands at the tapering edge of the trail along the face of the cliff. Lying flat, he peered over the edge. The rock on which he lay was a bulge that thrust out over the face of the cliff. If he dropped over here, he must use the rope purely as a safety precaution and work down with his hands. There were cracks and knobs that could be used. The depth below was sickening, but partially obscured by the strange thickness of the air. A gnarled cedar grew from the face of the rock, and he tested it for strength. The thing seemed as immovable as the rocks themselves. Making his first rope fast to the cedar, Kilkenny knotted the other end in a bowline around himself. Then he turned himself around and backed over the edge, feeling with his feet for a toehold. For a time, he knew, he would be almost upside down like a fly on a ceiling unless he could find handholds where he could get a good grip, and if necessary, hang by them, there was small chance of making it. But there were, he'd noticed, a number of roots, probably rock cedar thrusting out through the rock below. Forcing himself to think of nothing but the task at hand, he lowered himself over the edge, and when he got the merest toehold, he swung one hand down, and felt around until he could grasp one of the roots. Then he let go with his left hand, and let himself down until he was half upside down, clinging by a precarious toehold, and his grip on the root. Finding another hold for his left hand, he took a firm grasp, then pulled his left toe and felt downward. He found a crack, tested it with his toe, and then set the foot solidly. Carefully, he released a handhold and lowered his hand to another root, lower down. Then, sweating profusely, he lowered his weight to the lower foot. He resolutely kept his thoughts away from the awful depths below. He had a chance, but a very slim one. Slowly and with great care, he shifted himself down the bulging overhang. Every time he moved a hand or a foot, his life seemed about to end. He was, he knew, ringing with perspiration. His breath was coming painfully, and he swung himself precariously toward the sheer cliff below. Even that great height of straight up and down the cliff seemed a haven to this bulge of the overhang. Clinging to a huge root and pressing himself as tightly to the face as he could, he turned his head right and then left, searching the face in the bulge. There were handholds enough here. The roots and the cedars that had grown on the ledge above thrust through the bulge. Yet that very fact seemed to indicate that at some time in the past huge chunks of rock had given way, leaving these roots exposed. And if it had happened once, it could happen again. Far out in the blue sky, a buzzard whirled in great slow circles. His fingers ached with gripping, and he lowered himself away from the face of the cliff and looked down between his legs. A knot showed in the rock, and he worked his toe loose and then lowered it with care until he could test the notch. He tried it. Solid. Slowly, carefully, he began to set a weight on the ball of his foot. There was a sudden sag beneath his foot and then a rattle of stones, and the notch gave way under him forcing him to grip hard with his hands to catch the additional weight. His right foot hung free. Carefully, he began to feel with his toe for another foothold. He found it, tried and rested his weight again, and the stone took it. Slowly, he shifted his hands again and then lowered himself down a little more. Glancing down again, he saw himself looking at a stretch of rock at least 15 feet across, that was absolutely smooth. No single crack or crevice showed, no projection of stone, no root. His muscles were desperate with weariness, and he stared unbelieving, to come this far and then to fail. Forcing himself to think, he studied the face of the cliff. 
There was, some twenty feet below, and almost that far to the left, a gnarled and twisted rock cedar growing out of the mountainside. It was too far to the right, there was no way of reaching it. Yet, as he stared, he could see a crevice, deep enough for a good foothold, ran off from an angle, from that cedar. If he could reach it, but how? There was a way. It hit him almost at once. If he released his grip on the roots, he would instantly swing free. He'd worked himself far to the right of the cedar, to which his lariat was tied. His release would swing him far out from the cliff. And then as he swung back, for an instant he'd be above that clump of cedar. On each succeeding swing, he would fall shorter and shorter, until finally he was suspended mid-air, hanging like a great pendulum from the cedar above. And then all his efforts would be in vain, for he'd have to catch the rope over his head and go up to it, hand over hand to that cedar above, and he would have failed. On the other hand, if he could release himself above that cedar, he would fall into it, and unless some sharp branches injured him, the chances were that the limbs would cushion his fall. He had his knife, and it was razor sharp. Even as these thoughts flitted through his mind, he was drawing the knife. Luckily, before leaving his horse, he'd tied a rawhide thong over each six-shooter, so his guns were secure. Yet the rope was rawhide and tough. Could he slash through it at one blow? The answer to that was simple. He had to. If he swung out over that void below, on half or less than half of the strength of that lariat, there was a small chance that he would not break it at the extreme end of the swing, and then he'd go shooting out over the deadly waste of the smoky desert to fall and fall and fall over and over into that murky cloud that obscured the depths. He let go and shoved hard with both feet and his hands. His body swept out in a long swing over the breathtaking depths below, Then, hesitating but an instant as the rope tore at his sides, he swept back like a giant pendulum, rushing through the air toward the cliff. It shot toward him, and he raised his arm. Seeing the cedar below and ahead, he cut down with a mighty slash. He felt himself come loose, and then he was hurled toward that cedar. He hit it, all doubled into a ball. He heard a splintering crash and slipped through felt the branches tearing at his clothes like angry fingers. Then he was brought up with a jolt and lay trembling in every limb, clinging to the cedar. How long he lay there he did not know. Finally he pulled himself together and crawled out of the tree and got to his feet on the narrow foothold. He worked his way along the ledge until it grew wide enough for him to walk. His breath was coming and more regular now. He felt gingerly of his arms and body where the rawhide rope had burned him. The path, if such it might be called, slanted steeply away from him, ending in some broken slabs. He stopped when he reached them. He was at last on the smoky desert. End of chapter 9 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour, in the public domain. Chapter 10 Lance Kilkenny stood on a dusty floor, littered with jagged slabs of rock, obviously fallen from the cliff above. There was no grass here, no cedar, nothing growing at all, not even a cactus. Above him, the dark basalt cliff lifted toward the sky, towering and ugly. Looking off over the desert, he could see only a few hundred yards, and then all became indistinct. The reason was obvious enough. The floor of the desert was dust, fine as flour, and even the slightest breeze lifted it into the air, where it hung for hours on end. A strong wind would fill the air so full of these particles as to make the air thick as a cloud, and the particles were largely silicate. One thing he knew now, crossing the smoky desert, even if there was a trail, would be a frightful job. 
Unfastening the thongs that held his guns into place, he walked on slowly. It was still, only a little murmur from the wind among the rocks, and nothing else. The cliff lifted on his right, and off to the left stretched the awful expanse of the desert, concealed behind that curtain of dust. He stepped over the dead and bleached bones of an ancient cedar, fallen from above, and rounded a short bend in the cliff. As he walked, little puffs of dust rose from his boot soles and his mouth grew dry. Once he stopped and carefully wiped his guns free of dust, then lowered them once more into the holsters. Then he saw a white scar of the road, tracks of vehicles filled with fine white dust, and the rough, barely visible marks of what had been a fairly good road, dwindling away into the gray, dusty vagueness that was the desert. He looked up and saw the trail winding steeply up the cliff's face through a narrow draw. Turning, he began to climb. Several times he paused to roll boulders from the path. He was already thinking, in terms of a wagon and a team. It could be done. That is, it could be done if there was still a way of getting a team onto this trail. And that might be the catch. What lay at the end? Sweat rolled down his face making thin rivers through the white, fine white dust. White dust clung to the hairs on the back of his hands, and once, when he stopped to remove his sombrero and wipe the sweat from his brow, he saw that his hat was covered in a thin gray coat of it. He looked ahead. He could see the road for no more than a hundred yards, but the cliff to his right was now growing steeper. And glancing down, he could see that the trail was already far above the valley floor. He walked, making heavy work of it in his riding boots, sweat soaking his shirt under the film of gray dust, and the draw was narrowing. The rock under the trail sloped steeply away for a dark, shadowy canyon now over 200 feet down. He walked on, plodding wearily. For over an hour he walked, winding around and around to follow the curving walls of the canyon. And then he halted suddenly. Ahead of him, the trail ended. It ended and explained his difficulties in one instant. A gigantic pine, once perched on the edge of the cliff, had given way, and its roots were evidently weakened by the wind erosion. The tree had blown down and fallen across the trail. Pines had sprung up around it, and round its roots and into the trail until the trail was blocked by a dense thicket that gave no hint of the road that had once run beneath it. Crawling over the pine, Kilkenny emerged from the thicket and walked back to his horse. Mounting, he rode slowly homeward, and as he rode, he thought he'd never been so utterly tired as he was right now. But there was a coolness in the breeze through the pines, and some of their piney fragrance seemed to get into his blood. He looked up, feeling better as he rode along the grassy trail, through the mountain meadows, and down through the column trunks of great old trees toward the Hatfield Cup. Yes, it was worth fighting for. Worth fighting to keep what one had in this lonely land, among the high peaks. It was such a country as a man would want, country where a man could grow and could live, where his sons could grow. Even as he thought of that, Kilkenny found himself remembering Nita. King Bill Hale wanted her. Well, what would be more understandable? Certainly she was beautiful. The most beautiful woman in Cedar Valley, and many other valleys. And what did she think? Hale had everything to offer. Strength, position, wealth. She could reign like a queen at the castle. And Hale himself? He was a handsome man. Cold. But yet, what man ever sees another man as a woman sees him? The side of himself that a man shows to a woman is often much different than that seen by other men. Worry began to move through him like a drug. Nita nearby was one thing. But Nita belonging to someone else, that was another idea entirely. 
and he realized suddenly it was an idea that he didn't like, not even a little bit. Especially, he did not want her to belong to the arrogant King Bill. Hale wanted her, and regardless of what she thought, he could bring pressure to bear. If his own eloquence failed him, he was a king in Cedar Valley. Her supplies came in over the road that he controlled. He could close her business. He could even prevent her from leaving, and he might. Jamie Brigo was the reason why he might not succeed. Brigo, and himself, Kilkenny. King Bill's lack of action disturbed him. Hale had been beaten in a fistfight. Knowing the arrogance of the man, Kilkenny knew that he would never allow that to pass. He'd refused them supplies, and they'd come and taken them from under his nose. Was Hale waiting to starve them? He knew how many there were. He knew the supplies they had were not enough to last long. And he held the trail to Blazer. Did he know of the trail through Smoky Desert? Kilkenny doubted that. Even he did not know if it was passable. And the chances were that Hale had never even dreamed of such a thing. Aside from the Indian, to whom he'd talked, Kilkenny had heard no mention of it, ever. Saul Hatfield walked down the trees as he neared the cup. Anything happen? Kilkenny asked. Saul shook his head, staring curiously at the dust-covered Kilkenny. Nope. Not any. Jesse took him a ride down to town. They sure are getting set for that celebration, expecting a big crowd. They say Hale's invited some folks from Santa Fe. Some big muckety mucks. From Santa Fe? Kilkenny's eyes narrowed. That was a neat bit of politics. Good chance to entertain the officials. And then tell them casually of the outlaws in the mountains. The men who'd come in and tried to take away valuable land from King Bill. Lance knew how persuasive such a man could be. And he could entertain, and would entertain, like royalty. These men would go away impressed. That King Bill didn't intend to strengthen his position very much would be foolhardy to imagine. Hale would know how to play the politics, and how to impress, impress these men with his influence and the power of his wealth. The audience would all be friendly, too. They would give the visiting officials the idea that all was well in Cedar Valley. Then, when the elimination of some outlaw hiding in the mountain was revealed, if it ever was, the officials would imagine it was merely that, and never inquire as to the rightness or wrongness of Hale's actions. In that moment, Kilkenny decided he would go to Cedar Bluff for the celebration. Yet even as the thought occurred to him, he remembered the thick neck and the beetling brow of Tom Bill Turner. For the first time, he began to think of the prize fighter. He'd seen the man fight. He was a mountain of muscle, a man with a body of muscle and iron. His jaw was like a chunk of granite. His flat nose and beetling brow were fearsome. Kilkenny rode down into the cup and swung down from his horse. Parson walked slowly toward him. Jesse and O'Hara were beside him. They stared at the dust on his clothes. Looks like you've been places, son, Parson drawled. I have. Kilkenny removed the saddle and threw it on the rail. I've been down into the smoky desert. The smoky desert? O'Hara stepped forward. You found a way? Uh Uh-huh. It'll take a little work with an axe to clear it. Could a wagon get across? Kilkenny shrugged, looking up at the big Irishman. Your guess is as good as mine. I know I can get a wagon into the desert, and I know there used to be a trail. I could see it. There's parts of a wagon down there, so somebody's been across. Where somebody else went, we'll go. How about getting out? Parson drawled. That, Kilkenny admitted, is the point. You put your finger right on the sore spot. Maybe there's a way and maybe there isn't. There was once. But I'm going to have to go over, and with luck I'll get back. We'll have to take water. We'll have to tie claws over our faces and the nostrils of our horses. Otherwise, that dust will fix us for good. When are you going? Jesse demanded. Right soon. We've got to make a try. If we could make it soon enough, we might bring the others back that way. 
I'll start tomorrow. It'll leave us short-handed, Parsons suggested. It will, Kilkenny nodded in agreement. He looked at the old mountaineer thoughtfully. The trouble is, Hale has time and we haven't. I'm banking that he won't try anything until after the celebration. I think this is not only his tenth anniversary, but a bit of politics, to get friendly with them down in Santa Fe. He'll wait until he's solid with them before he cleans us out. Maybe. Ain't nobody down to town gonna tell our side of this. Not a soul, Hatfield agreed. There will be. Kilkenny stripped off his shirt and drew a bucket of water from the well. His powerful muscles ran like snakes beneath his tawny skin. I'm going down. They'll kill you, man, O'Hara declared. They'll shoot you like a dog. No, not while those Santa Fe officials are here. I'll go. I hear they want me to fight Tom Bill Turner. Well, I'm gonna down, go down, and I'll fight him. What? Runyon shouted. That man's a killer. He's a ringer. I know, Kilkenny shrugged. I've seen him fight, and maybe I'm a dang fool. But I've got to get down there and see those Santa Fe men. This is my chance. Do you think you can do any good against Hale? Parson asked keenly. He'll be whining and dining them folks from Santa Fe. He won't let you go nowhere close to him. But they'll be at the fight, Kilkenny told him, and I'm counting on that. At daybreak, the labor gang had reached the thicket of pines that were covering the entrance to the road. Axes in hand, they went to work. Other men began bucking the big fallen trees into sections to be snaked out of the way with ox teams. Once, during a pause when he straightened his back from the saw, Quince looked over at Kilkenny. They should be there today, he drawled slowly. I sure hope they make it. Yep, Lance straightened and rubbed his back. It had been a long time since he'd used a crosscut saw. You know Blazer? Uh-huh. Hatfield bit off a chew of tobacco. Man there named Soderman, big and fat, mean as a wolf. He's Hale's man. Got a gunman with him, the name of Rye Picton. I know him, a two-bit rustler from the Pico's country. Fair hand with a six-gun. There's others, too. Ratcliffe and Gaddy's are the worst. We can expect trouble. We? Kilkenny looked at him. You're volunteering for this trip? Sure, Quince grinned at him. I need me a change of air. Getting old setting around. Reckon the bore of that old Kentucky rifle needs a bit of cleaning, too. They worked on until dark, and when they stopped, the road was open. O'Hara, who'd done the work of two men with an axe, stood on the edge of the canyon, and in the dimming light looked across that awful expanse toward the distance. Red ridges were touched now with the light of the vanished sun. It don't look good to me, Kilkenny, he said. It sure don't look good to me. End of chapter 10 A Man Called Trent a Kilkenny novel by Louis Lemour in the public domain. Chapter 11 The wagon was loaded with water. Not heavily, but three good kegs of it. With Bartram on the driver's seat, they started. Kilkenny led the way down the steep trail, Quince behind him. He reined in once and watched the wagon trundle over the first stones and past the ruin of the great tree. And then he continued on. For better or for worse, they were committed now. He led the way slowly, stopping often, for it was slow going for the wagon. He watched it coming and watched the mules. They were good mules. Hale himself had no better. They would need to be good. At the bottom of the road, he swung down, and standing there with Quince Hatfield, he waited listening to the strange, lonely sighing of the mysterious wind that flowed like a slow current through the rusty depths of the sink. Bartram was a hand with the mules, and he brought the wagon up beside them. Kilkenny indicated the mules. Soak those cloths in water and hang one over the nose of each one. We'd better wear a handkerchief over our nose and mouth, too. He was riding the buckskin, 
and he got down and hung a cloth over the horse's nostrils, where it would stop part of the dust, at least, without impeding the breathing. And then they started on. From here on, it was guesswork. He had a compass, and before leaving the cliff top, he'd taken a sight on a distant peak. How closely the trail would hold to that course, he did not know, or if any trail would be visible once they got out on the desert. Walking the buckskin, he led off into the dust. The wind did not howl. It blew gently but steadily, and dust filled the air. Much of it, he knew, was alkali. Behind him, Quince Hatfield rode raw-boned roan, bred for the desert. Fifteen minutes after leaving the cliff, they were out of sight of it. Overhead, the sky was only a lighter space, dimly visible through the hanging curtain of dust. Dust arose in the clouds from their walking horses, and from around the wagon, fine, powdery, stifling dust. Over and around them, the cloud closed in, thick and prickly, when the dust settled on the flesh. Glancing at Quince, during one interval, Kilkenny saw the man's face was covered with a film of dust. His eyelashes were thick with it, and his hair was white. When they'd been going an hour, he reined in and dismounted. Taking a damp cloth, he sponged out the buckskin's nostrils and wiped off the horse's head and ears. Quince had drawn abreast and was doing likewise. When the others came up, they worked over the mules. The dust filled the air and drew a thick veil around them, as a blizzard. Saul drew closer. What if the wind comes up, he asked. Bartram's face was stern. I've been thinking of that. If a wind comes up and all of this, we're sunk. Where are we now? Jackie asked, standing up on the wagon. We should have made about three or four miles, maybe more, maybe less. But we're right on our course so far. They rested the mules. The wagon was heavy, even though it was not carrying a load now. The dust and sand in places were a couple of feet deep. But usually the wheels sank no more than six inches into the dust. The animals would all need rest, for the air was heavy with heat. There was no coolness here in the sink. The dust made breathing an effort. Kilkenny swung into the saddle and moved out. The flatness of the desert floor was broken now. It began to slant away from them toward the middle. Kilkenny scowled thoughtfully and rode more slowly. An hour later, they paused again. This time, there was no talking. All of the men were feeling the frightful pressure of the heat. And glancing at the mules, Kilkenny could see that they were breathing heavily. Streaks marred thick whiteness in the dust of their bodies. We'll have to stop more often, he told Bartram, and the farmer just nodded. They rode on, and almost another hour had passed before the buckskin stopped suddenly. Lance touched him gently with a spur, but Buck would not move. Kilkenny swung down. Ahead of him, and he could see no more than fifty feet, was an even, unbroken expanse of white. It was not even marred by the blackish upthrust of rock that occasionally appeared along the back trail. Quince rode up and stopped. What's wrong? he asked. He swung down and walked up. I don't know, Kilkenny said. Buck won't go on. Something's wrong. He stepped forward and felt the earth suddenly turn to jelly under his feet. He gave a cry and tried to leap backwards, but only tripped himself. Quince helped him up. Quick, Sandy said, and the worst I ever saw. Must be springs underneath. The wagon drew up and then Saul and Jackie. Stay here, Lance told them. I'll scout to the left. I'll go right, Quince suggested. Might be a way around. Kilkenny turned the buckskin and let him have his head. He walked at right angles to the course then. At Kilkenny's urging, tried the surface. He was still soggy. They pulled back and rode on. In half an hour, he reined in. There was still no way around. And the edge of the quicksand seemed to be curving back toward him. Only the Sega City of Buck had kept them out of it. He rode back. Any luck, he shouted, as he saw Quince waiting with the wagon. Uh Uh-huh. It ends back there about two miles. High ground and rocky. They turned the wagon and started on once more. They would lose at least an hour more.
perhaps two skirting the quicksand. Hour after hour they struggled on. Weariness made their limbs leaden. The mules were beginning to weave a bit now, and Kilkenny found himself sagging in the saddle. His sweat-soaked shirt had become something very like cement, with its heavy coating of white dust. They stopped oftener now, stopped for water and to sponge the nostrils of the mules and horses. At times the trail led through acres upon acres of great jagged black rocks that thrust up in long ledges that had to be skirted. All calculations on miles across were thrown out of kilter with this continually weaving back and forth across the desert. Time had ceased to matter. They lived only for the quiet numbness of the halts. All of them walked from time to time now. Time and again they had to get behind the wagon and push, or dig it out of rocks, or roll rocks to the side to clear the only possible trail. The world had become a nightmare of choking, smothering, clinging dust particles, a nightmare of sticky heat and stifling dust-filled air. All thoughts of hail were gone. They did not think of food or family, only of getting across, getting out of this hell of choking white. Kilkenny was no longer sure of the compass. Mineral deposits might have made it error. They might be wandering in circles. His only hope was that the ground was seeming to rise now, seeming to be slanting upward. Choking, coughing, they moved on into the dust blizzard, hearing only the lonely sough of the wind. Dazed with heat, dust, and weariness, they moved on. The mules were staggering now. They moved only a few yards at a time. The black upthrust of the cliff loomed at them suddenly, when all hope seemed gone. It loomed black and sheer, yet here at the base the dust seemed a little less, a little thinner. Kilkenny swung down and waited until the rest of them came up. Well, he said hoarsely, we're across. Now we've got to get up. They rested there under the cliff for half an hour, and then his own restlessness won over his weariness. He'd never been able to stop short of a goal. There was something in him that always drove him on, regardless of weariness, trouble, or danger. And it came to the surface now. He lunged to his feet and started moving. He'd walked no more than a hundred yards when he found it, and stared at that incredible fact, that through all of their weaving back and forth, they'd held that close to their destination. The road looked rough, but it was a way up, beyond the hills. But a little way out now lay Blazer. It was dusk when they reached the top of the cliff and drew up under the pines. Digging a hole in the ground among some rocks, they built a fire at the bottom, warmed some food and made some coffee. The hole concealed the flames, and using dry wood they made no smoke. Kilkenny drank the strong black coffee and found his hand growing lax and his lids heavy. He got up, and staggering to his blankets, he fell asleep. He slept like he was drugged until Saul Hatfield shook him from his slumber in the last hours of the night to take over the watch. Lance got up and stretched, and then he walked over to the water casks, drew water and bathed himself, washing the dust from his hair and ears. Stripping to the waist, he bathed his body in cold water. Refreshed, he crossed to the black bulk of rocks and seated himself. In the darkness, thoughts came easily. He sat there, his eyes open, staring restlessly from side to side. Yet his thoughts were wandering back to Cedar Bluff. They wanted him to fight Tom Bull Turner. He decided to take the fight. Sitting here in the darkness, with the wind in the pines over the head, he could think clearly. It was their only chance of getting to the Santa Fe officials. He knew how men of all sorts and kinds admire a fighting man. The Santa Fe officials especially, if one of them was Halloran, would be no exception. He would be going into the fight as the underdog. Hale wanted him to be whipped, but King Bill's power was destroying his shrewdness. Halloran, or whoever came, would know about Tomble. The man had been fighting and winning all through the West. Any man who went against him would be the underdog, and the underdog always has the crowd with him. 
Kilkenny knew that there was scarcely a chance that he would do anything but take a beating. Yet he believed he could stay in there long enough to make some impression. In between rounds, that would be his chance. If ever he would have a chance to talk, it would be then. King Bill would have his guests in ringside seats. He would be expecting a quick victory. Coldly, Kilkenny appraised himself. Like all fighting men, he considered himself good. He'd fought many times in the rough and tumble fistfights of the frontier. As a boy, he'd fought many times in school. During the days when he was in the East, he'd taken instruction from the great Jem Mace, the English pugilist, who's one of the cleverest of all bare-knuckle fighters. Mace was a shrewd fighter who used his head for something aside from a parking place for two thick ears. King Bill did not know that Kilkenny had ever boxed. Neither Tom Bull would know that. Moreover, Kilkenny had lived a life in the open, life that required hard physical condition and superb strength. He had those assets. And above all, he had his knowledge of Turner, whereas Turner knew nothing of him. Turner would be overconfident. Nevertheless, in all honesty, Kilkenny could find little hope of victory. His one hope was to make a game fight of it, win the sympathy and interest of the officials before he spoke to them, as he would. He would rest when he returned to the cup. He would soak his hands in brine. He would wear driving gloves in the ring. Some of the younger fighters were wearing those skin-tight gloves now, and Mace had told him of their cutting ability. There was no sound but the sound of the forest, and he relaxed watching and awaiting the dawn. When it came, they ate a hurried breakfast. They were rested and felt better. Kilkenny cleaned his guns carefully, both pistols and his rifle, and the others did likewise. Quince, Kilkenny said as he holstered his guns. You know, Blazer, what do you think? Hatfield shrugged. I reckon they won't be expecting us from hereabouts. I've been taking some bearings and I reckon we'll come into town from the opposite side. We've got a good chance of getting to it before they know who we are. Good. Kilkenny turned to Bartram. You know the team. You stay by the wagon and you keep your gun handy. Stay on the ground where you can either mount up or take cover. Saul, you and Jackie hustle the grub out to the wagon, and Quince will stand by and cover you. How about you, Bartram asked, looking at him. I'm going to look around for sign of the other wagon. I want to know what happened to Lige and them. They may be all right, but I want to know. As they mounted up, he turned in his saddle. Quince, you ride with me. Saul and Jackie, they'll bring up the rear. They started out, and less than a mile from where they'd come up from the desert, they rode down into the trail that went into Blazer. As Quince Hatfield had suggested... They were coming in from the opposite side. Two rows of ramshackle saloons, cheap dance halls, and stores made up the town of Blazer. These two rows faced each other across a river of dust that was called a street. The usual number of town loafers sat on benches in front of crossroads, the Temple of Chance, and the wagon wheel. It was morning. A few horses stood at the hitching rail, There was a blood bay with a beautifully hand-worked saddle standing in front of the crossroads, and two cow ponies stood three-legged before the wagon wheel. End of chapter 11 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour in the Public Domain Chapter 12 Lance Kilkenny rode past Perkins' general store and swung down in front of the wagon wheel. Bartram stopped the wagon parallel to the hitching rail and began to fill his pipe. His rifle leaned against the seat beside him. Saul and Jackie walked into the store, and Quince leaned against the corner of the store and lighted a cigarette. His rifle lay in the wagon, but he wore a huge walker colt slung to his belt. A horseman came down the trail and swung down in front of the wagon wheel and walked inside. Quint straightened and stared at him, and his eyes narrowed. 
The man was big and had red hair and a red beard. Kilkenny stared at the man, and then, as Quince motioned with his head, he idled over toward him. That hombre was wearing an ivory-handled colt, with the chipped ivory on the right side, Hatfield said. His narrow face was empty, and his eyes were bitter. A chipped ivory butt? Kilkenny frowned. Then suddenly his face paled. Why, Jody Miller had a gun like that, and Jody was with the first wagon. Uh Uh-huh, I reckon, Hatfield said, that I'd better ask me a few questions. Wait, Kilkenny said. I'm going in there. You keep your eyes open. Remember, we need the grub first. In the meantime, I'll figure out something. He turned and walked over to the wagon wheel and ambled inside. Two cowpokes sat at the table with a bartender and a man in a black coat. A huge man, enormously big and enormously fat. That, he decided, would be Soderman. The red-bearded man was leaning on the bar. Come on, Shorty, he snapped. Give us a drink, I'm dry. Take it easy, gaddies, Shorty barked. He was a short, thick-set man with an unshaven face. I'll be with you in a minute. Kilkenny leaned against the bar and looked round. It didn't look good. If the big man was Soderman, and there was small chance of there being two such huge men in any western town, that place Soderman and Gaddy's. The cowpokes might be mere cowhands, but they didn't look it. One of them might be Ratcliffe, and there was still Rye Picton. But he, he knew Rye, and that wrestler was not present. Judging by appearances, Shorty could be counted on to side with Soderman. And if that was Jody Miller's gun, that meant the other wagon had been stopped. And chances were that the men who accompanied it had been wiped out. Slow rage began to mount in Kilkenny at the thought of those honest, sincere men who asked only for the right to work and build homes. Being killed by such as these? He was suddenly conscious that Soderman was watching him. Shorty got up and sauntered behind the bar. "'What'll you have?' he asked, leaning again the hardwood. His eyes slanted from Gaddy's to Kilkenny. "'Rye,' Gaddy said. He turned abruptly and gave Kilkenny a cool glance. A glance that suddenly quickened as he noticed the dusty clothing and the tied-down guns. He stared at Kilkenny's face. But Lance had his hat brim low, and this man had never seen him before anyway." Make mine a rye, too, Kilkenny said. He turned his head and looked at Soderman. You drinking? Maybe. The fat man got up, and he moved his huge bulk with astonishing lightness. Kilkenny's eyes sharpened. This man could move. Maybe I will. I always likes to know who I'm drinking with, howsoever. Not so particular where I come from, Kilkenny said softly. Drink's a drink. I reckon, Soderman nodded affably. You appear to be a stranger hereabouts. I reckon every man who wears a gun like you wear yours knows Doc Soderman. I've heard the name. Kilkenny left his eyes drift to the table. One of the men was sitting up straight and rolling a smoke. The other was idly riffling the cards. Either could draw fast. Red Gaddies had turned to face them. The whole setup was obviously ready to spring. He was going to have to relax them a little. He'd have to relieve this tension. Heard there might be a job up this way for a man, he said slowly. I could use a job up here where it's quiet. Away from the law, you mean? Soderman laughed until he shook all over. Kilkenny noticed that there was no laughter in his eyes, though. Uh Uh-huh, away from everything. We got law here. King Bill Hale runs this country. Heard of him. You hear a lot, Gaddy suggested. His eyes were mean. Yep. Kilkenny turned a little and let his green eyes stare from under his hat room at the red-headed man. Yeah, I make it my business to hear a lot. Maybe you hear too much, Gaddy snapped. You want to show me how much? Kilkenny's voice was level. He spoke coolly, yet he was sure that there would be no shooting here, yet. He was wondering if Soderman knew that Hatfield was outside beside the window. Gaddy stepped away from the bar. His jaw jutted. Why, I think you're... Stop it! 
Soderman's voice was suddenly charged with anger. You're too anxious for trouble, Gaddies. Some days you'll get yourself killed. Gaddies relaxed slowly. His eyes were ugly. Yet watching the man, Kilkenny could sense a certain relief in him. Gaddies was a killer, but not a gunman in the sense that he was highly skilled. He was a paid killer, a murderer, the sort of man who would drag out a man around a wagon. And he also wore a chipped gun. Your friend's right proddy, Kilkenny said softly. He must have a killing urge. Forget it, Soderman said jovially. He's all right. He just likes to fight, that's all. Kilkenny stared at Gaddy's. Seems like you should be somebody I know, he drawled slowly. I don't recognize that face, but I do know you. Then again, I never remember a face anyway. I got my own methods of knowing a man. I look at the only thing that's important to me. What's that? Soderman asked. He was studying Kilkenny, curiosity in his eyes and some puzzlement. I always remember a man's gun. Each gun has its own special look, or maybe it's the way a man wears his gun. Take that one now, that chipped ivory on the side of the butt. Man wouldn't forget a gun like that in a hurry. Gaddy stiffened, and his face turned gray, and then the tip of his tongue touched his lips. Before he could speak, Soderman looked straight into Kilkenny's eyes. And where would you see that gun? In Santa Fe, Kilkenny drawled, remembering that Miller had once lived there. It was hanging to a man they said was coming west to farm. His name was Jody Miller. You talk too much, Gaddy snarled. His face was white and his lips were thin. Yeah, it was in Santa Fe, Kilkenny was adding a touch now that he hoped would worry Soderman. Only a word, yet sometimes. Miller stopped off in Santa Fe to see some folks at the fort there and talked to Halloran and Wallace. Seems like they was old friends of his. Soderman's face sharpened, and then he turned, his hand raised, to make dr- Gaddy's draw back a little. You're talking a lot, stranger, he said smoothly. You say this Miller knowed Halloran and Wallace? Uh-huh. Kilkenny motioned to Shorty to refill his glass. It seemed like he knowed him back east. One of them married a sister of his or something. I heard him talking in a saloon once. Heard Halloran say he was coming out here to visit Miller. Kilkenny glanced at Gaddy's, his face expressionless. I reckon you'll be plumb guide to see him, Miller. It's mighty nice to have a big, official man like that as a friend. Lance could have laughed if he hadn't known what he knew now. That a wagon had been waylaid, and that Miller was probably dead. There would be no other reason for Gaddy's looking as he did. The man was obviously afraid. Soderman was staring, keen-eyed. Yet there was uncertainty in the big man. When that uncertainty ended, there would be danger, Kilkenny knew. Funny, Kilkenny said softly. I don't remember Miller having red hair. Seemed to me it was black. That's what it was. It was black. It was yellow, Gaddy's began. Yellow, that's right. It was yellow. Strange. I couldn't remember that. But you, stranger, you've got Jody Miller's gun. How do you explain that? Suddenly, the door behind Kilkenny opened. He felt the flesh along the back of his neck tighten. He dared not turn. He'd been deliberately baiting them, hoping for more information, yet baiting them too. And now suddenly, there was a man behind him. Soderman seemed to make up his mind. Assurance returned to him, and he spoke low, almost amused. My howdy, Rye. I reckon you should come in and meet our friend here. Says he recognizes this gun Red's a wearin'. Rye Picton walked past Kilkenny and then turned. His jaw dropped as though he'd seen a ghost, and he made an involuntary step backwards, his face slowly going white. You, he gasped, you! Why, yes, Kilkenny said. It's me, Picton. Long ways from the Pico's country, ain't it? And a sight further from the Brazos. Now, Picton, I'll tell you something. I'm not real anxious to kill anybody right here and now. But if I start shooting, two of you are going to die. That'll be you, Rye, and Soderman there. I couldn't miss them. And if I'm still shooting, as I will be, I'm going to take care of Gaddy's next. Gaddy's because he killed Jody Miller. But that comes later. Right now I'm leaving. And right now you better impress on your friends that reaching for iron wouldn't do you any good. 
He stepped back toward the door. His eyes shifted under the hat brim, from one face to the other. Soderman's eyes were narrowed. Picton's obvious fear put doubt in the big man. Who was this stranger? Red Gaddy shifted toward the center of the room, his eyes watchful. Rye stiffened as Red moved. Don't, Red! That's Kilkenny! Gaddy stopped and his face turned blank with a mingled astonishment and fear. And then glass tinkled from the front of the room and a long Kentucky rifle barrel slid into the room. Kilkenny stepped back toward the door. Now if you hombres are smart, you'll just hole up here for the time being. We don't want trouble, but we may have it. Kilkenny stepped through the door and glanced up quickly. Up and down the street, Bartram was on the wagon seat, his rifle across his knees. Jackie Moffat was standing by his horse, his rifle in his hands, and Saul was across the street. Kilkenny smiled in narrow-eyed apprehension. They were fighters, these men. Start the wagon, he said, down the cedar trail. Jackie, stay with Bartram. He walked out and swung into the saddle, and then slid a rifle from the route. All right, slide. He wheeled the buckskin and whipped down the street. A shot rang out from behind him, and he twisted to look. Saul was mounted, but Quince had turned and thrown up his rifle. He fired. A man staggered from the shelter of the wagon wheel and spilled on his face in the dust. And in the next instant, there was a fusillade of shots from the wagon wheel and the nearby buildings. The gunmen had slipped out the back way, and they were getting into action. Kilkenny reined in behind the last building and swung to the ground. And then with careful fire, he covered the Hatfields as they raced up the street to join him. Quince was smiling. His eyes were hard. That was Red Gaddy's, he said coolly. He won't take more dead men's guns. Give the wagon a start, Kilkenny said. We're going to make some buzzard bait. We have to come back to this town. We might as well let them know what the score is. Every time a head moved, one of them fired. And while they stayed where they were, no man dared enter that street. No man dared try the back way in this direction. Leaving the two hat fields, Kilkenny sprinted down behind the buildings toward the wagon wheel. The men there were killers. He did not know what had happened to the other wagon, but he meant to find out. That was his reason for taking the blazer trail. He was hoping that they might not all be dead. At least... He could bury those that were. End of chapter 12 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis Lemour In the Public Domain Chapter 13 The rear door of the saloon was open, and there was no one in sight. He stood behind the next building and watched for an instant. He wanted Pitkin or Ratcliffe. He would get nothing from Soderman unless the fat man elected to tell him. Several old boards lay on the ground behind the saloon, dry and parched. On a sudden inspiration, he moved swiftly from the shelter of the building, and holstering his gun, hurriedly piled them together. Then using a piece of old sacking and some parched grass, he lit the fire. It was away from the buildings, but the wind would blow the smoke into the saloon. He hoped they would think that he was burning them out. The last thing that he wanted to do is he needed the town as a supply base. As the boards caught fire, he stepped back quickly. There was a startled exclamation as the fire began to crackle and the wood smoke blew into the back of the saloon. A second later, a man stepped to the door, thrust his head out, and then stared at the fire. He seemed puzzled. Out of sight, Kilkenny waited. Then the man stepped out and kicked the boards apart. All right, Kilkenny snapped. Don't move. It was Ratcliffe, and the man froze. What's up, Kilkenny? I never done nothing to you. Start this way and walk careful. Watch your hands. Ratcliffe was a weasel-faced man with shifty eyes. He started moving, but shot a glance at the doorway. He held his hands wide. When he was six feet away, Kilkenny stopped him. All right, talk. I want to know what happened to the other wagon. Radcliffe sneered. You think I'd tell? Guess again. You don't dare shoot. If you do, they'll be out, but fast. With one quick step, Kilkenny grabbed the man by the throat and slammed him back against the building. Then he lifted the pistol. Want a pistol whipping man? He said harshly. If I start on you, you'll never look the same again. 
Leave me be, Radcliffe pleaded. His face was yellow. I'll talk. Get at it, then. They done loaded up with grub. We let them get out of town. Then Soderman ambushed them. Had about six men, I think. Who was killed? We lost a man. We got Miller and taught Wilson in the first blast. It was Hatfield got our man. Nailed him dead center between the eyes. What happened to Hatfield and Height? They got Height. I seen him go down. He was shot two, maybe three times. We got Hatfield too, but he got up. and He dragged Height into some rocks. We couldn't get to him. Then what? A voice roared in the saloon. It was Soderman. Ratcliffe! What in time are you doing out there? Answer me, Kilkenny snapped. Then what? Soderman said it would serve him right. Leave him there to die. Two men to see that they didn't move out of them rocks. It's been two days now. On the blazer trail? Yeah, almost to the turnoff of the peaks. With a swift movement, Kilkenny flipped Ratcliffe's pistol from his holster. All right, get going, he snapped. With a dive, Ratcliffe started for the saloon door. And just at that instant, Soderman thrust his huge bulk into the open space. He glimpsed Kilkenny as he released Ratcliffe, and with a swift motion, palmed his gun and fired. He fired from the hip, and he wasn't a good hip shot. His first bullet caught Ratcliffe squarely in the chest, and the weasel-faced rider stopped dead still and then dropped. Kilkenny's gun swept up and spraddle-legged. In the open, he fired. Soderman's gun went off at the same instant, but Kilkenny's bullet hit him right above the belt buckle in the middle of that vast expanse. The blow staggered Soderman, and his bullet clipped slivers from the building above Kilkenny's head, and whined angrily away into the grass back of the saloon. The big man looked sick, and then suddenly his knees gave way and he toppled down, faceward, on the steps. The pistol fell from fingers that had lost their life and rattled on the boards below. Kilkenny walked toward the saloon, keeping his gun in his hand. Stepping up beside the door, he saw Rye Pitkin and the short bartender, rifles in hand, crouched by the front window. Drop him, Kilkenny snapped, and he stepped quickly inside. Unbuckle your belts and let those guns down quick. Surprised into helplessness, the men did as they were told. Rye, I've given you a break before. I'm giving you one again. Same for you, Shorty. You two mount and ride, and if I ever see either of you again, I'll kill you. I'll be back to Blazer, and you be doggone sure you aren't here. Backing them away, he scooped up the guns, and then backed out the door. He hurried to the corner, where the Hatfields waited. Quince was chewing on a straw. He looked at the weapons, grinned a little, and started for his horse. Lige may be alive, Kilkenny told him and he explained quickly. Quince narrowed his eyes. You won't be needing us, he said. We'll ride on. Go ahead, Kilkenny said, and luck with you. With a rush of hooves, Saul and Quince Hatfield swept off down the trail. Kilkenny watched them go. The Hatfields were hard to kill. Lige might be alive. It was like him to have thought of height, even when he was wounded. Those lean, wiry men were tough, and he might still be alive. He rode up to the wagon and saw Bartram's face flush with relief. Jackie was riding beside the wagon. His old sharps was ready. His face was boyishly stern. What is it? Bartram asked. What happened? We've won another round, Kilkenny said. We can come to Blazer for supplies now. Dust devils danced over the desert, and the mules plodded slowly along the trail. The wagon rumbled and bumped over stones in the road and Bartram dozed on the wagon seat. To the left, the mountains lifted in rocky slopes, with many upthrust edges of jagged rock. To the right, the ground sloped away toward Cedar Branch, which lay miles away beyond the intervening sagebrush and mesquite. Jackie Moffat rode silently, looking from time to time at Kilkenny. Lance knew the youngster was dying to ask him about what happened in Blazer, and he was just as loath to speak of it. But he could understand the youngster's curiosity. He moved the buckskin over alongside the boy. Trouble back there, Jack, he said after a minute. Men were killed back there. Who was it? Did you kill him? Jackie asked eagerly. One. I had to, Jack. I didn't want to. Nobody ever likes to kill a man unless there's something wrong with him. 
I had to get news out of somebody, and I got it from Ratcliffe, and then turned him loose. But in trying to get to me, Soderman shot him, and then I shot Soderman. What about the others? I let them go. I told Pitkin and Shorty to get out of the country, and I think they'll go. We asked them in the store, but they was scared. They wouldn't talk no how. Saul, he asked them, and they was afraid. But they was right nice with us. They rode on through the heat. Occasionally, they stopped to rest the mules. It was slower this way, as the road was longer. But there was no dust. And they had to come this way to make sure about Lige and the others. Again and again, Kilkenny found his thoughts reverting to Nita. How was she faring with Hale? Would she marry him? The thought came to him with a pang. He was in love with Nita. He'd admitted that to himself long before this. But he knew too well what it would mean to be the wife of a gunman. A man who never knew when he might go down to the dusty death. Lead spattered in the street. A man couldn't think only of himself. A few men seemed to be able to leave it all behind. But they were very few. Of course, he could go east. But his whole life had been lived in the west. He had no source of income in the east. He'd been a gambler at times and had done well, but it was nothing to build a life upon. His thoughts moved ahead to the Hatfields. What would they find? Would the men left behind have murdered the wounded Lige? Had Height been dead? How many more would die before this war was settled? Why did one man see fit to push his bloody fight upon men who wanted only peace and time to till their fields? Why should one man desire power so much? There is enough in the world for all to have a quiet, comfortable living. And what more could a man desire? The wagon rumbled over the rocks, and he lifted his eyes and let them idle over the heat wave distance. After fire and blood, there would be peace, and men could come into this land and settle these hills. Perhaps someday there would be water, and then grass would grow where now there was only cacti and sagebrush. Cicadas whined and sang in the mesquite until the sound became almost the voice of the wastelands. They camped that night in a hollow in the hills and pushed on at dawn toward the joining of the trails. The country was rockier now and the distance closed in, pushing the mountains nearer. There was less breeze. The air was dead and still. Jackie traded places with Bartram and handled the mules, and Bartram rode on ahead, riding carefully. Kilkenny watched him go, liking the easy way the farmer rode, and liking his clean-cut honesty. It was morning of the third day when Kilkenny saw a horseman drawing near. He recognized him even before he came up with him. It was Saul. Found him, Saul said briefly, both alive. Heights plumb riddled. Lige was hit three times. One time pretty bad. It was holed up in some rocks, more dead than alive. Anybody around? Yeah, one man. He was dead. Lige must have got him, bad off as he was. The other took out. Lige will live. We hat fields are tough. When they reached the cluster of rocks, they pulled the wagon close. Quince had both men stretched out and had rigged a shelter from the sun. Kilkenny knelt over the men. That height was breathing was a marvel, although all his wounds showed signs of care. Lige, wounded as he was, had cared for the other man. His wounds had been bathed and crudely bandaged. His lips seemed moist. He'd evidently not lacked for water. Lige Hatfield was grimly conscious. There was an unrelenting look in his eyes, enough to show them that Lige meant to face death if need be as sternly and fearlessly as he'd faced life and danger. His lips were dry and parched. Even the water that Quince had given him had failed to reduce the ravages brought on by several days of thirst. Obviously, from the condition of the two men, Lige had been giving the little water that they had to Jackson Height. The two men were lifted carefully and placed in the wagon, with groceries piled around them and sacks and blankets beneath them. Another blanket was placed over two barrels to form a crude awning over their faces. And then with Bartram handling the mules, they started once more. 
End of chapter 13. A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis Lemoore in the public domain. Chapter 14. It was quiet in the Hatfield Cup when the little group rode in. The Hatfield women did not cry. They gathered around and watched when the two men were lifted from the wagon and carried within. Parson waited grim-faced for Kilkenny. That's two more, Kilkenny. Two more good men gone. And two that are like to die. I'm telling you, man. I'm a gonna kill that Bill Hale. Not now. Wait. Kilkenny kicked a toe into the dust. Any more trouble here? Smithers ain't come back. Where'd he go? To look at his crop. He sets great store by that crop. Says he'll be back to harvest it. When did he leave? Yesterday morning. Shouldn't have kept him that long, no ways. I reckon he might hole up in the hills somewhere. Talking slowly, Lance recounted all that had transpired. He told of the bitter crossing of the smoky desert, of the fight at Blazer, of the death of Gaddies and the others. We can cross the desert any time, unless the wind is blowing strong, he concluded. They can't bottle us up. It's a miserable trip, and if a man was to try it and get caught in a windstorm, there's a good chance you'd never hear of him again. The same if he got into that quicksand. I knowed that, Gaddies. He was a bad one. Glad he's gone. The same for Soderman. There's something else, Kilkenny suggested after a moment. We've proved that we could get across, and we slipped by their guards coming back by the blazer trail, but it won't take them much to figure out what happened. They may try coming in our back door that way. Parson nodded shrewdly. I was thinking of that. We'll have to be careful. When morning came and Lance rolled out of his blankets, he looked quickly at the house. Then he saw Saul. The tall, lean boy was walking away from the house. He looked sick and old. They saw each other at the same instant. Saul, Kilkenny said, is... He's dead. Lige's dead. Kilkenny turned away, and for the first time something like despair welled up inside of him. One of the Hatfields had died. It seemed as though something of the mountains themselves had gone. For there was in those lean, hard-headed, raw-boned men something that lived on despite everything. And Lige had died. O'Hara came out to him later, and the big Irishman's face was ugly and sullen. And that dock down to Cedar Bluff? We tried to sneak in and get him to come. He wouldn't come. And he set up a squall when we tried to take him. We was lucky to get away. We'll remember that, Kilkenny said quietly. We can't use a doctor who won't come when he's called, not in this country. Parson looked at him thoughtfully, and then he looked away. Lance, you ever think that maybe we won't win? That maybe they'll just wipe us all out? Suppose you can't talk to them, Santa Fe men. Supposing if you do, they won't listen. Kilkenny looked at the ground, and then slowly he lifted his head. There's a man behind this, Parson, he said slowly. A man who's gone mad with power craving. His son's a-driving him, Parson. I've seen men murdered because they wanted homes. There's no harm in Jody Miller, nor in Tot Wilson. They were hard-working and honest ones. Lige, well, he was a fine boy, a real man, too. He had strength, courage, and all that it takes to be a man. And there at the last, when they were holed up in the rocks, he cared for height when he must have been near dead himself. He must have had to drag himself to height's side. Must have had to force himself to forget his own pain. Those men are dead, and they're dead because of one man, maybe two. Maybe I'm wrong, parson, but if all else fails, I'm riding a cedar bluff and I'll kill those two men. And I'll go with you, parson stated flatly. His old face was grim and hard. Lige was my son. He... No, parson. You can't go with me. You'll have to stay here and keep this bunch together. And see that they make the most of their land. 
I want homes in these high meadows, parson. Homes and kids around them. And cattle walking peaceful in the evening. No, it'll be my job down there. We all... We all who live by the gun. We all die in the end. It's better for me to go alone and live or die by what happens then. But at least it'll be in good cause. He lay in the shade of a huge Norway pine, resting and thinking of what lay ahead of him. Thinking of the fight with Tom Bull Turner. Lying there with his eyes shut, he could hear the sound of shovels. As Runyon and Jesse Hatfield dug a grave for Lige. In his mind, he was taking himself back to the times when he'd seen Turner fight. He was remembering, not the battered men who went down before Turner, but every move the big man made. No man was without a fault, and Kilkenny had been taught well. He knew how he must plan, and he ran over and over in his mind, the way the big man held his hands, the way his feet moved when he advanced or retreated, the way they moved when he punched, and what Turner did when he hit with a left or right. Each fighter develops habits, certain methods of stopping or countering a punch that's easy for him, so he uses that method most, even though he may know others. A smooth boxer, walking into a ring and expecting a long fight, will feel out an opponent, find out how he uses a left, how he blocks one, and then he knows what to do. If he lasted in this fight, Kilkenny knew, it would only last because of brains, only because that he could think faster and better, more effectively than Turner or those who handled him. Yet again and again, as he lay there thinking, his mind reverted to Nita Riordan, the dark, voluptuous beauty of the Irish and Spanish girl at the Crystal Palace was continually in his mind. But there was something else, too. In the back of his mind loomed the huge, ominous Cain Brockman. On that desperate day back in Cottonwood in the Live Oak County, he'd killed Abel, and Cain had been thrown from his rearing horse and knocked unconscious. Later in the trail house, he'd slugged it out, and whipped Cain in a bitter knock-down and drag-out fistfight. Cain had sworn to kill him, and Cain Brockman was in Cedar Bluff, too. When night came, Kilkenny threw a saddle on the slim back horse and rode out of the cup. He was going to see Nita. Even as he rode, he admitted to himself that there was little reason to see her, except that he wanted to. He had no right to take chances with his life when it could mean so much to the cause that he was aiding. Yet he had to see Nita. Also, he could find out what Hale was doing, what he was planning. He rode swiftly, and the black horse was eager for the trail. It wasn't Buck, but the horse was fast and with speed to spare. It was late when he rode down to the edge of Cedar Bluff, and his thoughts went back to Leather's roused out of a sound sleep and made to put up groceries. To Dan Cooper, the tough cowhand and gunman who'd watched Leather's store. Cooper was a good man on the wrong side. Leather's was a man who would be on any winning side. One of the little men who think only of immediate profits, and who try to ride with the powers that be. Well, a payoff for Leather's was coming leaving his horse in the shadows of the trees beyond the Crystal Palace. Kilkenny moved into the shadows of the stable. His eyes watched the palace for a long time, and finally he moved, ghost-like, across the open space to the back of the gambling hall. Tiptoeing along the wall, he came to the door that he sought. Carefully, he tried the knob. It was locked. Ahead of him, a curtain blew through an open window, waving a little, and then sagging back as the momentary breeze died. He paused beneath the window, listening. Inside, he could hear the steady rise and fall of a man's breathing. It was the only way in. Hesitating only a minute, he put his foot through the open window and stepped inside. Almost at once, there was a black shadow of movement and a forearm slipped across his throat in a stranglehold and then that forearm crushed back into the throat with tremendous power. 
Setting the muscles in his neck, he strained forward, agonizing pain shooting through the growing blackness of his brain. He surged forward and felt the man's feet lift from the floor. And then suddenly the hold relaxed, and he felt a hand slide down to his gun, and then to the other gun, and then he was released. Brigo, he said. Si, sí, senor, Brigo answered in a whisper. I did not know. But only one man is so powerful as you. When you lifted me, I knew it must be you. And then I felt your guns. I know them well. The senorita is here? Si. Sí. Brigo was silent for a moment. Senor, I fear for her. This Hale, he wants her very much. Also, the cub of the bear, he wants her. I fear for her. One day they will come to take her. Kilkenny could sense the worry in the big man's voice. But you, Brigo? He could almost see the yaki shrug. I see the two hombres, Dunn and Ravitz. They watch me always. Soon they will try to kill me. The senorita says I must not go out to kill them. But soon, I must. Wait if you can, Kilkenny said, and then act as you must. If you feel the time has come, do not wait for the senorita to say... You do not kill heedlessly. If there is no other way, you are to judge. Gracias, senor, Brigo said simply. If you will come with me? Kilkenny followed him through the darkness, down the hall to another door. There, Brigo tapped gently. Almost at once, he heard Nita's voice. Jamie? See, si, the senor is here. The door opened quickly and Brigo vanished into the darkness as Kilkenny stepped in. Nita closed the door. Her long, dark hair fell about her shoulders. In the vague light, he could see the clinging of her nightgown, the rise and fall of her bosom beneath a thin material. Kilkenny, what is it? Her voice was low, and something in its timber made his muscles tremble. It required all of the strength that was in him not to take her in his arms. I had to see you. Are you all right? See, si, for now. He's given me until after the celebration to make up my mind. After that, I shall have to leave or marry him. The celebration, he said bitterly, is the cornerstone of everything now. Briefly and dispassionately, he told her all that had happened. Of the trip across the smoky desert, the deaths of Miller, Wilson, and Lige Hatfield, and then the death of Soderman, and the other of Hale's men. Does he know of that yet? he asked. I doubt it. He told me that there had been an attempt to get food over the blazer trail, and the men who made it had been wiped out. I don't think he knew more than that. I'm going to fight Turner, he said. She caught her breath suddenly. Oh no, Kilkenny, he's a brute. I've seen him around the palace, so huge and so strong. I've seen him bend silver dollars in his fingers. I've seen him squat beside a table, take the edge in his teeth and lift it clear off the floor. I know, but I must fight him. It's my only chance to get close to Halloran. He explained quickly. If we can just let them know that we aren't outlaws. If they could only realize what's happening here. That these are good men, only trying to establish homes. To fight him is my only chance. I heard that you would. Brigo told me the word had come that you would fight him. What did Brigo say? Kilkenny found that he was very anxious to know. The big Yaki had an instinct for judging the fighting abilities of men. Powerful, fierce, and ruthless himself, he knew fighting men. And he'd been long in the lands where men had lived by courage and strength. He says that you will win. She said it simply. I cannot see how anyone could defeat that man, but Brigo is sure. He has made bets, and he's the only one who dares to bet against Turner. Nita, if there's a chance, say something to Halloran. There won't be. Hale will see to that. But if there is, I surely will. Nita, when the fight is over, I'll come for you. I'm going to take you away from this. Will you go? Need you ask? She smiled up at him in the dimness. You know that I will go, Kilkenny. Wherever you go, I will go. 
Kilkenny, I made my choice long ago. Kilkenny slipped from the house and returned to his horse. The black stood patiently, and when Lance touched his bridle, he jerked his head up and was ready to go. Yet when he reached a turn, Lance swung the black horse down the street of Cedar Bluff. Walking the horse, he rode up slowly to the ring. It had been set up in an open space near the corrals. Seats had been placed around, with several rows close to the ringside. That would be where King Bill would sit with his friends. The Emperor would watch the gladiators. Kilkenny smiled wryly. A light footstep sounded at the side of the ring, and Kilkenny's gun leapt from his holster. Don't move, he whispered sharply. It's all right, Kilkenny, the man stepped closer, his hands held wide. It's Dan Cooper. So you know I'm Kilkenny? Cooper chuckled. Yeah, I recognized your face that first day, but I couldn't tie it to a name. It came to me just now. Hale will be wild when he hears. You're a good man, Cooper, Kilkenny said suddenly. Why stay on the wrong side? Is the winning side the wrong side? Not for me it ain't. But I ain't saying as to who's in the right in this squabble, but a gun hand on the winning side is the right one. No conscience, Cooper? Kilkenny questioned, trying to see the other man's eyes through the darkness. Dick Moffat was a good man, and so were Jody Miller, and Tot Wilson, and Lige Hatfield. Then Lige died? Cooper's voice quickened. That's not good. For you or for us. The Hales, they don't think much of the Hatfields, but I do. I know them. The Hales will have to kill every last Hatfield now or die themselves. I know them. You could have tried a shot at me, Cooper, Kilkenny suggested. Me? Cooper laughed lightly. I'm not the kind, Kilkenny. Not in the dark, without a warning. I ain't so anxious to get you anyway. I'd be the hombre that killed Kilkenny. And that's like setting yourself up in a shooting gallery. Anyway, I want to see the fight. The fight? Between you and Tombow, that should be good. Cooper leaned on the platform of the ring. Between the two of us, I ain't envying you none. That hombre's poison. He ain't human. Eats food enough for three men. Still, Cooper shoved his hat back on his head. You sure took King Bill, and he was some shakes of a scrapper. Cooper straightened up. You know, Kilkenny, just two men are betting on you. Two? Uh-huh. One's that yakky gunman, Brigo. The other? He's Kane Brockman. Kane Brockman? Kilkenny was startled. Yep, he says he's going to kill you, but he says that you can whip Turner first. He told Turner to his face that you was the best man, and Turner was sure mad. Dan Cooper hitched up his belt. Almost time for my relief. If I was you, I'd take out. Next hombre might not be so anxious to see a good fight that he'd pass up five thousand dollars. You mean there's money on my head? Kilkenny asked. Yep. Five thousand, dead or alive. Cooper shrugged. Cub didn't like the idea of the reward. He figures that you're staked out for him. Okay, Dan. Enjoy the confab. Thanks. Listen, you make that fight worth the money, will ya? And by the way, watch Cub hail. He's poison mean and faster than a striking rattler. Kilkenny rode out of town and took to the hills. The route that he took homeward was not the same as that which he'd used to approach the town. Long ago, he'd learned that it was very foolhardy to retrace one's steps. Once at the Hatfields, he bedded down about daylight and slept until early afternoon. So Cain Brockman was betting on him. For a long time, Kilkenny sat in speculation. He lived over and over again that bitter afternoon. In the trail house, when he'd whipped huge Cain, it had seemed that that great bulk was impervious to anything in the shape of a human fist. Yet he'd brought him down It had beaten him into helplessness. Parson and Quint strolled over and sat down. Their faces were grave. It was like these men to hide their grief. Yet he knew that under the emotionless faces of the men there was a feeling, a great feeling of family 
in unity stronger than any that he'd ever known. These men loved each other and lived for each other. Kilkenny, you settin' on fightin' this Turner? Parson inquired. Yes, I am, Kilkenny said quietly. It's our one chance to talk to Halloran. It's a big chance, too. But it's a chance to hit Hale another wallop. To hurt him, you gotta beat Turner, Quint said, staring at Kilkenny. You've got to win. That's right, Kilkenny agreed. So I'm going in to win. I've changed my mind about some things. I was figuring on just staying in there long enough to talk to the officials from Santa Fe. But now I'm going in there to win. And if I win, I make friends. People will like to see Hale beat again. Halloran is an Irishman, and an Irishman loves a good fighter. Well, I gotta win. They were silent for a few minutes, and Parson chewed on a straw. And then he looked up from under his bushy gray eyebrows. It ain't the fight that worries me. If the good Lord wants you to win, you'll win. What bothers me is after. Win or lose, what happens then? Do you think Hale will let you go? Kilkenny smiled grimly. He will, or there will be blood on the streets of Cedar Bluff. Hail blood. End of chapter 14 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour In the Public Domain Chapter 15 The crowds had started coming to Cedar Bluff by daylight. The miners had come, drifting over for the rodeo and the fight. The gold camps had been abandoned for the day, as there was rarely any celebration for them, rarely any relief from the loneliness and endless masculinity of the gold camps. The cowhands from the Hale Ranch were around in force. The bars were doing a rushing business even before noon and the streets were jammed with people. Kilkenny rode into town on the buckskin when the sun was high. For over an hour, he'd been lying on the hillside above the town, watching the movement. It was almost certain that King Bill would avoid trouble today. There were too many visitors, too many people who were beyond his control. He would be on good behavior today making an impression as the upright citizen and free-handed giver of celebrations. A rider under the flag of truce had appeared in the cup the evening before with an invitation to Kilkenny and the actual challenge for the fight. Word of Kilkenny's willingness for the fight had seeped into the town by the grapevine several days before, and so no tricks were needed. Kilkenny was to report to a man named John Bartlett, at the Crystal Palace. Kilkenny, accompanied by Parson Hatfield and Steve Runyon, rode down to the palace and dismounted. Quince Hatfield and O'Hara had already arrived in town, and they moved up outside the palace and loafed where they could watch the horses. Only a few of the Hale riders actually knew them by sight. Pushing open the batwing doors, Kilkenny stepped inside with Parson at his elbow. The place was crowded, and all the games were going full blast. Kilkenny's quick eyes swept the place. Jamie Brigo was in his usual chair across the room, and their eyes met. And then Kilkenny located Price Dixon. He was dealing cards at a nearby table. There was a warning in Dixon's eyes. And then Price made an almost imperceptible gesture of his head. Turning his eyes, Kilkenny felt a little chill go over him. Kane Brockman was standing at the bar, and Kane was watching him. Slowly, as though subtly aware of the tension in the room, eyes began to lift. As if by instinct, they found the tall, broad-shouldered man with the bronze face, clad completely in black, to the towering bruiser in the checked shirt and the worn Levi's. And then, his hands hanging carelessly at his sides, his flat-brimmed hat tilted down just a little, Kilkenny started across the room toward Kane Brockman. A deadly hush fell over the room. Kane had turned, his wide, 
unshaven face, still marked by the scars of his former battle with Kilkenny. Marked with the scars that he would carry to his grave. Through narrow eyes, the big man looked at Kilkenny, watching his slow steps across the floor. The studied ease, the grace of the man in black, the two big guns at his hips. Unseen, Nita Riordan had come to the door of her room, and eyes wide she watched Kilkenny walk slowly among the tables and pause before Kane Brockman. For a minute the two looked at each other, and then Kilkenny spoke. I hear that you've come to town to kill me, Kane, he said quietly. Yet in the deathly hush of the room, his voice carried to each corner. Well, I have another fight on my hands with Tom Bull Turner. If we shoot it out, I'm going to kill you. But you're a good man with a gun, and I reckon I'll catch some lead. Fighting Tom Bull is going to be enough, without carrying a craw full of lead when I do it. So how about a truce until afterward? For an instant, Kane hesitated. In the small gray eyes chill and cold, there came a little light of reluctant admiration. He straightened. I reckon I can wait, Kane drawled harshly. Never let it be said that Kane Brockman broke up a good fight. Thanks. Abruptly, Kilkenny turned away, turning his back fully on Kane Brockman, and with the same slow walk, crossed the room to Price Dixon. A big red-headed man stood at the table near Price. As he walked up to the table, the batwing doors pushed open and four men walked in. Kilkenny noticed them and felt a flash of recognition of danger go out for him. It was King Bill Hale, Cub Hale, and the Gold Dust twins, Dunn and Rabbits. Ignoring them, Kilkenny walked up to the red-headed man. You're John Bartlett, he asked. I'm Kilkenny. Glad to meet you, Bartlett thrust out his huge hands. How do you know me? I saw you in Abilene, then again in New Orleans. And you've seen Turner fight, Bartlett demanded keenly. He glanced up and down Kilkenny with a quick practiced eye. Yes, I've seen him fight. And you're not afraid? He's a bruiser. He nearly killed Tom Hanlon. Kilkenny smiled. And who was Tom Hanlon? A big chunk of beef so slow he couldn't get out of his own way. I see nothing in Turner to fear. You'd actually fight him, then? Bartlett, Bartlett was incredulous. Fight him? Kilkenny asked. Fight him? I'm going to whip him. That's the way to talk! A big black-bearded miner burst out. I'm sick of this big bull of a turner strutting around. My money goes on Kilkenny! Mine too, another miner said. I'd rather he was a miner, but I'll bet even on a cow hand if he can fight. Kilkenny turned and looked at the miner, and then he grinned. Friend, he said, I've swung a single jack for many a day, and tried a pan on half the creeks in Arizona. Bartlett leaned forward. This fight is for a prize of over a thousand dollars in gold, put up by King Hale. However, if you want to make a side bet... I do, Kilkenny said. He unbuttoned his shirt and took out a packet of bills. Five thousand dollars of it. Five thousand? Bartlett swallowed and saw Hale frown. I don't think we can cover it. What? Kilkenny looked up and his eyes met those of King Bill. I understood that Hale was offering three to one and no takers. That's the money I want. Some of that three to one that Bill Hale is offering. Three to one? Hale demanded. Why, I never. The astonishment in his voice was plain enough, but Kilkenny knew that he had him. With every move, he was calculated to win the crowd. Not for himself, but for those men that he represented. To back down would mean a loss of prestige to Hale. To declare that he knew of no three to one offer would make many believe that he'd welched on his bet. And if Kilkenny won, Hale would never dare order him killed, because all would think that it was revenge for losing the bet. And if Kilkenny lost, he would still put Hale in a bad light if he were suddenly murdered. What's the matter, Hale? Kilkenny demanded sharply. 
His voice rang out loudly in the crowded room. You backing down? Have you decided the man who whipped you on your own ground can whip Turner too? Didn't you bring Tom Bill Turner here to whip me or force me to back down? I'm calling you, Hale. Put up or shut up. I'm betting 5000 against your 15000 that I win. I'm betting all I own, aside from that little claim that you're trying to take away from me. Against a mere 15000 are you backing down? No, by the Lord Harry, I'm not. Hale's face was purple with his anger. I'm not going to go let any fence crawl and nester throw money in my face. I'm covering you. Kilkenny smiled slowly. Looks like an interesting afternoon, he said cheerfully. And then he turned and walked slowly from the room, conscious that with every step he took, the cold, white eyes of Cub Hale followed him, their hatred an almost tangible thing. They got outside and Parsons stared at him. You sure made King Bill look bad in there, but you made some friends. You mean, we made some friends, Kilkenny said quietly. That's the point. We've got to make friends. We've got to get the sympathy of these miners and the outside people that Hale can't touch. If we can get enough of them, we've got a fighting chance. Hale can't get too raw. There's law in this country now. And he can win only so long as he can make what he's doing seem right. If it stopped right here and he got me killed or took my land, a lot of people would be asking questions. They'll remember what I said. You see, Parson, we're little people. We're bucking a powerful and wealthy man, and that makes us the underdogs. I'm the smaller man in this fight, too. I'm a cowhand and a miner, fighting a trained prize fighter with my fists. A good part of that crowd is going to be with me for that reason alone. Even some of Hale's cowhands. It was mid-afternoon when Kilkenny walked down to the ring. The corral fence was covered with cowhands and miners, and the intervening space was filled with them. They were crowded along roofs and every bit of space. Scanning the crowd, Kilkenny's eyes glinted. The miners were out in strength, and with them had come a number of gamblers, cowhands from outside the valley, and a few odds and ends of trappers. The cluster of seats near the ring was empty, and two men guarded them. Kilkenny walked down ringside and then stripped to the waist. He slipped off his boots and pulled on a pair of Indian moccasins that fitted snugly. There was a roar from the crowd, and he saw Tom Bill Turner leaving the back door of Leather Store and striding toward the ring, wrapped in a blanket. As he climbed through the ropes and walked to his corner, King Bill Hale, Cub Hale, and two men in store clothes left the Mecca and started toward the ring. Behind them walked Dunn and Rabbits. And then, escorted by Jamie Brigo, Nita Riordan left the palace and walked slowly through the crowd toward the ring. She was beautifully dressed, in the very latest of fashion, and carried her chin high. Men drew aside to let her pass, and those along the way that she walked removed their hats. Nita Riordan had proved to Cedar Bluff that a woman could run a gambling joint and still remain a lady. Not one word had ever been said against her character. Even the most skeptical had been convinced, both by her own ladylike manner and by the ever-watchful presence of Brigo. Price Dixon walked down to Kilkenny's corner, he hesitated and then stepped forward. I've had some experience as a handler, he said simply, if you'll trust a gambling man. Kilkenny looked at him and then smiled. Why, I reckon we're all gambling men after a fashion, sir. I'd be proud to have you. He glanced around quickly. John Bartlett was to referee, and the big red-headed man was already in the ring. Parson Hatfield, wearing a huge walker colt, lounged behind Kilkenny's corner. Runyon was a short distance away, and near him was Quince Hatfield. O'Hara was to work in Kilkenny's corner also. End of chapter 15 
A Man Called Trent, a Kilkenny novel by Louis L'Amour, in the public domain. Chapter 16 Kilkenny climbed quickly into the ring and slipped off the coat that he'd hung around his shoulders. He heard a low murmur from the crowd. He knew they were sizing him up. Tom Bull Turner was larger by thirty pounds. He was taller, broader, and thicker. A huge man with a round bullet head set on a powerful neck and mighty shoulders. His biceps and forearms were heavy with muscle, and the deltoid development on the end of his shoulders was large. His stomach was flat and solid, and his legs were columns of strength. Kilkenny was lean. His shoulders were broad, and he had the strength of years of living in the open, working, fighting, and struggling. His stomach was flat and corded with muscle, and his shoulders were splendidly muscled. Yet beside the bigger man, he appeared much smaller. Actually, he weighed 200 pounds. Yet scarcely a man present, if asked to guess his weight, would have made it to be any more than 180. Bartlett walked to the center of the ring and raised a huge hand. The rules is no punches below the belt, Hit as long as they have one hand free, no gouging or biting allowed, holding and hitting is fair. When a man falls, is thrown, or is knocked to the floor, the round ends. The fight is to a finish. He strode back, glancing with piercing eyes from Turner to Kilkenny. The call of time was made, and the two men came forward to the scratch. Instantly, Tomble rushed, swinging with both hands. Kilkenny weaved inside and smashed a hard right and left to the body. Then Turner grabbed him and attempted to hurl him onto the canvas. But Kilkenny twisted himself loose and struck with a lightning-like left to the bigger man's mouth. Turner set himself and swung. A left that caught Kilkenny in the chest and knocked him back against the ropes. The crowd let out a roar, but unhurt, Kilkenny slipped away from Turner's charge and landed twice to the ribs. The big man closed in, fainted a left, and caught Kilkenny with a wicked overhand right that hit him on the temple. Groggy, Kilkenny staggered into the ropes, and Turner charged like a bull and struck twice, left and right to Kilkenny's head. Lance clinched and hung on tightly. Then slipping a heel behind Turner's ankle, he tripped him up and threw him hard to the canvas. He walked to his corner, seeing through a mist. They doused him with water, and at the call of time, he came out slowly until almost up to the scratch. Then he lunged forward and landed a hard left to the side of the neck. Tomble took it flat-footed and walked in, apparently unhurt. Kilkenny evaded a right, and then lashed back with both hands, staggering the big man again. Turner lunged forward, hitting Kilkenny with a short right, and then, slipping Kilkenny's left, he grabbed him and threw him to the canvas. The third round opened with both men coming out fast, and walking right together, they began to slug. Then Kilkenny blocked Turner's left and hit him in the body with a right. They broke free, and circling, Kilkenny took a look at the two men sitting with Hale. One was Halloran. The other was a leaner, taller man. Lance evaded the rush, and then clipped Turner with a right. He'd been doing well, but he was no fool. Turner was a fighter, and the big man had not been trying yet. He was just getting warmed up now. He was quite sure that Tom Bull was under orders to beat him, to pound him badly, but to keep him in the ring as long as possible. Hale was to have his revenge, his bloodletting. Tom Bull Turner moved in, landing a powerful left to the head and a right to the body. Kilkenny circled away from Turner's heavy-hitting right. Turner bored in striving to get his hands on the lighter man and to get his fists where he could hit better. He liked to use short punches when standing close. Kilkenny slid away, stabbed a long left to Turner's mouth, fainted, and when Tom Bull swung his right, stepped in and smashed both hands to the body. For all the effect the punches had, he might have been hitting a huge drum. Turner rushed, crowding Kilkenny against the ropes where he launched a storm of crashing, battering blows. 
One fist caught Kilkenny over the eye, and another crashed into the pit of his stomach. Then a clubbing right hit Kilkenny on the kidney, and he staggered away. And Turner, his big fist poised, crowded closer. He swung for the head, and Kilkenny ducked the right, but caught a chopping blow from the left that started the blood flowing from a cut over one eye. Kilkenny backed away, and Turner rushed and floored Kilkenny with a smashing right. Dixon worked over the eye rapidly and skillfully. Kilkenny found time to be surprised at his skill. Watch that right, O'Hara said. It's bad. Kilkenny moved up to the scratch and then sidestepped just in time to Miss Turner's bull rush. He stepped in and stabbed a left to the head, then Tombow got in close and hurled him to the canvas again. Taking the rest on the stool, Kilkenny relaxed. Then, at the call... He came to scratch again, and suddenly, leaping in, he smashed two rocking blows to Turner's jaw. The big man staggered, and before he could recover, Kilkenny stepped in, stabbed a hard left to the mouth, then hooked a powerful right to the body. Turner tried to get his feet under him, but Kilkenny was relentless. He smashed a left to the mouth and a right to the body, and landed both hands to the body as Turner hit the ropes. Tombow braced himself, and summoning his tremendous strength, he bolted in close, literally hurling Kilkenny across the ring, and then followed with a rush. The crowd was on its feet now, and Kilkenny fainted, and then smashed a powerful right to the ribs. Turner tried a left, and pushing it aside, Kilkenny stepped in with a wicked left uppercut to the wind, and Turner staggered. The crowd, still on its feet, was yelling for Kilkenny. He shook Turner with a right, but Tomble set himself and threw a mighty right that caught Kilkenny coming in and flattened him on the canvas. When he got to his corner, he could see that the crowd was excited. He was badly shaken, but not dazed by the blow. Suddenly, he was on his feet, and before anyone could realize what was happening, he had stepped across to the ringside where Hale sat with two officials. Gentlemen, he said swiftly, I have little time. I'm fighting here today because it's the only way I could get to speak to you. I'm one of the dozen nesters who filed on claims among the peaks. Claims from which Hale is unlawfully trying to drive us. One man has been cruelly murdered. The call of time interrupted. He wheeled to see Tom Bull charging, and he slid away along the ropes. Then Turner hit him and he staggered, but Turner lunged close, unwilling to let him fall. Shoving him back against the ropes, Turner shoved a left to his chin, and then clubbed a powerful right. Blasting pain seared across Kilkenny's brain. He saw that right go up again, and he knew that he could never survive another such punch. With all his strength, he jerked away. Turner intended to kill him now. In a daze, he could see Hale was on his feet, as were the officials. Cub Hale had a hand on his gun, and Parson Hatfield was facing him across the ring. Then Kilkenny jerked loose. But Turner was on him like a madman, clubbing, striking with all his mighty strength, trying to batter Kilkenny into helplessness before the round ended. The crowd was in a mighty uproar, and in a haze of pain and waning consciousness, Kilkenny saw Steve Runyon had slipped behind Cub Hale and had a gun on him. Somebody was shouting outside the ring, and then Turner hit him again, and he broke away from Tom Bull and crashed to the canvas. O'Hara carried him bodily to his corner, where Dixon working over him like mad. The call of time came, and Kilkenny staggered to his feet, and had taken but one step toward the mark when Tomble hit him like a hurricane, sweeping him back to the ropes with a whirlwind of staggering, pounding, and battering blows. Weaving, swaying, slipping, and ducking punches, Kilkenny tried to weather the storm. Somehow, he slipped under a right to the head and got in close. Spreading his legs wide, he began to slug, both hands going into the big man's body. The crowd had gone mad now, but he was berserk. The huge man was fighting like a madman, eager for the kill, and Kilkenny was suddenly lost to everything but the battering fury of the fight and the lust to put the big man down and keep him down. Slipping a left, he smashed another wicked right to the ribs, and then another, and another. Driving in, he refused to let Turner get set, and smashed him with punch after punch. 
Turner threw him off, but he leapt in again, got Tomble's head in a chancery with a crude headlock, and then proceeded to batter blow after blow into the big man's face, before Turner did a back somersault to break free and end the round. Panting, gasping for every breath when each stabbed like a knife, Kilkenny swung to the ropes. We've been refused few food in Cedar Bluff, Kilkenny shouted hoarsely at the officials. We sent wagon to Blazer, and three men were waylaid and killed. On a second attempt, we succeeded in getting a little, but only after a pitched battle. The call of time came and he wheeled. Turner was on him with a rush, his face bloody and wild. Kilkenny set himself and struck hard with a left that smashed Turner's nose, and then a wicked right that rocked Turner to his heels. Faster than the big man, he carried less weight, and was tiring less rapidly. Also, the pounding of his body blows had weakened the bigger man. Close in, they began to slug. But here, too, despite Turner's massive strength, Kilkenny was the better man. He was faster, and he was beating the big man to the punch. Smashing a wicked left to the chin, Kilkenny stepped in and hooked both hands hard to the body. Then he brought up an uppercut that ripped a gash across Turner's face. Before Tom Bull could get set, Kilkenny drove after him with smashing volleys of hooks and swings that had the big man reeling. Everyone was yelling now, yelling like madmen, but Turner was gone. Kilkenny was on him like a panther. He drove him into the ropes, and holding him there, he struck the big man three times in the face. Then Tomble broke loose and swung a right that Kilkenny took in his stride. He smashed Turner back on his heels with a big right of his own. The big man started to fall, and Kilkenny whipped both hands to his face with cracking force. Turner went down, rolled over, and lay still. In an instant, Kilkenny was across the ring. Grabbing his guns, he strapped them on. His fists were battered and swollen, but he could still hold a gun. He caught a quick glimpse of Nita, and Brigo was hurrying her from the crowd. Parson and Quincy Hatfield closed in beside him, guns drawn. "'I'll have to go with you,' Dixon said. "'If I stay now, they'll kill me.' "'Come on, Kilkenny,' said grimly. "'We can use you.' Backing after them, Runyon kept Cub Hale at the end of his gun. The younger Hale's face was white." And then, as Hale cowhands began to gather, a mob of miners surged between them. "'Go ahead!' a big miner shouted. "'We'll stand by you!' Kilkenny smiled suddenly, and swinging away from his men, he walked directly toward the crowding cowhands. Muttering sullenly, they broke ahead of him, and he strode up to King Bill Hale. The big rancher was pale. His eyes were cold as ice and bitter. Halloran stood behind him. The tall, cool-eyed man stood nearby. I'll take my fifteen thousand dollars now, Kilkenny said quietly. His face sullen and stiff, Hale counted out the money and thrust it at him. Kilkenny turned then, bowed slightly to Halloran and the other man, and said quietly, What I have told you here, gentlemen, is true. I wish you would investigate the claims of Hale to our land, and our own filings upon that land. Turning, he walked back to the miners, mounted, and rode off with the Hatfields, O'Hara, and Runyon close about him. We'll have to move fast now, Kilkenny said. What happens will happen quick. What can he do, Runyon asked. We got our story across. Supposin', when they come back to investigate, there aren't any of us left, Kilkenny demanded. What could anybody do about that? There'd be no witnesses. And even if they asked a lot of questions, it wouldn't do us any good. The big fight will come now. They rode hard and fast, sticking to little-known trails through the brush. They threaded the bottom of the twisted, broken canyon and curled along a path that led to the sloping shoulder of a rocky hill among the cedars. Kilkenny rode with his rifle across the saddle in front of him, with one hand always ready to swing it up. He was under no misapprehension about King Bill. The man had been defeated again, and he would be frantic now. His ego was sadly battered, and to prove himself that he was still the power of Cedar Valley country, he must wipe out this trouble from the earth. He would have lost much. 
knowing the man, and knowing the white lightning that lay beneath the surface of cub hail, he knew the older man must have more than once cautioned the slower, surer method. But now cub would be ranting for a shootout. Kilkenny knew that he'd gauged that young man correctly. He was spoiled. The son of a man of power, he'd ridden wild and free, and had grown more arrogant by the year, taking what he wanted and killing those who thwarted him. Dunn and Ravitz would be with him, he knew, and that trio was poison itself. He was no fool. He believed he could beat Hale, yet he had no illusions about beating all three. There was, of course, the chance of catching them offside as he caught the Brockmans that day in Cottonwood. The Brockmans! Like a flash, he remembered Kane. The big man was free to come gunning for him now. End of chapter 16 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour In the Public Domain Chapter 17 Winding around a saddle trail leading into a deep gorge, they came out on the sandy bottom. He speeded their movement to a rapid trot, despite himself. He was worried. At the cup, there were only Jesse and Saul Hatfield, Bartram and Jackie Moffat. Suppose Hale had taken that moment to sweep down upon them and shoot it out? With luck, the defenders might hold the cup, but if the brakes went against them... He turned his horse up a steep slope toward the pines. Ahead of him suddenly there was a rifle shot. Just one. It sounded loudly and clearly in the canyon. Yet he heard no bullet. As if, by command, the little cavalcade spread out and rode up through the trees. It was Kilkenny who swept around the clump of scrub pine and saw several men scrambling for their horses. He reined in and dropped for the ground. A rifle shot chunked into the trunk of the pine beside him, but he fired. One of the riders dropped his rifle and grabbed for the saddle horn, and then they swept into the trees. He got off three carefully spaced shots, heard Runyon off to the left opening up, and then farther along Parson himself. He wheeled the buckskin and rode the yellow horse toward the canyon, yelling his name as he swept into the cup. What he saw sent his face white with fear. Jesse Hatfield lay sprawled full length on the hard-packed ground of the cup, the slow curl of blood trickling out from under his arm and a bloody gash on his head. As he reined in alongside Jesse, the door of the house burst open, and Jackie Moffat came running out. They hit us about two hours ago, Jackie said excitedly. They nicked Bart, too. Kilkenny dropped to his knees, beside Hatfield and turned him gently. One bullet had grazed his scalp, and another had gone through his chest high up. He looked at the wound and the bubbling froth on the man's lips, and his jaw tightened. Price Dixon swung down beside him, and kneeling over Hatfield, he examined the wound. Kilkenny's eyes narrowed as he saw the gambler's fingers working over him with an almost professional skill. He quickly cut away the cloth and examined the wound. We'll have to get him inside, he said gravely. I've got to operate. Operate? Parson Hatfield stared at him. Are you a doc? Dixon smiled wryly. I was once, he said. Maybe I still am. Ma Hatfield came to the door bearing a rifle, and then putting it down, she turned and walked back inside. When they brought the wounded man in, a bed was ready for him. Her lawn, long, thin-cheeked face was grave, and only her eyes showed pain and shock. She worked swiftly and without hysteria. Sally Crane was working over the wound in Bartram's arm. Her own face was white. Kilkenny motioned for Parson and stepped outside. I've got to go back tonight and get Nita, he said quietly. I'll go alone. You better take help. There's enough of us now to hold this place. But you have a fight down to Cedar Bluff, and don't forget Kane Brockman. I won't. By night I can make it, I think. This is all coming to a head, Parson. They can't wait now. We've called their hand and raised them, and they never figured on me talking. 
They never figured on me winning that fight. All right, Parson said. We'll stand by. He looked down at the ground for a moment. I reckon, he said slowly, that we've done a good day's work. I got me a man back on the trail, too. Jackie says Jesse got one up on the rim. A couple more were nicked. It's going to spoil their appetite for fighting and spoil it a heap. Yeah, Kilkenny agreed. I'm riding at sundown, Parson. Yet it was after sundown before he got started. Jesse Hatfield was in a bad way. Price Dixon had taken a compact packet of tools from his saddlebags, and the operation had been quick and skilled. His gambler's work had kept his hands well, and he showed it now. Kilkenny glanced at him, curiosity in his eyes. At one time, this man had been a fine surgeon. He was never surprised, though. In the West, he found strange men. Noblemen from Europe, wanders from fine old families, veterans of several wars, schoolboys, and the boys who'd grown up along the cattle trails. Doctors, lawyers, men of brilliance, and men with none. All had thronged West, looking for what the romantic called adventure, and the experienced knew was trouble. We're looking for a new home, for a change, or escaping from something. Price Dixon was one of these. The man was observant, shrewd, and cultured. He and Kilkenny had known each other from the first. Not as men who came from the same life, but men from the same stratagem of society. There are men of the lost legion, the kind who must always move. Despite his lack of practice, Dixon's moves were sure and his hands were skilled. He removed the bullet from dangerously near the spine. When he was finished, he washed his hands and looked up at Parson. He'll live with rest and treatment. Beef broth is what he needs now to build the strength in him. Parson grinned behind his gray mustache. He'll get it, he said dryly. He'll get it as long as King Bill Hale has a steer on the range. Sally Crane caught Kilkenny as he was saddling the little gray horse that he was riding that night. She hurried up to him and then stopped suddenly and stood there, shifting her feet from side to side. Kilkenny turned and looked at her curiously from under his flat-brimmed hat. What's the trouble, Sally? I wanted to ask. She hesitated, and he could sense her shyness. Do you think I'm old enough to marry? To marry? He stopped, startled. Why, uh, I don't know, Sally. How old are you? I'm sixteen, most nigh seventeen. That's young, he conceded. But I've heard Ma Hotfield say that she was just sixteen when she married. And down in Kentucky and Virginia, many a girl marries at that age. Why? I reckon I want to marry, Sally said shyly. Ma Hatfield said that I should ask you. Said you was Daddy Moffat's friend, and you was sort of my guardian. Me? He was thunderstruck. Well, I reckon I never thought of it that way. Who wants to marry you, Sally? It's Bart. You love him, he asked. He suddenly felt strangely old. And yet, looking at the young girl standing there so shyly, he felt more than ever before at the vast loneliness that there was in him, and also a strange tenderness such as he'd never known before. Yes, her voice was shy. He could sense the excitement in her, though, and the happiness. Well, Sally, he said slowly, I reckon I'm as much of a guardian as you've got now. But I think if you love Bartram, and he loves you, that's all that's needed. I know him. He's a fine, brave, serious young fellow who's going to do right well as soon as this trouble clears up. Yes, I reckon you can marry him. And then she was gone, running. <laughs> For a few minutes, he stood there, one foot in the stirrup. Then he swung his leg over the gray horse and shook his head in astonishment. That's one thing, Lance, he told himself, that you never expected to happen to you. But as he turned his horse into the pines, he remembered the Hatfields digging the grave for their brother. 
Men died, men were married, and the fighting and living and working went on. And so it always would go. Lige Hatfield was gone. Miller and Wilson were gone. And Jesse Hatfield lay near death in the cabin in the cup. Yet, Sally was to marry Tom Bartram. And they were to build a home. Yes, this was the country, and these were its people. They had the strength to live, the strength to endure. And in such a country, men would be born. Men who loved liberty, and who would ever fight to preserve it. The little gray was as sure-footed as a mountain goat. Even the long-legged yellow horse could walk no more silently, no more skillfully than this little mountain horse. He talked to it in a low whisper and watched the ears flick backward with intelligence. This was a good horse. Yet, when he reached the edge of Cedar Bluff, he reined in sharply. Something was wrong. There was a vague smell of smoke in the air. The atmosphere of uneasiness seemed to hang over the town. He looked down, studying the place. Something was wrong. Something had changed. It was not only the emptiness left after a crowd is gone. This was something else. And this something made him uneasy. He moved the gray horse forward slowly, keeping to sandy places where the horse would make no sound. The black bulk of a building loomed before him, and he rode up beside it and swung down. The smell of wood smoke was stronger. And then he peered around the corner of the building. Where the Mecca had stood, there was only a heap of charred ruins. Hale's place burned. He scowled, trying to imagine what could have happened. An accident? It could be, yet something warned him that this was not that. And more, that this town wasn't asleep. Keeping to the side of buildings, he walked forward a little. There was a faint light in Burt Leather's store. The Crystal Palace was dark. He went back to the gray horse, and carefully skirting the troubled area, he came in from behind the building, and then he swung down. A man loomed ahead of him, a huge bulk of a man. His heart seemed to stop, and he froze against the building. It was Kane Brockman. Watching, Kilkenny saw him moving with incredible stealth, slip into the side of the Crystal Palace, work for an instant at the door, and then disappear inside. Like a ghost, Kilkenny crossed that alley and went in the door fast. And there, he flattened against the wall. He could hear the big man ahead of him, but only his breathing. Stealthily, he crept after. What would Brockman be doing here? Was he after Nita? Or was he hoping to find him? He crept along and closed the door after him. He lost Brockman in the stillness, and then suddenly a candle gleamed and then another. The first person he saw was Nita. She was standing there in a riding costume, staring at him. You've come, Lance? She said softly. Then it was you I heard? No, he spoke softly. It wasn't me. Kane Brockman's here. A shadow moved against the curtain at the side of the room, and Kane Brockman stepped into the open. Yeah, he said softly, I'm here. He continued to move, coming around the card tables until he stood near, scarcely a dozen feet away. The curtains were drawn on all the windows, thick drapes that kept all light within. If he lived to be a thousand, Lance Kilkenny would never forget that room. It was large and rectangular. Along one side ran the bar. The rest, except for a small dance floor where they stood now, was littered with tables and chairs. Here and there were fallen chips, cards, cigarette butts, and glasses. A balcony surrounded the room on three sides, a balcony with curtained booths. Only candles flickered in the great room, candles that burned brightly but with wavering, uncertain light. The girl held the candles. Nita Riordan, with her dark hair gathered against the nape of her neck, her eyes unusually large in the dimness. Opposite Kilkenny stood the bulk of Kane Brockman. 
His big black hat was shoved back on his huge head. His thick neck descended into powerful shoulders, and the check shirt was open to expose a hairy chest. Crossed gun belts and big pistols completed the picture, guns that hung just beneath the open hands. Kane stood there, his flat face oily and unshaven in the vague light, his stance wide, his feet in their riding boots seeming unusually small. Yeah, Kane repeated, I'm here. Kilkenny drew a deep breath. Suddenly a wave of hopelessness spread over him. He could kill this man, he knew it. Yet why kill him? Kane Brockman had come here looking for him. Had come because it was the code of the life that he'd lived, and because the one anchor he had, his brother Abel, had pulled loose. Suddenly, Kilkenny saw Kane Brockman as he'd never seen him before. As a big man, simple and earnest. A man who drifted along darker trails because of some accident of fate, and whose one tie his brother had been cut loose. He saw him now as a big and helpless man, and rather lost. To kill Kilkenny was his only purpose in life. Abruptly, Kilkenny dropped his hands away from his guns. Cain, he said, I'm not going to shoot it out with you. I'm not going to kill you. I'm not even going to try. Cain, there's no sense in you and me shooting it out. Not a mite. What do you mean? The big man's brow was furrowed. His eyes narrowed with thought as he tried to decide what deception was in this. I don't want to kill you, Cain. You and your brother teamed up with the wrong crowd in Texas, and because of that I had to kill them. You looked for me, and I had to fight it out with you and whip you. I didn't want to then, and I don't now, Cain. I owe something to those people up there, the Hatfields and the rest. They want homes out here. I've got a reason to fight for them. If I kill, it'll be for that, and if I die... It'll be to keep their land for them. There's nothing to gain for you or me by shooting it out. Suppose you kill me, what will you do then? Cain hesitated, staring, puzzled. Why, right out of here. Go back to Texas. And then? Go to Ryden, I guess. Maybe, for a while. But then some hombre will come along, you'll rustle a few cows, and you'll rob a stage... And one time, they'll get you like they got Sam Bass. You'll get shot down or you'll hang. I'm not going to shoot you, Kane. And you're too good a man to draw iron on a man who won't shoot. You're a good man, Kane. Just a good man on the wrong trail. And you've got too much good stuff in you to die the way that you'll die. Kane Brockman stared at him. And in the flickering of candlelight, Kilkenny waited. He was afraid for the first time. Afraid that his words would fail, and the big man would go for his gun. He didn't want to kill him. But he knew that his own gunman's instinct would make him draw if Kane went for a gun. Kane Brockman stood stock still in the center of the room. And then he lifted a hand to his face and pawed at his grizzled chin. Well, I'll be damned, he muttered. I'll be eternally damned. He shook his head, turned unsteadily, and lurched into the darkness toward the door. End of chapter 17 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour In the Public Domain Chapter 18 Kilkenny stepped back and wiped the sweat from his brow. Nita crossed the room to him her face radiant with relief. Oh, Lance, she exclaimed, that was wonderful, wonderful. Kilkenny grinned dazedly. It was awful, just plain awful. He glanced around. What happened here? Where's Brigo? He's in my room, Lance, Nita said quickly. I was going to tell you, but Brockman came. He's hurt very badly. Brigo hurt? It seemed impossible. What happened? It was those two gunmen of Hale's. Cub sent them here after me. Brigo met them right here, and they shot it out. 
He killed both Dunn and Ravitz, but he was hit three times, once through the body. What happened to the Mecca? What happened in town? That was before Dunn and Ravitz came. Some miners were in the Mecca, and they were all drinking. A miner had some words with a hail gunman about the fight and about the nesters. The miner spoke very loudly, and I guess he said what he thought about hail. The gunman reached for a gun, and the miner hit him with a bottle. It was awful. It was a regular battle. The miners against the hail hands. It was bloody and terrible. Some of the hail riders liked your fight and your attitude, and they quit. The miners drove the others out of the Mecca and burned it to the ground. And then the miners and the hail riders fought all up and down the streets. But no one was killed. Nobody used a gun then. I guess all of them were afraid of what might happen. And the miners? Kilkenny asked quickly. They mounted up and got into wagons and rode out of town on the way back to their claims. It's been like a ghost town since then. Nobody stirred on the streets. They're littered with bottles, broken windows, and clubs. And then everything was quiet until Dunn and Rabbits came. What about Hale? King Bill, I mean. We've only heard rumors. Some of the cowhands who quit stopped by here to get drinks. They said that Hale acts like a man who's lost his mind. He'd been here after the fight, before he went home. He asked me to marry him, and I refused. He said he would try to take me, and I told him that Brigo would kill him if he tried. And then he went away. It was afterward that Cub sent some gunmen for me. He wanted me for himself. Something has happened to Hale. He doesn't even look like the same man. You won $15,000 from him and he paid you. But he lost money to the miners, too. And to Kane Brockman. It hit him hard. He's a man who's always won. Always had things his own way. He isn't used to being thwarted. He isn't used to adversity, and he can't take it. Then before he left, Halloran told him that he would have to let the law decide about the nesters. And Hale declared that he was the law. Halloran told him that he would find out that he was not, and that if he'd ordered the killing of Dick Moffat, that he would hang. And then? He seemed broken. He just seemed to go to pieces. I think he'd ruled here these past ten years, and that he actually believed he was king, that he had the power, and nothing could win against him. Everything had gone just as he wanted until you came along. You mean, Kilkenny said dryly, until he tried to turn some good Americans out of their homes. Well, anyway, you'd managed to get the food from here, right under his nose. And then when the attempt along the Blazer Trail was tried, he practically wiped your men out and was supremely confident. But his attack at the cup failed. And what really did it was your defeat of Turner. And at that moment, when he'd finished paying off... He was told for the first time at the death of Soderman at Blazer. Then some of the cowhands who quit took the opportunity to drive off almost a thousand head of cattle. These defeats, and what Halloran told him, have completely demoralized the man. What about Cub? He's wild. He hated you. And he was furious that some of the men quit. He doesn't care about Halloran. For he's completely lawless. He's taken a dozen of the toughest men and gone after the stolen cattle. Good, that means we have some time. Kilkenny took her by the arms. Nita, you can't stay here. He might just come back. You must go to the cup and send Price Dixon down here. He can do something for Brigo. Tell him to get here as fast as he can, and you'll be safe there. But you? Nita protested. He smiled gently and put his hand on her head. Don't worry about me, Nita. I've lived this way for years. I'll do what I can for Jamie, but hurry. She hesitated only an instant. Then suddenly, on tiptoe, she kissed him lightly on the lips and turned toward the door. Just take my horse, he said. It'll be quicker. The little gray. Give him his head and he'll go right back to the cup. I got him from Parson Hatfield. Nita was gone. Kilkenny turned swiftly and took a look around the darkened room, and then he walked through the door and over to the bed where Brigo lay. The big yakky was asleep. 
He was breathing deeply, and his face was pale. When Kilkenny laid a hand on his brow, he was hot to the touch. Yet he was resting, and better off left alone. Kilkenny walked back into the main room and checked his guns by the candles. And then he got Brigo's guns, reloaded them, and hunted around. He found two more rifles, a double-barreled shotgun, and many shells, and two more pistols. He loaded them all and placed the pistols in a neat row on the bar. One he thrust into his waistband, leaving his own guns in their holsters. And then he doused the candles and sat down in Brigo's chair by the door. It would be a long time until morning. Twice during the long hours he got up and paced restlessly about the great room, staring out into the vague dimness of the night at the ghostly street. It was deathly still. Once, something outside sounded, but he was out of his chair, gun in hand. When he tiptoed to the window, he saw that it was merely a lonely burrow wandering aimlessly in the dead street. Toward morning, he slept a little, only restlessly and in snatches, every nerve alert for t trouble or some sound that would warn of danger. When it was growing gray in the street, he went in to look at the wounded man. Brigo had opened his eyes and was lying there. He looked feverish. Kilkenny changed the dressing on the wound after bathing it, and then checked the two flesh wounds. Signor, is it bad? Brigo asked, turning his big black eyes toward Kilkenny. Not very. You lie still. Dixon is coming down. Dixon? Brigo was puzzled. Yeah, he used to be a good a doctor. He's good, too. A strange man. Suddenly, alarm came into Brigo's eyes. And the senorita? I sent her to the cup, to the Hatfields. She'll be safe there. Bueno, cub. Has he not come? No, you'd better rest and lay off the talk. Don't worry. If they come, I've got plenty of guns. He put a water bucket close by the bed and a tin cup on the table. And then he went out into the saloon. In the gray light of dawn, it looked garish and tawdry. Empty glasses lying about, scattered poker chips. Idly, he began to straighten things up a little. And then, after making a round of the windows, he went to the kitchen and started a fire. Then he put on water for coffee. Cub Hale would come. It might take him a few hours or a few days to find the herd. He might grow impatient and return here first. He would believe that Nita was still here, and that his gunman had not returned. Or he might send some men. Nita would not go over the trail as fast as he or the Hatfields, but if all was well at the cup, the earliest Price could get here would be midday. No one moved in the street. The gray dawn made it look strange and lonely in its emptiness. Somewhere behind one of the houses, he heard the squeaking of a pump handle and then the clatter of a tin pail. His eyelids drooped and he felt very tired. He shook himself awake and walked to the kitchen. The water was ready, so he made coffee, strong and black. Brigo was awake when he came in, and the big man took the coffee gratefully. Bueno, he said. Kilkenny noticed that the man had somehow managed to reach his gun belt and had his guns on the table. Any pain, he asked. Brigo shrugged, and after a look at him, Kilkenny walked out. Out in the main room of the saloon, he looked thoughtfully around. Then he searched until he found a hammer and some nails. Getting loose some lumber from the back room, he nailed boards over the windows, leaving only a narrow space as a loophole, from which each side of the building might be observed, and then he prepared breakfast. Work on breakfast showed him how dangerously short of food they were. He thrust his head in the door and saw Brigo's eyes open. We're short of grub and might have to stand a siege. I'm going down to leather store. The street was empty when he peered out of the door, and he took a step out onto the porch. One would have thought that the town was deserted. There was no sound now. Even the squeaky pump was still. 
He stepped down into the street and walked slowly along, little puffs of dust rising at each step. And then he went up on the boardwalk, and there was still no sign of life. The door to leather store was closed. He rattled the knob, and there was no response. Without further hesitation, he put his shoulder to the door, picked up on the knob, and shoved. It held, but then he set himself and lunged. The lock burst, and the door swung inward. Almost instantly, Leathers appeared from the back of the store. Here, he exclaimed angrily, you can't do this. When I rattled the door, you should have opened it, Kilkenny said quietly. I need some supplies. I told you once I couldn't sell to you, Leathers protested. Kilkenny looked at him with disgust. You're a yellow belly, Leathers, he said quietly. Why did you ever come west? You're built for a neat little civilized community where you can knuckle under authority and crawl every time somebody looks at you. We don't like that here in the West. He picked up a slab of bacon and thrust it into his sack. Then he began piling more groceries into the burlap sack until it was full. He took some money and dropped it on the counter, and then he turned to go. Leather stood watching him angrily. Hale will get you for this, he snapped out. Kilkenny turned patiently. Leathers, you're a fool. Can't you realize that Hale is finished? That whole setup is finished, and you sided with him. So you're finished. You're the kind that always has to bow to authority. You think money is everything, and power is everything. You've spent your life living in the shadows and cringing before bigger men. A good part of it, it is due to that sanctimonious wife of yours. If King Bill smiled at her, she'd walk in a daze for hours. It's because she's a snob and you're a weakling. Take a tip from me. Take what cash you've got, load up some supplies, and get out of here and fast. And leave my store? Leathers wailed. What do you mean? What I say? Kilkenny's voice was harsh. There's going to be some doings in this town before another day. Hale's riders are coming back and Cub Hale will be leading them. You know how much respect he has for property, or anything? If he doesn't clear you out, the Hatfields will. There is no place for you in Cedar Bluff anymore. We want to build from the ground up, and we want men who will fight for what they believe. You won't, and you are against us, so get out. He walked back down the silent street and into the saloon and stored his grub. Despite himself, he was worried. The morning was early yet, and he was expecting some of the hail riders, and soon. The longer he waited, the more worried he became. Brigo needed medical attention, and Doc Pollard, the hail henchman, had gone to the hail ranch. He was little better than useless anyways. Seated at a table, he riffled the cards, and the sound was loud in the room. No one moved in the deserted street, and he played silently, smoking endless cigarettes and waiting. Again and again, his thoughts returned to Nita. After all, should he wait? Supposing he was killed eventually. Why not have a little happiness first? He knew without asking that she was the girl for him, and he knew that she would marry him in an instant and be completely happy to live in a house built among the high peaks. She was lovely, tender, and thoughtful. A man could ask for no more of any woman than what she had for the giving. Yet he remembered the faces of other gunmen's wives when the word came that their men had died. He remembered their faces when their men went down in the streets, when they waited through every lonely hour, never sure whether they would come back or not. Bartram had Sally Crane, and he remembered her sweet, youthful face, flushed with happiness. It made him feel old and lonely. He slipped his guns out and checked them once more. Then he took up the cards and shuffled them again. Suddenly, an idea came to him. He got up and went to the back door, took a quick look around, and slipped out to the stable. There were still horses there. He had a hunch that he might need them and he saddled, too. Then he went back inside and closed the door. The place was desolately still, and the air was close and hot. 
It felt like a storm was impending. He brushed the sweat from his brow and crossed to have a look at Rigo. The big man was sleeping, but his face was flushed and feverish. He looked poor. He glanced out the door at the empty street. Clouds were building up around the peaks. If it rained, it was going to make it tough to move, Jamie Brigo. Thunder rumbled, like a whimper of far-off trumpets. And then deeper, like the rolling of gigantic casks along the floor of a cavern. He walked back inside and sat down. End of chapter 18 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis L'Amour in the Public Domain Chapter 19 They came down the dusty street at high noon, a tight little cavalcade of men expecting no trouble. They rode as tired men ride, for there was dust on their horses and dust on their clothing and dust on their wide-brimmed hats. It was only their guns that had no dust. There was no humor in them, for they were men for whom killing was the order of business. The softer members of the Hale outfit were gone, and these were the pick of the rough, gun-handy crew. Lee Wright was in the lead, riding a blood bay. At his right, and a bit behind, was Jeff Nabell, and a bit behind him were the gunslick Tandy Wade and Kurt Wilde. There were ten in all, ten tough, gun-belted men riding into Cedar Bluff when the sun was high. Dunn and Ravitz had not returned, and what that meant they could not know, nor did they care. They'd come to get a woman, and if Dunn and Ravitz decided to keep her, these men would take her away. If those two had failed in their mission, then they were to take her from the protection of Brigo. They had their orders, and they knew what to do. Near Leather's store, the group broke. Three men rode on down to the Crystal Palace. Lee Wright, big, hard-faced, and cruel, was in the lead. With him were Kurt Wilde and Tandy Wade. His eyes slanting up the street at the scattering men, Kilkenny let the three come on. When they reined in and were about to swing down, Kilkenny stopped them. Hold it, he said sharply. What do you want, Wright? Wright froze and then settled back into the saddle. Who's that? he demanded, peering to see under the darkness of the sheet metal awning and into the vagueness of the doorway. It's Kilkenny, he said. What do you want? We've come for that woman. Cub wants her, Wright said harshly. What are you doing here? Me? Kilkenny chuckled quietly. His eyes were cold and watchful. He knew these men were uncertain. They hadn't expected him. Now they did not know what the situation was. How many were there inside? Was Brigo there, the Hatfields? Kilkenny knew that their lack of knowledge was half of his strength. Why, I've been waiting for you boys to show up. Wanting to tell you that I'd slope if I were you. The Hales are through. Are they? Wright's eyes swept the building. Those boarded up windows bothered him. We came after the woman and we'll get her. Kilkenny began building a smoke. With only ten men? It ain't enough, right? He touched his tongue to the paper. You're a fighting man, right? Ever try to take a place like this with no more men than you've got? You're bluffing, Wright said. You're alone. Kilkenny chuckled. You reckon I'd come down here alone? Or that the Hatfields would let me? They're right careful of me, right? Where are they, Wright declared. You... The words died on his lips as there was a tinkle of glass from down the building. Wright looked, and Kilkenny saw his face darken. It could mean but one thing. Brigo had gotten out of bed and thrust a rifle through the window at the right moment. But how long could he stand there? The man was weak. Kilkenny laughed. Well, you can start coming any time you want, Wright. But a lot of you boys are going to die for nothing. If you think Hale can pay off now, you're wrong. Kurt Wilde had been sitting quietly. Now he exploded suddenly. To hell with this! Let's go in there! He jumped his horse to one side and grabbed for his gun. Kilkenny's hand swept down, and his gun was barking before it reached belt high. The first shot cut the rearing horse's bridle at the bit and whined off into the street. The second took Wilde in the shoulder and knocked him sprawling into the dust. 
At that same instant, Brigo fired, and Tandy Wade's horse backed up and suddenly went down. Wade leaped clear and sprinted with Lee Wright for the shelter of the nearest building. From up the street there was a volley of shots, but Kilkenny was safely inside. With one quick look, he dodged away from the door and ran to Brigo in the other room. The big man's face was deathly pale, and his movements had started his wounds bleeding. Lie down, damn it, Kilkenny commanded. You did your part, you fooled him, now lie down. No, senor, not when you fight. I can hold him now. Lie down and rest till I need you. When they rush, I'll need help. Brigo hesitated and then sank back on the bed. From where he lay, he could see through a crack in the boards without moving. Lance grabbed a box of shells and dropped them on the bed beside him and handed him another rifle. And then he went back and made a round of the loopholes. He fired from one, skipped one, and fired from the next. He made the rounds hunting for targets, but trying to keep the shots mixed so they would be in doubt. Wilde was getting up and Kilkenny watched him, letting him go. Suddenly, the man wheeled and blasted at the door, and Brigo, lying on his bed, drilled him through the chest. One down, Kilkenny told himself, and nine to go. He was under no illusions. They could trade shots for a while, and he'd fool Wright and the Hale Riders for a few hours, perhaps. But they were much too shrewd to be fooled for long. Sooner or later, they would guess. And then, under the cover of an attack from one direction... They'd drive from the other, and the whole thing would end up in a wicked red lace blasting inside the palace. Kilkenny found a good place near a window, where he could watch up the street towards Leather's store. The dusty street was empty. He waited, and suddenly he saw a man slip around the corner of the store and dart for the door. He fired quickly, twice. The first shot hit the man about waist high, but on the outside, and probably near his holster. He staggered, and Kilkenny fired again and saw the fellow go down to one knee. He crawled through the door. The first shot had not been a disabling one, he was sure, but the second, when he aimed at the thigh, had brought the man down. He got up restlessly and started for the back of the saloon. There was no movement, but when he moved to the door, a bullet clipped the door jam right over his head, and had he not been crouched, it probably would have been dead center. No chance to get to the horses then, not by day anyway. The afternoon wore on, and there were occasional shots. And then with a rush, finally. It had been quiet, and then a sudden volley blasted at the back of the store. Taking a chance, Kilkenny rushed to the front just in time to see half a dozen men charging across the street. He dropped his rifle, whipped out both guns, and leaped into the doorway. His first shot was dead center. A bullet fired from the hip that hit a hail man and knocked him rolling. His guns roaring and blasting, he smelled the acrid odor of gunpowder, felt a red-hot whip laid across his cheek, and knew he'd been grazed. Then he blasted again, felt a gun go empty, and still triggering the first gun, jerked out his belt gun and opened up again. They fell back, and he saw two men were down. He knew neither of them. His cheekbone was burning like fire, and he lifted a hand. It came away bloody. He sopped the wound with his handkerchief, then dropped it and began reloading his guns. This time he brought the shotgun up to the door, and stuffed his pockets full of shotgun shells. The waiting was what got to a man, and he didn't want to wait. He wanted to go out there. There was no firing now. The attacking party was down to seven, and one of those was wounded. They would hesitate a little now. And he still had the shotgun. That was his payoff weapon. He knew what it would do to a man, and hated to use it. At close range, a shotgun wouldn't just make a wound. It blasted a man in two. He showed himself out a window and got no action. He could hear loud voices in leather store. There was some kind of argument. After all, what had they to gain? Suddenly, Kilkenny had an idea. He wheeled and went into the bedroom. Brigo was lying on the bed, breathing hoarsely, and he looked terrible. Lie still and watch, Kilkenny said. I'm going out. Out? Brigo's eyes fired. You? After them? See, with this. He touched the shotgun. They're all in leather store. I'm going to settle this once and for all. He went to the door, and for a long time he studied the terrain. 
He was worried. Price Dixon should be here by now. The Hale men probably knew that he'd joined Kilkenny in the Hatfields. So if he came back, they would shoot him. If Jamie Brigo were to live, he would need Dixon's attention. Kilkenny waited. The sun was making a shadow under the awning, even if not much of a one. He eased outside, listening to the loud voices, and then he left the porch with a rush. There was no shot. He got to the side of leather store. From here, it was a good four steps to the door, and there was no window to pass. He stepped up on the porch, knowing that if he, they had a man across the street, he was gone gosling. He took another step and waited. Inside, the voices continued, and he could hear Lee Wright's voice above all the others. Cub will pay off, all right. If you don't, well, we can always take some cows ourselves. Blazes, somebody said disgustingly. I don't want any cows. I want money. And I want out of this with a whole skin, he added. Personally, a voice drawled. I don't see no percentage in getting a hide full of lead because some other hombre wants a woman. I'll admit that Riordan gal is something to look at. But I think if she wanted to have a hail, she'd take one. I think the gal's crazy for this kill, Kenny. And for my money, she's got the best of the lot. What's it to you, Tandy? Wright demanded. Hale's got the money. He pays us. Besides, that Kilkenny figures he's too darn good. Tandy laughed. Why, Lee, I reckon if you'd go out there and tell him you wanted a shootout, he'd give it to you. Say, Wright jumped to his feet. That's it. That's the way we get him. I'll go out and challenge him. Then when he comes out, pour it onto him. There was a moment of silence, but Kilkenny was just outside the screen door now. Lee, that sure is a polecat's idea. You know darn well I wouldn't have no part of that. I'm a fighting man, not a murderer. Tandy Raid, some day you'll... Wright began angrily. Suppose, Kilkenny said, that I take over from here? Wright froze, his mouth open his face slowly turning white. Only Tandy turned, and he turned very slowly, keeping his hands wide. He looked at the double-barreled shotgun for just an instant. Well, Kilkenny, he said softly, I reckon that shotgun calls my hand. Shotgun? Wright grasped. Kilkenny let him turn. He knew how ugly a double-barreled shotgun can seem when at close quarters. Buckshot in it, too, Kilkenny said lazily. I might not be able to get more than four or five of you hombres. Might not even get one or two. But I'm sure going to get them good. And who wants a hot taste of buckshot? Wright backed up, licking his lips. He didn't want any trouble now. You could see it in his eyes. He knew that shotgun was meant for him, and he didn't want any part of it. Leathers! Kilkenny's voice cracked like whiplash. Come around here and get their guns. Slap their shirts, too. I don't want any sneak guns. The storekeeper, his face dead white, came around and began lifting the guns. No one said a word. When the guns were collected and all laid out at Kilkenny's feet, he stood there for a moment looking at the men. Right, you wanted to trick me and kill me, didn't you? Lee Wright's eyes were wide and dark in the sickly moon of his face. I, I talk too much, he said tight-lipped. I wouldn't have had nerve enough for that. Well? There was a sudden rattle of horses' hooves in the street, and Kilkenny saw Lee Wright's eyes brighten. But as he looked at Kilkenny, his face went sick. Careful, Lee, Kilkenny said quietly. Don't get uneasy. If I go, you go with me. I ain't moving, Wright said hoarsely. For heaven's sake, don't shoot! End of chapter 19 A Man Called Trent A Kilkenny Novel by Louis Lemour In the Public Domain Chapter 20 Now the horses were walking. They stopped before the Crystal Palace. Kilkenny dared not turn. He dared not look. Putting a toe behind the stack of guns, he pushed them back. 
Then, keeping his eyes on the men, he dragged them back farther. Then he waited. Sweat came out on his forehead, and he felt his mouth go dry. They could slip up and come in. They could just walk up. And he dared not turn, or one of these men would leap and have a gun. His only way out was to go out fighting. Looking at the men before him, he could see what was in their minds, and their faces were gray and sick. A shotgun wasn't an easy way to die, and once that gun started blasting, there was no telling who would get hit. And Kilkenny, with an empty shotgun, was still closer to the guns on the floor than they were. The flesh seemed to crawl on the back of Kilkenny's neck, and he saw Wright's tongue, feeling his dry lips. Only Tandy Wade seemed relaxed. The tension was only in his eyes. Any moment now, this room might turn into a bloody bit of hell. The shotgun was going to... A door slammed at the Crystal Palace. Had Brigo passed out? There was no sound, but Kilkenny knew that someone was crossing the dusty space between the buildings. And he was drawing closer now. The sound of a foot on the boardwalk made them all jump. Suddenly, Leather slipped to the floor in a dead faint. Tandy looked down amusedly, and then lifted his eyes as a board creaked. Any moment now, when that door opened, if a friendly voice didn't speak. The door creaked just a little. That was only when it was open wide, though. Kilkenny remembered that door. He'd eased through a crack himself. He lifted the shotgun slightly, his own face gray. Suddenly, he knew that if this was Cub Hale, he would turn this short, this store into a shambles. Kilkenny was going to go out taking a bloody dozen with him. He had these guns, and if the first shot didn't get him, he wasn't going to go alone. He clicked back on the hammers. No! He didn't know who spoke. No, Kilkenny, my God, no! These men who could stand a shootout with perfect composure were frightened and pale at the gaping muzzles of the shotgun. Kilkenny? The voice was behind him, and it was Parson Hatfield. Yeah, Parson, I got me a few restless hombres here. Hatfield came in. Behind him were Bartram and Steve Runyon. Where's Cub? Parson demanded sharply. He cut off for the ranch. He figured Dunn would have the girl there. We didn't find him, Parson said. He must have stopped off on the way. Hale shot himself. He did? Kilkenny turned. What happened at the place? She was plumb deserted, Runyon offered. Not a soul around. Looks as if they all deserted like rats from a sinking ship. He was all alone, and when he seen us coming, he shot himself. What happened then? We set fire to the place. It was too big for any honest rancher. It's burning now. What happens to us, Tandy demanded. Kilkenny looked at them for a minute, but before he could speak, Parson spoke up. We want Jeff Nabell and Lee Wright. They done murdered Miller, Wilson, and Lige. They got Smithers, too. Jeff Nabell killed them. And they was in on the killing of Dick Moffat. We got a rope for them. Take them, then, Kilkenny said. He looked at Tandy Wade. You're too good a man to run with this owl hoot crowd, Wade. You better change your ways before they get a rope on you. Get going. Wade looked up at him. Thanks, man, he said. It's more than I deserve. You, Kilkenny said to the others, ride. If you ever come into this country again, we'll hang you. They scrambled for the door. The Hatfields were already gone with Wright and Nabell. Kilkenny turned away and looked at Leathers, who'd recovered from his faint. You've got twenty-four hours, he said quietly. Take what you can and get out of here and don't come back. He walked out of the store and into the dusty street. A man was coming down the street on a rangy sorrel horse. He looked and then looked again. It was Dan Cooper. A short distance behind him, another man rounded the corner. It was Kane Brockman. They rode straight on until they came up to Kilkenny. Cooper reined in and began to roll a smoke. Looks like I backed the wrong horse, he said. What's the deal? Got a rope for me? Or do I draw a ticket out of here? What do you want? Kilkenny demanded sharply. 
He had his thumbs in his belt watching the two men. Well, Dan said, looking at Kilkenny, we talked it over. We both want won money on your fight. We sort of had an idea that we'd like to join y'all and take up some claims ourselves. There's right, right pretty places up in them meadows, Kane suggested. He sat his horse, looking at Kilkenny. For a long minute, Kilkenny stared from one to the other. Sure, he said finally. You might find a good place up near mine, Kane. And the Moffat place is empty now. He turned and walked back to the palace. He'd forgotten Brigo. Yet, when he entered the place, his worry left him. Price Dixon had come, and Nita had returned with him. She met Kilkenny at the door. He's asleep, she whispered. Dixon got the bullet out, and he's going to be all right. Good. Kilkenny looked at the girl, and then he took her in his arms. He drew her close, and her lips melted into his, and for a long time they stood there holding each other. Oh, Lance, she whispered, don't let me go, keep me now. It's been so long, and I've been so lonely. Sure, he said quietly, I'll keep you now. I don't want to let you go, ever. Slowly, in the days that followed, the town came back to itself. Widows of two of the nesters moved into Leather's house and took over the store. Kilkenny and Bartram helped them get things arranged and get started. The ruins of the Mecca were cleaned away. Van Hawkins, a former actor from San Francisco, came and bought the Crystal Palace from Nita. Kilkenny started to build a bigger, more comfortable house on the site of the old one that the Hales had burned for him. Yet, over it all, there was a restlessness and uneasiness. Kilkenny talked much with Nita in the evenings and saw the dark circles under her eyes. She was sleeping little, he knew. The Hatfields carried their guns all the time, and Steve Runyon came and went with a pistol strapped on. It was because of Cub Hale. No one ever mentioned his name, yet his shadow lay over them all. He'd vanished mysteriously, leaving no trace, nothing to tell them where he'd gone, what he planned to do, or when he would return. Then, one day, Saul Hatfield rode up to Kilkenny's claim. He leaned on the saddle horn and looked down at Lance. "'How's things?' he asked. "'Seems you're doing right well with this house.' Yeah, Kilkenny admitted, it's going up. He looked at Saul. How's your dad? Right pert. Jesse going to dig those potatoes of Smithers? I reckon. He'd like it. He was a saving man. Kilkenny straightened and their eyes met. What's on your mind, Saul? I was riding this morning down on the branch, Saul said thoughtfully. Seen some tracks where a horse crossed the stream. I was right curious, so I followed him for a ways. Found some white hairs on the brush. Cub Hale always rode a white horse. An albino it was. I see. Kilkenny rubbed his jaw. Which way was he heading? Sort of circling. Sizing up the town like. Kilkenny nodded. I reckon I better go down to Cedar Bluff, he said thoughtfully. I want to stick around town for a while. Sure, Saul looked at him. A body could follow them tracks, he suggested. It was a plain trail. Dangerous. He's a bad one. Maybe later, we'll see. Kilkenny mounted the long-legged yellow horse and headed for town. Cub Hale was mean, and he wasn't going to leave. It wasn't in him to leave. He was a man who had to kill even if he died in the process. Kilkenny had known that and he knew some of the men believed that Cub had lit out and left the country. He had never believed that. Cub was prowling, licking his wounds and waiting. The hate in him was building up. Kilkenny rode the yellow buckskin to the little cottage where Nita Riordan and Sally Crane were living together, while Sally prepared for her wedding with Bartram. Nita came to the door, her sewing in hand. Lance, she said quickly, is it? He's close by, he swung down from the horse. I reckon you've got a guest for dinner. 
Sitting by the window with a book, he glanced occasionally down the street. He saw two Hatfields ride in, Quince and Saul. They dismounted at the store. Then Steve Runyon rode in, and after him, Kane Brockman. Brockman rode right on to the palace, dismounted, and went in for a drink. And then he came out and loafed on a bench by the door. He was wearing two guns. The room was bright and cheery, with china plates and curtains at the windows. Nita came in, drying her hands on an apron, and called him to lunch. He took a last look down the street, and then got up and walked in to the table. Sally's face was flushed, and she looked very pretty, yet he had eyes only for Nita. He'd never seen her so lovely as now. Her face looked softer and prettier than he'd ever seen it. She was happy, too, radiantly happy. Even the news of the nearness of Cub Hale had not been able to wipe it from her face. Bartram came in and joined them, and he grinned at Kilkenny. Not often a man gets a chance to try his wife's cooking as much as I have before he marries her, he chuckled. I'll say this for her, she sure can make biscuits. I didn't make them, Sally protested. Nita did. Nita? Kilkenny looked up smiling. I didn't know you could cook. There was a low call from the door. Kilkenny? It was Kane Brockman. He's coming. Shall I take him? No. Kilkenny touched his mouth with a napkin and drew back from the table. That's my job. His eyes met Nita's across the table. Don't pour my coffee, he said quietly. I like it hot. He turned and walked to the door. Far down the street he could see Cub Hale. He was on foot. His hat was gone, and his yellow hair was blowing in the wind. He was walking straight up the center of the street, looking straight ahead. Kilkenny stepped down off the porch. The roses were blooming, and their scent was strong in his nostrils. He could smell the rich odor of fresh earth in the sunlight, and somewhere a magpie shrieked. He opened the gate, and stepping out, closed it carefully behind him. Then he began to walk. He took his time. There was no hurry. There was never any hurry at a time like this. Everything always seems to move in slow motion, until suddenly it was over and you wondered how it could have happened. Saul Hatfield was standing on the steps, his rifle in the hollow of his arm. He and Quince were there just in case he failed. Failed? Kilkenny smiled. He had never failed. Yet they all failed sooner or later. There was always a time when they were too slow, when their guns hung or missed fire. The dust smelled hot, and in the distance thunder rumbled. Then there was a few scattered drops that fell. Odd, he hadn't even been aware that it was clouding up. Little puffs of dust listed from his boots when he walked. He could see Cub more clearly now. He was unshaven, and his face was scratched by brush. His fancy buckskin jacket was gone. Only the guns were the same, and the white eyes, eyes that seemed to burn. Suddenly, Hale stopped, and when he stopped, Kilkenny stopped too. He stood there, perfectly relaxed and waiting. Cub's face was white and dead. Only his eyes seemed alive. That burning white light was in them. I'm going to kill you, he said, his voice sharp and strained. It was all wrong. Kilkenny felt no tension, no alertness. He was just standing there. And in him, suddenly, there welled up a tremendous feeling of pity. Why couldn't they ever learn? There was nothing in a gun but death. Something flickered in those white, blazing eyes. And Kilkenny, standing perfectly erect slapped the butt of his gun with his palm. The gun leaped up, settled into the rock-like grip, and then bucked in his hand, once, twice. The gun before him flowered with flame and something stabbed, white and hot, low down on his right side. The gun flowered again, but the stabbing flame wasted itself in the dust and Cub's knees buckled. There was a spot of blood on his chest right over the heart, and he fell face down. 
and then straightened his legs, and there was silence in the long, dusty street of Cedar Bluff. Kilkenny thumbed shells into his gun, holstered it, and then turned. Steadily, quietly, looking straight ahead, he walked back up the hill toward the cottage. It was just a little hill, but suddenly it seemed steep. He walked on, and then he could see Nita opening the gate and running toward him. He stopped then and waited. There was a burning in his side. He felt something wet against his leg. He looked down puzzled, and when he looked, he fell flat on his face in the dust. And then Nita was turning him over. Her face was white. He tried to sit up, but they pushed him down. Kane Brockman came over with Saul Hatfield, and they carried him up the hill. It was only a few steps, but it had seemed so far. He was still conscious when Price Dixon came in. Dixon made a brief examination and then shrugged. He's all right. The bullet went into his side, slid off a rib, and narrowly missed his spine. But it's nothing that we can't fix up. Shock, mostly, and bleeding. Later, Nita came in. She looked at him and smiled. Shall I put the coffee on now? She asked lightly. Her eyes were large and dark. Let Sally put it on, he said gently. You stay here. End of chapter 20 An end of a man called Trent